Check. One, two, three. Check. One, two, three. Testing one, two. One, two. One, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three.
Miter's Attack Con will begin in five minutes. Please find your seats. Miter's Attack Con. Are you ready, Greg? Miter's Attack Con will begin in two minutes. Miter's Attack Con will begin in two minutes. Please take your seats. Miter Attack Con 2.0 presents our conference MC. Attack Threat Intelligence lead with Miter. Please give a warm welcome to America's own Katie Nichols. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming and welcome to Attack Con 2.0, the second annual Attack Community Conference. We are so pleased to welcome the hundreds of you here in McLean, as well as the thousands of you who are watching online. 
Welcome to the MITRE campus here in McLean, Virginia. We at MITRE are so excited to bring people from around the world who are passionate about this idea of attack and of creating a threat informed defense. Our goal for these next two days is for you to share ideas. So we know what we do on the attack team, maintaining attack is important and all, but attack's real power is in how you use it and how you apply it. And we hope that you'll share best practices over these next two days. What works, what maybe doesn't work so well when you're using attack. And it sounds a little bit cheesy, but uh, MITRE's mission is to solve problems for a safer world. And we truly hope that when you leave here, you'll go back to your organizations and make them safer. That's why we're all here. That's what it's all about. So, so excited to bring you all together. Um, we're all about community here at Attack, and that Attack community, both online and in person. Um, let's see if we can get our community slide on. So, uh, we started out yesterday bringing those folks together um, with our pre conference training day. This is our uh, second Attack Con, and we're changing things up, keeping some things the same. Um, we were pleased to welcome uh, over 150 of you yesterday to different trainings. We were excited to roll out detection analytics with John, uh, SOC assessments with Andy, CTI and Caldera trainings. We also wrapped up the day with uh, 12 birds of a feather discussions, which were a lot of fun. So thanks to those of you who joined us. And of course, we had to add another reception last night since you know, we had another day. So thanks for those of you who joined us in our Oktoberfest reception. Um, so going back, hopefully, to our community slide, um, we are tweeting throughout the conference. So if you use the hashtag AttackCon, um, we're follow us at MitreAttack. Uh, we'll be choosing some of our favorite tweets throughout the event. Uh, so uh, we really like cat gifts. Uh, we also enjoy custom memes. So if that's your thing, not saying you'll definitely get a prize, but you might. So uh, tweet at us throughout the conference. We'll be sharing some of our favorites. Give you a sense of how many people we have in McLean. We have 260 people in person registered, folks hanging out in the lobby here in the auditorium from over 133 organizations and amazingly 19 countries, which speaks to kind of the amazing global reach of attack. So that was particularly exciting. In addition to those of you here, we also have thousands registered to watch online. We have 4,052 individuals who signed up to watch. And then in addition to that, we have 94 watch parties with 1,312 expected attendees. So altogether, thousands of thousands of you all here today watching online. So thank you so much for joining us. And again, tweet at us. So as I said, we added our pre-conference training day yesterday. Uh, another new addition, some special online content for you. Uh, my teammate Jamie Williams is going to be hanging out on our AttackCon couch with speakers and special guests. So for folks online, don't miss that. Hang out during the breaks, during the lunch, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. We're really grateful to all of our exhibitors and sponsors who have made this event come to you. Um, you know, as you know, MITRE is a nonprofit, and we work in the public interest. So that means we don't endorse any particular company, but we do appreciate that all of these companies have invested in this community event, in the power of what you all do and bringing us all together. So really, really, really grateful to all of them. Um, so we have eight exhibitors. Uh, make sure during the breaks you uh, check out their tables. They have some great swag. Chat with them because vendors are such an important part of this community and how we use Attack. And talk to them about their services, their products, how they're using Attack during the breaks, during lunch here in McLean. So thank you so much to all of our exhibitors. Attack IQ, Cyber Reason, Digital Shadows, McAfee, Praetorian, Red Canary, Safe Breach, and XM Cyber. This year, we also have food and beverage sponsors, um, including our delicious breakfast, uh, sponsored by Scythe this morning. Anytime I start a day with guacamole, is a good day for me. So hopefully you enjoyed the tacos and got some unicorn swag as well. In addition to Scythe, uh, we have several other food and beverage sponsors, Cisco, CrowdStrike, Endgame, Microsoft, Syncurity, Threat Quotient, Trend Micro, and VMRay. So thank you again to all of our sponsors, all of our exhibitors for bringing this event to you. It speaks to the power of this community and kind of what we're doing here. We wanted to take a moment to introduce the attack team. I think sometimes there's this myth that only myself or Blake or those of us who are out speaking publicly do everything behind attack and nothing could be farther from the truth. As any of you on a team knows, it takes a village and there are so many people 
who maybe aren't out publicly speaking every day who do a ton of work on attack. So we wanted to take a moment to recognize all of them. And I know you're excited to meet them, um, but please hold your applause till the end so we can bring them all in. Um, over the last year, we've really grown our team. We have over 30 people who are on the attack team, as well as projects in the family like Caldera. So I wanted to take a moment to introduce all of them. So first off, of course, uh, Father Attack, as we call him, our attack lead. He helps out with attack evals. He's the adversary emulation capability area lead. Blake Strom, also ping him about cloud and sub techniques. I've listed on the slide some of the areas that each of these folks knows a lot about. So bug them during breaks. They would love to answer your questions. Um, next up, me. I'm the threat intel lead for attack. I also help out with attack evaluations. Next up, I wanted to introduce Adam Pennington. Core member of the attack team. He was behind the impact tactic, helped out with cloud. He's refactoring pre-attack. Also done a ton of work for AttackCon. Um, two folks we wanted to recognize in absentia, Frank Duff, the attack evaluations lead, not here today, should be around tomorrow if you want to ask him some questions, and Isabel Truhan, she is our infrastructure lead. She and the team do a ton of work maintaining that website, that taxi server, that's not easy, Navigator. So she's not here today, we wanted to recognize her and the team. Next up, we have Connor McGee, who is our attack evaluations infrastructure lead, member of the core attack team followed by Jamie Williams, member of the attack team, helps out with sub techniques, or subs as he calls them, and attack evals as well, and he'll be hosting on the attack con couch today. And next up we have Andy Applebaum, member of the attack team, uh, expertise in SOC assessments, as well as helping out with Caldera. You'll notice a lot of folks do many things here. Uh, next up, Mike Hartley, helps out in the core attack team with sub techniques, often answers your emails, so you might, might see him replying there. Eric Arnoth, who helps out with attack for network defense, uh, network devices, switches, routers, that kind of thing. Also has been helping out with sub techniques. Next up, moving to the threat intel team. Jackie Lasky, who, member of the core team, helps out with cyber threat intel. And joined by Sarah Yoder, also on the core attack team, helping with cyber threat intel and tweets during attack con. Um, Sarah and Jackie will be previewing uh, today, I believe, a pretty exciting tool that I think you're all gonna be excited to hear about. <laughs> Next up, Mike Long, who is our uh, controls expert. I don't see him, so he might be joining us in absentia. He'll be joining us later for talking about mapping controls to attack. Then Ryan Fetterman, a uh, member of the core team, helped out with cloud, car, analytics. And Brendan Manning, also a member of the core attack team. So that's more on the enterprise attack side. We also have attack for mobile. So I wanted to introduce Mike Peck, who is the attack for mobile lead as well as Jason Ashmo, who helps out on the attack mobile uh, side. He's at a lot of the groups and software there that you've seen in our recent updates. Moving on to ICS, Otis Alexander is the attack for ICS lead, and he's helped out by Jake Steele, also on the attack for ICS team, helps out with mobile as well. And next we have Tim Schultz, also helps out with ICS, as well as assisting Blake as adversary emulation capability area lead here at MITRE. But that's not all. We have more. You want attack team members? We got them for you. Moving to the analytics theme a little bit, John Wonder. He is the lead for the attack sightings effort. Pretty cool effort uh, that he's going to be talking about here. Leads analytics, car, lots of that. He did our training yesterday as well. Um, next up, we have Ivan Kirilov, who also helps out on car analytics. He'll be giving you a car update during attack con as well as Sean Whitley helps out with car analytics. Um, good guy to ask about that stuff. Moving on to Caldera, which is an automated tool uh, for red teaming that maps to attack. The lead there, David Hunt. And then other Caldera team members who helped out with training yesterday, Alex Manners, Will Booth, and I believe Brian Edmonds is joining us in Decentia. And last, but certainly not least, in my heart or to this community, Richard Struess. He's MITRE's uh, chief strategist for cyber threat intelligence self-described idea guy, you'll be hearing from him at the end of today, and John Baker, our department head for adversary emulation. Uh, don't see John coming up here yep. from the back. Uh, John, department head for the departments over a lot of these folks and over the attack project here at MITRE. All right, that's just the folks in person. I'm not gonna name everyone else, but uh, let's, let's thank the attack team for all they do. All right, you are all dismissed. Thank you for smiling and waving to your adoring fans. <laughs>
All right, so you can see we've grown our team quite a bit over the past year, and uh, we wanted to bring you a highlight video now uh, where we're going to show you some of the highlights of what the team's been up to over the past year. Thanks to Nils and the media team for putting this together, so take it away. As I said when I first watched that, I am tired just looking at that video. It has been an amazing year for the team and for the community, but we, we think the, the best is still yet to come. So we're looking forward to topping that this year. And I've built out our team. We have a, a massive team uh, working to bring you all the awesome attack content. It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Tony Gidwani. Um, Tony leads analysts in Google's threat analysis group, which combines threat intel, malware analysis, and engineering of large-scale systems to protect against targeted threats. Prior to Google, Tony was the director of research at Threat Connect. You might recall some of her work around that whole uh, Russian efforts to interfere with the 2016 election. If that rings a bell, she's done some great presentations. I first saw her at ShmooCon, was blown away by her expertise. Um, she's also led analytic teams for the Department of Defense, and she taught a graduate course at a Georgetown University Security Studies program, which happens to be my alma mater as well. Um, Tony also has outstanding taste in wine, which I expect will just improve now that she's moved to California. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Tony Gidwani. Thank you, Katie, for that introduction. And thank you for the MITRE team for inviting me here today. Uh, I actually thought I was going to have to start my talk by inviting everybody in from outside. I didn't realize how big the MITRE team had grown when we were doing introductions. Um, it's really a testament to the work that the attack team has done and how central it's become to this community over the last two years, really, in particular, although this effort's been going for nearly five. So a little bit about myself, uh, as Katie kind of mentioned. Uh, I started as an all-source intelligence analyst working in the Department of Defense, where I was for almost 15 years. Um, I left government service and went to Threat Connect, uh, where I was the director of research. Um, so not only did I get to work with some amazing researchers in-house, a big part of my job there was working with threat intelligence teams across industry. Uh, as Katie mentioned, I also taught at Georgetown. Um, a quick plug, if you are interested in teaching, there is a huge demand for adjunct faculty uh, members who have practical experience in this space. Um, it's an aggressive side hustle on top of your day job, I will, I will warn you that. Um, but it's a really compelling way to both give back to the community and it really helps you level up because you think a lot about how and why we do the work that we do when you teach it to others. Uh, and then this summer, um, I picked up from my DC roots and moved across the country to California to join Google's uh, threat analysis group, which as Katie mentioned is Google's in-house threat intelligence team. Um, a very important disclaimer, though. Uh, this talk represents my personal views uh, and not the views of Google or Alphabet, so keep that in mind as we progress through uh, you know, all these memes. All right, so over the next two days, we are going to see a whole series of talks from practitioners that are actually using attack to improve security. And so when I was thinking about uh, creating this talk, um, 
I realize that we're going to get really detailed view, lots of hands-on experience, and best practices over these next two days. And so what I wanted to do was start the conference by kind of taking a step back uh, and thinking a little bit more about why we're here, the problems that attack enables teams to solve, and some of the challenges I've seen from teams who are working to implement attack in their environment. So what brings us together today? Matrices. <laughs> Matrices are what bring us together today. Uh, so quick show of hands. How many of you here in the audience uh, work in threat intelligence? A lot of hands. How many of you work in ops or as defenders? Ooh, that's a pretty good split. So for those of you watching at home, the thousands of people that Katie has told me are tuning in, uh, that's about a 50-50 split here in the audience, which in and of itself, I think, is a really compelling reason for why attack has been so successful. There we go. So this leads to a lot of questions, right? I've worked in Intel my entire career, and so I've always seen this struggle to make Intel and ops more effective together. Uh, and that leads to a lot of questions like, why do I need Intel? How do I make this work? How much is enough? I want to take an Intel-led, an Intel-driven defense, but how do I actually do that? And so this here is my answer to the why of threat intelligence. The purpose of intelligence is to drive a decision advantage. Uh, I thought about putting out definitions here from Gartner, Forrester, even better, the joint pub. Um, but to be honest, I kind of get lost in all the dependent clauses when I look at those longer definitions of what Intel is. Plus, I thought it was a bit of a bait and switch to go from a princess bride meme to doctrine. So you're welcome. So let's unpack that a little bit. What does decision advantage actually mean? So this chart is from um, the EU Cybersecurity Agency. And, and it's busy. There's a lot going on here. Uh, but I like it because I think it helps us uh, map out what decision advantage might look like in different organizations. Um, so a couple of things come to mind here. First, now it's possible that as a threat intel team, you actually serve this whole range of customers and systems, right? And your threat intel is just radiating out from the center of the company to all of these wonderful places. Um, but what's much more likely as a team is that this is more of a choose your own adventure, right? Where you've got a couple of these different pathways um, you know, that are the definitions of who you're supporting and what define your deliverables. And then it's a painstaking process over time to establish new pathways throughout the organization uh, as your Intel team grows and matures. The second point I'd like to draw out here is that um, decision advantage can come in, in a couple of different ways, right? Our decisions can be made by people and or by systems. And it's really important for us as practitioners to understand what the requirements are for both. So my time in the Department of Defense, um, I was an all-source intelligence analyst primarily focused on Afghanistan and working in the Pentagon. My world was overwhelmingly what's in this top left quadrant of the slide and labeled strategic. Um, my decision makers were people. And the way they needed intelligence, it had to be delivered cogently in writing or on the spot in person. So the, the way that you work as a team, when those are the types of decision makers you have to support, and that's the kind of deliverable they need, is very different from a different type of problem. Uh, when I came into the private sector and started working with enterprise security teams, I saw something that was very different. Here, enabling systems to be more actionable was a key deliverable, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, however, one of the things I really struggled with, and, you know, especially about four years ago when I made this transition, was that overwhelmingly, this was implemented as indicators of compromise being pumped into a device, usually a SIM. Uh, and I'll be honest, I didn't really understand that. <laughs> so uh, I found that, to be, that approach to be very tactical. That information is very perishable, right? IOCs tend to have a very short shelf life. Um, and it's such a high volume that a small team could spend pretty much their entire time and effort uh, managing and curating these streams of data for relatively little decision advantage. So one of the things that I really like about MITRE ATT&CK is both that it allows us to better support those two types of decisions, uh, you know, made by people and made by systems, and that it really helps pull us up from an overly tactical view of what intelligence is. And that's pretty clutch, because the side that learns the fastest wins. So a quick show of hands, how many of you are familiar with OODA loops? That is almost everybody. I get so excited. 
<laughs> All right, uh, so OODA loops, uh, this is a theory developed by John Boyd, who's an Air Force officer in the 1970s, thinking about aerial combat. And what his theory is, is that decision making happens in these iterative loops uh, where you observe, orient, decide, and act. That's our OODA. And basically, both you and your adversary have these loops. And so the one who learns the fastest, who closes the loop the fastest, gains the advantage and is more likely to be successful. All right, so let's think about this a little bit more, right? That first O, observe, is collecting the information around you and getting your bearings. The O for orient, this was something it took me a little while I had to think about a little bit more. This is really how you analyze and process that information, right? Drawing on uh, your past experiences, your values, your cultural biases, things like that. So he's crafting this theory thinking about an individual fighter pilot in a dogfight. But if we zoom out a little bit, we can see how this would also apply to organizations. How many of us have been in a place where we've taken the same external set of data and seen two teams run with it in completely different directions? Right? The way they interpret and orient uh, is very much shaped by their organizational culture. And the way that they orient is going to have a huge impact on how they decide and how they act. Thinking, we're thinking. There we go. OK, so we've talked about how to think about OODA loops as a way to sort of measure this decision advantage. How do we know if it's working, right? This is the purpose of why we have intelligence, is to make this better, to do it faster. How do we know if it's working? What metrics can we use to think about this? There's kind of two categories of metrics here. Uh, full disclosure, this is an area I've done a fair amount of work on, so there's more presentations on this, you know, under the covers. Um, but basically, those metrics tend to fall into two categories of things, right? Measures of performance, which is what most of us think about when we think of metrics. These are the things that answer the questions, am I doing things right? Uh, they tend to be within the control of the team. Uh, to measure things like, you know, how many reports did I write this month? Um, how well are my systems working? How do I make X more efficient? Um, you know, what are we analyzing? What are we finding? And these type of metrics absolutely have their place, but they tend to be overweighted in how we think about the effectiveness of intelligence. This is also where, when a lot of us get cynical about metrics, it's because we're spending too much time working towards this metric, and it doesn't really get to the, you know, the heart of the matter of how effective we're being. Um, pretty much all of us have some sort of horror story or scar tissue about a place that we worked or a person that we know where there was that metric of, to be successful, you will write five reports a month. Now, somebody who leads analysts, I know, if I set that as a criteria, my analysts are going to write five reports a month. Now, whether or not those reports are good or whether writing five reports a month is, in fact, the right thing I want them to do is a separate question. So you have to be careful here because while these types of metrics are important for keeping um, the team moving forward and improving your processes, if you're not careful, you can easily misincentivize the type of behavior you want your team to be taking. So where we really want to be is on the right side of the slide, talking about measures of effectiveness. These types of metrics capture, excuse me, am I doing th the right things? And so here, what we're really talking about is um, the output that the Intel team is creating is it actually changing the organization's decisions or behavior, right? This is where we're really trying to focus on that impact. So these may be things like countermeasures enacted or um, new cases that have been generated from threat intel, right? Where that output um, is actually making a difference in the way the security team works. But guess what? These types of metrics require a really strong partnership with the teams that we're enabling. And that can be ops, that can be incident response, it can be the execs, whoever our key stakeholders are from our choose your own adventure experience a few slides ago. Um, the measures of effectiveness are really going to speak to how well we're working together. And that makes us really uncomfortable, right? We know this in our bones. The number of uh, threat intel types that I've seen leave an organization because they felt their work wasn't causing change, too many to count. But yet it makes us really, really uncomfortable to think that the true measure of our effectiveness is how well we are enabling others. And that means it's not entirely within our control. 
So what holds us back from being more effective then? Um, I think there's a cultural mismatch a lot of times between threat intelligence and ops that makes us both less effective. And I don't want to overdo this point because sometimes I think this comes across as a caricature. Um, so it's not a threat intel is from Mars and ops is from Venus or vice versa. It's not like that. Uh, but we have different frames for the way that we consume information and the timeline that we need that information to be valid. And so by absolutely no malice or um, you know, deliberate slight, it's very easy for both of us in trying to do our best um, to not make the other side effective. So what does that mean? Intel is drawn to the novel, to the unique, to the next, right? What is the next big attack? What happened here? What does this portend for the attack landscape moving forward? We live in the details. Uh, and because the details of those attacks are going to vary, usually pretty substantially, based off of the environment that they execute in, uh, we have to be there. But if we're not careful, it kind of puts us in the position of being the well, actually people, right? We've all been there. I've been there. You know, you provide this information, and what comes back is something that's so generalized that you feel compelled to say, well, actually, and provide like five caveats. Um, because it's also very important as Intel practitioners that our customers don't take the wrong takeaways and charge off in the, you know, in the wrong direction. But if we overdo it, we basically end up never giving a clear point. So I mentioned that we're living in the details. Most of the work that we're doing on these attacks and what we're publishing is retrospective in nature. So our work is highly descriptive and highly explanatory, but not necessarily super predictive going forward. And so there's, um, there's actually, believe it or not, um, a theory about theories. There's actually a whole bunch of them. Um, but what I want to point out here is this tension when you think of a theory between its diagnostic strength and its prognostic strength. So diagnostic theories um, have a high amount of explanatory power. They're really good applied to a specific case or looking backwards. But because they're so detailed, right, they are less generalizable going forward and have less predictive strength. I would put forth that for the most part, threat intel tends to live on the diagnostic end of the spectrum in the work that we do. And that contrasts, I think, pretty sub significantly with what operations needs to be more effective. Ops needs stability of signal in order to do their work. Um, and speaking with a number of teams that have worked to implement MITRE ATT&CK, one of the things that has struck out you know, um, really to me quite vividly is how long it takes the ops teams to build and field detections. Um, so identifying these techniques, researching the de detection, building it, testing it, deploying it, the average that I hear is closer to one per quarter per analyst. That has a completely different time frame than until people live on. I can't tell you basically what happened last week, let alone a quarter ago, right? So when we think about this and what we're reporting, we're over here looking at that new novel and next, and Ops is over here trying to figure out, you just gave me 15 new novel and next, what is stable here and is going to be worth the investment it's going to take for me to build these detections. So basically, in a nutshell, they need Intel to be more prognostic, whereas our strength is really being more diagnostic. So I've highlighted here a couple of areas where we want to get better as intelligence practitioners. You know, what is it that attack can help us with here in creating that decision advantage and working more effective as a team? Now, people think that we're onto something here, right? So this is a Google Trends chart for attack as a search term, um, going back from when the framework was first introduced in May 2015 till, I'm not, I'm not too proud to say it, I made the slide last night. <laughs> so, <laughs> and what you can see here is that in 2018, right, we really start to see velocity take off um, for attack, and it just keeps going up. Um, now. In my defense, I made this slide earlier in this month. Um, and at that point, 100, which is our y-axis here, and represents um, the peak popularity for attack as a search term, that 100 point was hit uh, this year in August, basically coinciding with the time that Katie and Ryan Kovar gave a talk at Black Hat uh, you know, titled Play at Home. Um, and then I realized, well, let me go check that data again, and found that it looks like we are on track this week with the conference to create a new high. So, well done, everybody. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes, you can clap for yourself. That's absolutely <laughs> acceptable. <laughs> um, so this trend tells us, this trend chart tells us something that I think we all pretty much know intuitively, right? When we go to security conferences now, we're pretty much guaranteed to get at least one talk on attack. And it may be from the MITRE team itself, but oftentimes it's not. It's from other practitioners, which is really exciting and compelling about this space. But I got to say, I think Patrick Gray, uh, who runs the Risky Business Podcast, kind of said it best here. Uh, the attack framework is now officially everywhere. Uh, this this uh, episode was actually about attack IQ and adversary emulation. It's actually pretty interesting if you haven't had a chance to, to go check it out. OK, so the value here. Point number one, moving up from more tactical threat intelligence. So for those of you who had first time to Pyramid of Pain reference as about 16 minutes into the conference, you win the pool. Uh, and we'll probably see this slide a couple more times over the next two days, and that's not a bad thing, right? Uh, so the Pyramid of Pain was developed uh, by David Bianco, who's at Target, uh, basically to think about the amount of pain caused to the adversary uh, when these various categories are denied to them. So earlier when I said that uh, threat intelligence you know, tends to be the way it's been defined and implemented largely in the market, um, has, that use case has been indicators of compromise into a device. Right? We're spending too much time here at the bottom levels of the pyramid on activity that is trivial for the adversary to change. So what we want to do is move up to TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. These are much more stable, um, the stable signal that our operators need. Um, and it gives us the opportunity to reframe the discussion. So by working at this level, we help Intel come out of that very tactical diagnostic focus, uh, diagnostic focus, and give ops the stability of signal they need to do the work that they need to do to build detections. So what does that actually look like? Also, first representation of a matrix for the day. <laughs> uh, so I just went and opened up the attack navigator and pulled the, uh, the chart for APT28. So there's no extra sauce on this chart. Uh, just the special sauce of what the community has been able to bring together in synthesizing a body of reporting, which is pretty cool. We can have a very different discussion as a team when we're starting from here than from a handful of indicators. Um, I think that's a really important point because these types of, of matrices are an important way for us to start building consensus on what is happening and how that translates to our own operational environment. Now, a point of caution, um, it's easy to become too over-reliant on things like a matrix. And if we're not careful, uh, we introduce different sorts of bias. So this can be a very powerful tool for decreasing certain types of bias, namely recency bias um, and anecdotal bias. Right? If it's very difficult for us to pull up this information and look at it over a period of time, we're going to be overwhelmingly weighted towards the, th the most recent thing. Um, I don't know if hippo bias is a thing, but it probably should be, or the highest paid, a pers highest paid person's opinion. The way they define the problem becomes the way that we frame and talk about it. This can be a very powerful corrective to those types of group tendencies. But like I said, it's not without risk. If we become too reliant on this, we introduce other sources of bias, namely collection. Right? If your collection is skewed towards being only being able to see some things, you're going to have darker red on this chart uh, than others. So the matrix represents what you know. And the bigger the divergence between what you know and reality is, the less effective a tool is going to be. Um, but if we're thinking about it in that way and we're careful to that, it's a really powerful way to bring different teams and perspectives together and have that conversation. So that point might be really obvious to make, right? Like that the core of this is a common nomenclature. You know, How, why is it taking us so long to get to this point where we can do that? Um, I remember when I was at ThreatConnect and we were thinking about how to get incentivized teams to do more TTP level analysis, we were having a really difficult time, and again, this was about four years ago, um, with the standardization problem, right? When we talked about TTPs, it was too qualitative and too subject to interpretation by different analysts for us to build a structured feature that would enable both humans and systems to consume that type of intelligence. And this is the problem that I think MITRE has solved in a lot of ways for us, that over the last two years, we've really seen this critical mass, I would say, um, across the community for this is how we're going to talk about TTPs. 
Now, if we contrast that and think about how unique and special that is, let's think about another part of our world, and that's adversary naming, right? Adversary naming, by contrast, is not standardized. Each vendor or producer comes up with their own uh, code name or code word, and um, sure, someone's going to say there's good reasons for that, like we have different visibility and different collection, and that may be true, um, but one, the conversations we don't have are about how different, you know, APT28 visibility is versus Fancy Bear. We, those aren't the conversations we really have as a threat intel community. We just jam them all together. Um, and it causes a lot of pain and friction for everybody, for the threat intel analysts themselves and for everybody who's got to consume this information. Um, you know, having just joined a new team at Google, I now have yet another set of acronyms and code words that I have to layer on uh, to, the, to these other ones. Super fun, guys. So much fun. So here, I think the, di the dichotomy between how we're seeing TTPs evolve and adversary naming is really a testament to the work that MITRE does, right? It's also a testament to the community, which has invested into this framework to make it more usable and help evolve it over the last few years. Yeah, forgot the animation. There you go. That's just a handful of uh, aliases for the same group. Have fun con you know, constructing your search queries around that. All right, so common nomenclature here is so important because it enables a common operational picture. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, when we were talking about the pyramid of pain that if we think about our OODA loop again in that frame, um, one of the reasons attack is so helpful is on that first O, the observe, it draws us up from the tactical. Right? Our observations are at a much higher level, and that's a better starting point for this next step, which is orient. Um, these matrices are a really important way to bring Intel and Ops together because it allows us to map adversary activity and then translate that into how we see this play out on our own networks. Again, sounds so simple, but it's such a compelling step forward for bringing both sides of this together. And the way we orient together, again, is what drives how we decide and act. So one of the things I've noticed, though, in looking at teams that uh, have had some false starts or have struggled to get their attack implementation off the ground is that that orient phase really requires both Intel and Ops. If just one of them is trying to drive that, it's not going to be successful and it's going to struggle to stick in the organization. But wait, there's even more. So. Talked about OODA loops quite a bit. Um, Attack's real Jedi mind trick here, I think, is that a framework that's ostensibly about adversary behavior really not allows you to know yourself. Um, and this is something that I keep running into over and over and over again every time I work with a team that is starting to implement Attack. So what does that actually mean? So one of the first use cases here is improving detection and visibility. And this is really that core use case we've been talking about up to this point. When we think about how we're going to use MITRE ATT&CK, it's about improving operational defense um, and helping to get yourself out of a sort of Schrodinger's breach situation where you are both breached and not because you can't see it. Right? Um, so improving visibility is usually one of the first use cases where you're going to see value from undertaking this activity. And this is what we tend to think of when you know, we start thinking about ATT&CK. One of the most interesting talks that I've seen this year uh, was from an analyst at ING that was presented earlier at first CTI. Uh, and this was about using the MITRE framework to map Intel requirements. Now, this is something I never even thought of doing. Uh, this analyst took like, the high level requirements from their executives and broke that down into the types of attacks were, that were most likely to create that and mapped that into uh, a, matrix, a matrix. And so that gave this analyst an another layer when they were having these conversations about what adversary behavior is, what our stakeholders want, and what we see on our networks to make better decisions. I know this chart can be a little hard to see, so you know, th these different triangles are stakeholder management, source management, and tracking improving CTI maturity. So having done that, they got another bonus out of it, which is all the work they were doing to um, create intelligence reports and analysis and the work that the ops team was doing to build these detections and improve coverage on the map, they were able to cleanly map that back to program requirements, which is something else that we tend to struggle with a lot in this space. So I thought that was a pretty cool uh, use of the attack framework that I had never really thought about before. Here's another one, supporting your product evals. 
So uh, this is a talk that was presented here at Attackcom last year by two analysts from General Electric. Great talk. Um, where they really focused on how they operationalize attack in their organization. So a lot of those early use cases we were talking about is, is the meat of it. But they also talked about how they were able to use that knowledge of where their gaps were to meaningfully change the way they did product evals. So now that I'm looking at where I direct my budget, where are my gaps, and now I have a, another basis for assessing, does this tool that this vendor is selling me actually do the things I, it says it does and that I needed to do? What an idea. All right, so you're probably thinking, you know, how do we get here? Like, you've just shown me some matrices. What is the magical alchemy that allows us to get from, you know, that, that chart to these amazing outcomes? And, I'm, and I, to me, what comes to mind is this quote by, attributed to President Dwight D. Eisenhower, that plans are worthless, but planning is everything. I say maybe because Eisenhower himself attributed this quote to something he heard in the Army. So I'm not really sure, you know, kind of urban legend, what the, you know, who the real owner of this is. And, uh, and let's be honest, the guy that planned the D-Day invasion gets to be a little bit more flippant about plans than the rest of us do. But there's some real truth here. Uh, and that is, in some ways, it's about the process and the journey, right? When you sit down to do planning, you're identifying the problem, you are identifying your assumptions, you are thinking about and weighing different courses of action. And that work, bringing people together to do that work, is really you know, the friends we made along the way, right? This is the point where, you know, what you end up facing is probably gonna look pretty different from what you planned because the adversary has OODA loops too. You know, they get a, a vote in how this unfolds. But this work leaves everybody more resilient and better able to respond to what actually manifests, even if it doesn't end up in the plan. And so I think a very similar thing can be said for attack, right? We have these matrices and they are tools but it's the discussion and the process that we're building within the team, how we communicate and how we define the problem that becomes such a powerful driving this work. Not only are we getting um, improvement in that core proposition of defending our enterprise, we're actually able to drive change across the security team and how it operates. And that is pretty cool. All right, so sign me up, right? I wanna do all of these amazing things with attack. I have full steam ahead, right? And again, uh, in interest, I put this, uh, this graphic in for Katie because she's such a huge Legally Blonde fan. So what have we learned from Elle Woods who thinks that, you know, getting into Harvard Law, like what, it's hard? Okay, so some of the challenges I've seen teams struggle with when they start to implement attack. First and foremost is the complexity, right? We are up to 266 techniques in enterprise attack alone. I didn't go through and look at mobile and pre-attack, I'm sorry. Uh, and many teams find themselves extending that framework even further to more appropriately fit their environments and their use cases, which is cool. Um, now, I've seen Katie tear through a report and pull out techniques, but for most of us mere mortals, this takes a while, right? The learning curve is pretty steep. So I'm extremely excited for Jackie and Sarah's talk um, where with, you know, with what MITRE's been cooking up to help reduce the complexity uh, and, and to improve adoption for new users and more experienced ones of attack. Time. Done right, implementing attack is gonna change your inputs, your processes, and your outputs. Plan on this taking at least six months to a year of sustained investment before you feel like you're really starting to get the hang of it. So if you go in thinking that in a month you're gonna have this licked, you're probably not setting yourself up for success. Now, a big part of this is sort of the weight of classifying a whole bunch of data to make those matrices meaningful, right? Now, the attack team has done a lot of work with the knowledge base to give you a head start, but most teams are gonna need to build off of this and layer on their own internal data, right? Your premium sources, your actually internally produced intelligence, your incidents, and understanding of how your systems map to these techniques. That's a lot of legwork. One of the things that I think is getting very interesting is that in this last two years, as we have, as a community have decided that the attack framework is how we're gonna talk about TTPs, we're starting to see greater pickup in the, in the vendor space for supporting attack. And that's really important because both it enables us to auto-classify data more quickly and at scale and consume that data more effectively. 
So I'm very curious to see over this next year, as that starts to gain more speed, if this time to value here can be reduced. The third bit is buy-in. Um, I really enjoyed the Black Hat talk, you know, uh, the Play at Home edition where uh, Katie and Ryan Kobar used the framework of a very small team where it's just sort of one in each role and how they could get value out of attack. Um, but most of us work in an organization where more than two people are going to have to agree that we want to do this. So how do we build that buy-in and make it sustainable to get the traction that we need? So stop me if you've heard this one before. The senior threat intel analyst doesn't want to use attack because it feels like bolting on a huge other layer of work and it slows them down. The ops lead kind of loses interest after the first time they stepped through this exercise and they did all this work just to get to the same decision they knew they were going to make based off of intuition. All right, this was a lot of work to get to the same point that I thought I was going to get to. And then interest fizzles. So those concerns are valid. Um, but what we're trying to do here, right? why do we put in all this work to get to potentially that initial same outcome that I could have gotten to much faster by just putting these two people in a room together? The answer is scale. right? That senior threat intel analyst and that ops lead don't scale. There's a finite amount of decisions the two of them can make, and they don't scale across that whole matrix of techniques. If teams were actually working effectively that way, we would not need this. Um, so what happens is you get into this space where let's say your initial OODA loop pre-attack is like this, right? And you start going through and doing all this work, and as you're learning, your OODA loop actually kind of looks like this, right? It's going to slow you down the first time you do this, sometimes painfully slow. But what we want to get to eventually is this. And those two people can't, can't get here. You need the whole team participating in order to get that much smaller and tighter OODA loop. And that means breaking down this problem into more manageable chunks and having a process that allows the whole team and not just the two seniors who have enough institutional knowledge to know where the bodies are buried and what approaches we've tried before hasn't worked. Right? This is a way to leverage the entire team and bring them together to make those decisions. That's a pretty good sell. I think it's a pretty compelling value proposition and a way to build buy-in. Um, so if we focus on the why and the how, then the what becomes a lot easier. But central to that is managing those expectations. So understanding how long it's going to take for us to do this and where those um, learning experiences are along the way, I think is really important to preventing that, that false start or the fizzling out of interest that you sometimes see with different teams. And one way to do this is to use the community. right? This is a very vibrant community uh, full of practitioners doing really interesting things. And a lot of this content is accessible. The talks that I showed earlier in, this slot, uh, in the deck, I've sent those to probably dozens of people who were struggling with how to get started um, or were thinking about a more interesting use case for attack. So take notes this, you know, these next two days, meet each other, because this is part of how you help solidify that buy-in. Having a compelling vignette from a peer team at another company can be worth everything when it comes to building buy-in. Uh, and this is a wonderful forum to, to get those stories and meet those people. So a few closing thoughts as we head off onto this two-day wonderful journey full of amazing content. We've talked a little bit today, or I've talked, uh, about you know, why we're here. Right? The purpose of Intel is to create a decision advantage. And that's not something that Intel can do alone. It really requires a partnership between intelligence and operations. You need all of your defenders working together. And as we've seen, sometimes we get there on our own individually, but not consistently. And there's some good reasons for that. And so attack is a really, really powerful tool in our arsenal to help drive that type of change across the security team by making us focused on sort of the same level of intelligence that ops needs to do its work, by thinking about how we can use that to drive other parts and processes across the security team, and thinking through some of the pitfalls and challenges that we have. It's a fair question to ask these other presenters as we go through. You know, what was your pain here? How long did this take? All of those things help us manage our expectations and build that buy-in so that the investment that we're making is stable and pays off over time. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much, and uh, I'll take any questions.
there's, uh, there's one up here. We've got some mics coming since we've got a lot of people watching at home. Got a calming noise of waves. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Um, you said to ask how they're doing, how they're using Attack, and how long it's taking. How long are you using Attack at Google, and how long is it taking to get where you are? Sure. Um, that, I can only give a partial answer to that question, mostly because I've only been at Google for 90 days. Uh, and if you know anything about Google, it's a very bottom up type of culture. Um, so I certainly can't pretend to give a definitive answer here. Um, I will say that we're incorporating attack, and we work very heavily at that TTP level. Um, that effort's been several years in the making. Um, you know, there's been a lot of learning along the way there that predates my arrival. Um, and the there's a team here today, so I think we'll, you know, there will be more opportunities for discussions about some of those trade-offs. But a big part of what I've been talking about here, about that disconnect between Intel and Ops, and how to improve that and get the two teams working together, applies at a large organization like Google and at smaller ones that I've worked with as well. Another question over here. Um, hi. Um, my question is about what do you think is the best, best method of getting those Ops members who do have that idea of, well, my intuition can get a quicker decision than, you know, this new attack framework. And a lot of times, like, I was involved in this, like, all night discussion on Twitter, actually, <laughs> about whether or not threat intel even impacts ops on a day to day basis versus a long term basis. Oh, that's a good question. So, the question is how do you bring those senior ops uh, types on board who think that their intuition is going to get them to the same place? And what does that mean for incorporating intel on a daily basis? Um, the first point is, I think you actually have to, you have to lean into that. Um, a lot of times the people who have that opinion are well regarded within the organization and actually do know a lot about how things work there and what hasn't worked in the past. So trying to freeze them out of that discussion, I have generally found to be not successful. Um, what I have found to be successful is leveraging that insight, right? So this is actually a really good thing that your intuition matches this process because clearly you've gotten here from all the scar tissue you've accumulated over the different crises over the years. Um, and so if this process was producing wildly divergent outcomes, maybe we shouldn't be using it. So using that frame as a way to validate the results of the process, I think, can be very helpful. Um, also appealing to the fact that once we get this up and running, it probably means you can work fewer weekends. Um, that, that level of self-interest I find to be pretty compelling for a lot of people. Um, I think it's also part of the discussion about mentoring others. And so that's something that a lot of us struggle with, right? We, we got to these relatively senior positions because we were really strong at what we did as individual contributors. Um, and now that we're bringing on all of these new team members, growing them and adapting the process to take advantage of those people, it's actually a different set of skills, right? So using something like attack as a way, I think, to help that um, and, and may help in that situation. Um, your question on sort of the day-to-day the -day how Intel affects ops largely depends on that first choose your own adventure, right? And how you're set up to consume that intelligence. Um, I've seen, you know, a lot of that still is the indicator or in a more mature organization, signature driven. So you're building a lot of these signatures based off of what's coming in from Intel. And that enables that much more of that real time daily impact. Um, but a lot of the work we're talking about here with attack is I think more strategic in nature. Um, and at least not necessarily in that like knee-jerk reaction, but we're trying to make deliberate decisions about what work is important and how we prioritize it. There's another one, hand over here. One of, the early, uh, one of your original slides talked about how, how having a common language is important. Um, the way that we're describing, in one of your slides you mentioned how Intel uh, folks tend to be more diagnostic. Could we, actually, could we actually be using the wrong word here, where we have people who we call Intel people, but they're actually more investigators or forensic, forensic analysis, analysts, if you will, if you will, instead of Intel people? So are we using the wrong language to describe that function? Because in the end, they're providing a diagnostic view rather than a prognostic view. 
And if you really want them to be a prognosticator, then um, call, calling them an intel person has a certain set of responsibilities or a certain set of uh, roles and actions that they take. So anyway, bottom line is, could we be actually calling them the wrong thing? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, in some cases, yes. I think there is a, a lot of overlap between investigative and forensic work and intel, and that, that's a good thing. Um, you know, the question, I think, where we start to get potentially tangled up um, is how generalizable and forward-looking those findings can be, right? And the good intel teams put a lot of effort in making sure that they're crossing into providing something that is more forward-looking. Um, but what may be forward-looking for me as an intel person may not, again, be sufficiently stable for, for my ops team. Uh, so it's a good point, and I think it's something to think about as we look at what an intel team produces and how they interact. Uh, are they acting too much just like investigators and not being forward enough thinking? Is that hand there in the back? Again, to the point of operations personnel that typically move from intuition, have you seen things like the attack framework enabling defenders to take a more scientific, um, systematic approach to doing defense where they didn't have something formally? Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a big part of why this has been successful. And sometimes why you also see the pressure more coming from those senior ops leads bosses, right? where too much of my organizational knowledge is locked in the head of this one person, I have to externalize that and make that process repeatable. Uh, and that's a challenge, right? Most, again, that's, that's the ego, that's the experience, it's the scar tissue that we've acquired by, by working this way. Um, but we need to find a way to bring the whole team together. And that's really difficult to do if too much of that institutional knowledge is locked inside one person's head. It also leaves the organization extremely fragile when that person decides to leave. Um, this is actually one of the big challenges that we saw a lot on Intel teams, was that too much of the institutional knowledge and expertise was locked in a person's head, and in an industry with a huge amount of turnover, uh, you know, you could actually see the entire program take like three steps back when that one person left. So that's a big part, I think, of why attack is so compelling, is that it gets that out of the, you know, just the, you know, the person's head and embeds it more in the organization at large. on time. So thank you so much, Tony. That was You're a welcome. wonderful keynote. Tony and welcome. Thank you, Tony. So a lot of discussion online about Tony's awesome keynote here. Uh, Christian, a uh, science dude on Twitter, talked about some of the biases, how visualizing observed TTPs in the attack matrix can introduce recency and anecdotal bias. Threat intel folks, I'm a big fan of uh, the different cognitive biases we talk about. Um, the one who closes the loop fastest wins. That OODA loop, another theme that we pulled out from Tony's talk. Uh, Bryson tweeted that uh, Tony's keynoting MITRE attack on 2.0 with honest insight on commitment. If you want the benefit, it takes some time. And we have heard that from many people in the community. Um, and we're gonna give a prize. So Fernando Montenegro, see us later. I think you're here in person. Um, Tony's keynote balances theoretical underpinnings for attack with great recognition for community efforts, discussion on use cases, sanity check on challenges, and a serious meme game. So I wouldn't, wouldn't be a keynote without some memes. So thank you so much to Tony for that wonderful keynote. And uh, Fernando, see us for a special prize during the break. So tough to top that keynote, but uh, our next presenter, can, he can do it. I believe in him. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce my teammate, Blake Strom. Almost needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyways. Um, he's the attack lead, one of the original co-creators of attack uh, many, many years ago, and he's been leading the effort ever since. Doesn't just do that. Ed Miter, he's also our um, capability area lead for adversary emulation. He helps out. He's been core on the attack evaluations efforts. Um, and sometimes in his spare time, you know, moments he gets, he likes to roast coffee, leading to his Twitter handle at Strom Coffee. So uh, really excited for Blake to kind of summarize what we've done this past year with Attack, how far we've come, and really where we're going. So please join me in welcoming Blake Strom. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Katie. Um, AttackCon is really a special time for us. Um, even though we go out to conferences uh, constantly briefing Attack and talking to people, um, this is our opportunity to get the community to come here and uh, talk about one topic. Um, so thank you very much for, for coming. Um, so as Katie mentioned, 
Um, it's sort of hard to understand how far we've come uh, without understanding uh, sort of where we started. Um, so this is the very first version of the attack matrix. Um, this came out um, internally within MITRE. This hasn't seen the light of day before. Um, early on in 2014, so the project had been uh, going on for about six months at the time. Um, and we were sort of using it internally to figure out, you know, okay, threat actors use these techniques. This is our coverage against it. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things that pop out in this. You know, there's uh, only eight tactics. Um, there's no ex or, uh, execution tactic. There's no collection. Um, host enumeration hasn't been renamed to discovery yet. Uh, there's only four techniques in credential access. And if I remember correctly, um, OS and software weakness was the first version of the, the credential dumping technique. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to this version of attack. Um, you can go to your CISO and say, hey, boss, we only need to cover 64 techniques. Um, I could get this done in a couple months. Um, you can uh, fit the matrix on, an, on one slide and still read the, the technique names. Um, it's a lot easier to believe vendors when they come and say to you, hey, we've got 100% coverage of attack. <laughs> um, but as we all know, uh, the space isn't quite this simple, and attack has had to evolve um, over time. Um, so here's where we are today. Um, we have uh, 266 techniques um, in the enterprise matrix. Um, but we didn't stop there. You know, enterprise now covers uh, Mac and Linux in addition to Windows. Um, we also have pre-attack now uh, with 174 techniques currently. Uh, we've extended off to mobile attack uh, that has 79 techniques. Um, and of those, uh, that collection of information uh, we have about 93 groups, um, 414 software entries, and 1,971 technical references um, that span technical best practices, uh, information about how techniques work, and threat intel reports, um, which is an incredible corpus of information. Um, but it extends beyond this, too. It's not just the knowledge base. Um, there's a sister project, the analytic, Cyber Analytic Repository, that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, there's attack-based stock assessments where we're trying to um, help people who are just getting started with attack uh, figure out uh, where their best first steps are. Um, there's attack for ICS, so the team has been working hard on this to get this ready. Uh, there's attack evaluations where we're trying to provide objective insights to how vendors are doing against threat behavior. And then there's the attack sightings ecosystem that we started uh, this year um, so that we can get better statistics about adversary use over time, so we can provide better uh, trending data. So attack has really come a long way, not just as a knowledge base, but also as an idea to help uh, threat inform defense in, in multiple ways. And we really didn't get here by accident. So attack was a deliberate effort to track and maintain a knowledge base of adversary behavior. Um, and there's a lot of things that contributed to this over the last six years. Um, so there's been a lot of innovation in um, sensing um, endpoint systems, uh, sensing network activity uh, to better identify these threats. Um, there's a lot of innovation going into how to analyze that data through analytics, uh, whether it be machine learning um, or other uh, mechanisms. Um, so people are seeing a lot more activity than they um, had been before. And I think the, the realization that IOCs just aren't enough to build a security program on um, have really helped this, this idea of uh, the focus should be on threat behavior to uh, detect adversaries uh, more robustly than with just IOCs alone. And because of this uh, visibility, um, people are seeing a lot more activity. Um, so there's a lot more reporting out there. And this coupled with uh, the lower barrier of entry for adversaries to get started uh, because there's more tools available just means there's a lot more activity to see. Um, there's certainly a lot more reports now than we can even handle as the attack team. Um, but this is a very good problem to have um, because people are more willing to, to report out this information. Um, and then the next point is, you know, we can't see everything. We don't see everything as, as MITRE and on the attack team. So we rely on the community to tell us um, what they're seeing in order to make sure that attack is, is growing and that we're accurately representing what adversaries are doing today. Um, and this sort of reminds me of a conversation I had about a month and a half ago um, with someone who leads a team at a, a healthcare organization. Um, and he was basically able to get buy-in from his leadership to share information uh, with us uh, because the vendor space in the community looks at attack 
in maps to attack and builds their products around attack uh, because it helps them get the tools that they need in order to detect and respond to, to threats uh, better. Um, and even beyond that, um, he said it helps uh, other peers in his uh, industry um, because they're paying attention to attack too um, so that they're b better able to respond to, uh, to incidents, uh, which is awesome. This is why we're, we're doing attack. Um, so to, to dive in some of the numbers for updates this year, um, we have one new tactic. Uh, we have 43 new techniques uh, for enterprise, 13 for mobile, uh, 16 new groups, and 87 new software entries. We've got 41 new mitigations for enterprise, uh, 87 updated techniques, uh, 16 updated techniques for mobile, uh, 67 updated groups, and uh, 92 um, updated software entries. And you saw a bunch of the team that was up here today. Um, it's a lot of work to maintain attack and all the, the other projects that have been built around attack at MITRE. And I'm always just amazed at the level of uh, effort and uh, work that we're able to do on this to, to improve it over time. Um, and you heard Katie, uh, we all work on different jobs. I don't think there's any single person that works on attack full time uh, because we're looking at threat reports. Uh, for other projects, we're doing red teaming and adversary emulation, we're doing threat analysis. And this all helps to keep our skills sharp that, so we can maintain attack in the right way for the community. And so if you saw Dave Harold and Ryan Kovar's talk uh, at last, the last attack con, um, they give a really good talk about uh, using uh, red teaming and automation to help uh, test your analytics. Uh, but towards the end of the presentation, they were sort of bemoaning the lack of cloud coverage in attack. And at the time, we had been thinking about what cloud coverage might mean in attack, um, but it really wasn't that much. Um, it was basically just to answer questions about, um, you know, what we were doing, uh, uh, would attack even fit in the cloud, how it might we approach it. So it's basically the, the really early planning phases. Um, so we were able to actually redirect uh, resources to this effort because there was such a high demand. Thank you, Dave and Ryan. Um, and I'm happy to say, if this clicker will work, as of last week, <laughs> we released uh, the first version of Attack for Cloud. Yay. <laughs> and we realize this is just a drop in the bucket. There's 36 techniques uh, that we have. Uh, this problem is a lot bigger than, than just 36 techniques. We know this. Uh, we talked to a lot of organizations to help uh, build this, uh, to help make us make sure that we're defining it in the right way. Um, a lot of them have said that you know a lot of people think attack or uh, cloud is just an extension of the attack and of the uh, the enterprise uh, matrix. Uh, so um, that's how we built it. Um, and of the organizations that we had talked to, uh, we received well over a hundred different technique uh, contribution ideas. Um, so we had to prioritize uh, those uh, based on similarities, based on. Um, what we could find throughout reporting that actually says that these techniques are used in the wild. Um, and some of those organizations that submitted to us were able to actually say that, yes, we've seen this, even though it isn't reported. Um, and that's huge. So I'm happy to say that this is the first ver extension of attack where we've had almost 100% community contributions. And this is exactly how attack should grow um, longer term. And this is just amazing. Um, so. As far as coverage goes, um, Attack for Cloud covers infrastructure as a service. Uh, so we've got the uh, three providers there, um, Azure, AWS, uh, Google Cloud. Um, we have a platform tag for general uh, software as a service techniques. Um, and then we have specific uh, platforms for Office 365 and Azure Active Directory um, to cover uh, specific techniques for those uh, software platforms. So the biggest challenge in building Attack for Cloud and even some of the other efforts uh, that we've done like Attack for ICS is there just isn't a lot of incident reporting out there. I mean, we know things happen, but they're just not reported uh, quite yet. Um, and there's, there is some notable incidents uh, for cloud like the DNC hack. Um, we were scouring even uh, DOJ indictments for, for information on this. So really consider this uh, a call to arms to help us bolster the community knowledge about what adversaries are actually doing in this space uh, because we really, we really need it to build this out uh, further. Um, so if you're in a position to 
either share with us uh, information on what's going on or influence reporting uh, to what gets out into the public, uh, please do so, because um, we, really, we really need it for this. Um, another big change this year, uh, in April we released the uh, impact tactic. Um, so before April, you know, attack was very focused on confidentiality and uh, data exfiltration, so theft of information. Um, and we knew that uh, destructive attacks were sort of a, a big glaring gap in attack. Um, so uh, we did a lot of work analyzing incidents of uh, like Sony Pictures and uh, Saudi Aramco uh, and just uh, WannaCry and the rise of ransomware. So this is a, a big problem um, for a lot of people and we wanted to make sure that we uh, covered it in attack. Um, so originally there were 14 techniques that were published and we just added uh, two with the last update last week. Uh, for system shutdown and reboot and uh, account access removal. Um, another big change this year um, was more of a structural change. Uh, so uh, we did a revamp of mitigations in enterprise uh, so that it acts uh, very similar to how mitigations are described in mobile. Um, so they're treated as objects similar to groups in software uh, where we can have a definition uh, for the mitigation idea and then we can describe how that mitigation applies to individual techniques through the, the relationships between them. Um, and how we built this was we basically went through uh, the existing text field entries and uh, scoured them uh, pretty much uh, to create these categories. Um, and it's really helpful for doing uh, what if analysis. So what is the coverage of a potential uh, mitigation that you want to deploy against the, the techniques, which is a really powerful thing to do. Uh, that you couldn't do before with the, uh, the prior uh, text field entries because, um, because attack grew uh, quite a bit over time. You know, different things are described in different ways by different people, so this was our way of uh, remaining a little bit more consistent about how we're describing mitigations. So let's talk about some issues with attack. Um, anyone who's used attack for a little bit knows that the techniques are a little bit uneven. Um, this was a common theme at last year's attack con um, because uh, some techniques are very broad. Some are even broader than these, but um, these have some definition in them. So there's multiple ways to do these techniques um, that aren't really defined well in attack yet. And some are very narrow. Um, so specific ways to execute something or bypass a certain mechanism um, that maybe are, are too narrow to be a technique. Um, we weren't really thinking about these things when we were building attack. I mean, you saw the, the first version um, earlier in the, the presentation. Um, we were just trying to describe activity in a way that people would pay attention to, and we weren't really worried about abstraction at the time. Um, so this has sort of only magnified the problem as attack has grown, and it's really hard to strike a right, the right balance um, for where to put a, uh, a specific piece of activity or an analytic or uh, some intel and it's even hard for us in trying to figure out uh, where to put uh, a new technique or some new information that somebody sends us. And it's kind of hard, uh, like if, if anyone's seen these uh, horrible gradient puzzles where all the pieces are almost identical and they're the same color, uh, trying to group them all together by similarities, it, it becomes a real challenge to build this puzzle. Um, and one uh, really uh, good example is when we were building cloud, uh, we got several contributions uh, for OAuth spear phishing. Uh, nobody disagrees that this should be an attack. It should very much uh, be an activity uh, because it's been reported used by several groups. Um, but the submissions that we got were like, okay, this is spear phishing, so you should put it in an initial access. Um, and the, the write-ups we got were very detailed. There was a lot of activity in there. Uh, but when we started peeling away the layers of it, um, it was very clear that there's multiple different steps to this. So yes, the spear phishing is coming in. Um, we can cover that by spear phishing uh, with a link. Uh, so user clicks on it, they're presented with a malicious application um, that's asking for authorization to grab their OAuth token. So the user has to click on that, that's credential access. And then there's another step even beyond that where the adversary is using that um, authorization token to access that resource and pull email or information from the user's account, um, which is use of that token. Um, so even though attack, how it is, is kind of hard to figure out exactly where something should go. Um, there is a lot of power in its flexibility to you know, pull apart activity um, and make sure that you fit the right pieces in the right, in the right spaces. Um, so our fix to this is sub-techniques. Um, so it's important to note that they're just behaviors. So 
techniques or behaviors. You can consider them groups of behaviors. Subtechniques are still just behaviors. Um, it's also important to note that we're basically using what we have. Um, so we're not adding a whole lot of new information to this. It's basically a refactoring of what's already in there. Uh, credential dumping is a good example. Uh, process injection is another good example um, of sort of those medium to high level techniques that have a lot of definition in them already um, that we're turning into sub techniques. So this isn't a huge change. It is structurally, but the information is going to be uh, pretty much the same uh, in attack. Um, and because attack is used for a lot of defensive purposes, it's natural to try to think about how to create sub techniques that are defender focused in mind um, to group techniques based on the data sources that you can use to collect activity or the mitigations that you can use uh, to prevent them. And we tried that and it didn't work, uh, unfortunately. Um, so we decided to maintain an adversary mindset. That's what people expect out of attack and that's what we're continuing on with sub techniques. Um, because it's a more logical grouping of what the adversary is trying to accomplish and how um, than trying to do it any other way. Um, and it's also uh, good to think about sub-techniques as platform-specific techniques. So we can describe the activity at a high level, at a technique level, and then get into the details about how that activity applies to a specific platform um, at the sub-technique level. And unfortunately, this isn't a universal thing that we can apply across the board. Um, there are tactics like uh, command and control that are very platform agnostic that we're gonna have to find uh, a different mechanism of, of breaking those out. Um, because after all, uh, different goals uh, require different actions uh, that are all done different ways. And there's no one universal sort of logic to break out a sub-technique. And so we are working on sub-techniques right now. Uh, we've done a ton of work this year uh, to figure out uh, the right way to uh, either break out uh, sub-techniques from existing techniques, roll um, really, uh, really narrow techniques under uh, technique uh, groupings. Um, so the rough stats so far is that we're going to likely be dropping the number of techniques um, to 166 uh, from the current 266, uh, which is a pretty, pretty big reduction. Um, and so far, we've identified 280 uh, potential sub-techniques, so hence the, the meme. You can fit a ton of sub-techniques in attack now. Um, and we're implementing this right now. So we had to wait until uh, the October update to do a clean break, and we're going to be pausing uh, technique updates for right now. Um, you're free to send us your information. Uh, we'll keep tracking it in our internal contribution tracking system. Uh, but for, for right now, don't send us groups and software because the backbeans are gonna change and we'll just have to, to wait until subtechniques is done in order to do that. And so to, to talk a little bit about how we're gonna implement this, um, when subtechniques rolls out, it won't be the de facto production version of attack. Uh, we're gonna be cloning the attack site and putting it in some other uh, location as sort of a preview to give people enough time to digest the information and plan how they're going to implement this because it is a big change and we wanna be sensitive to that and how long and how much effort it's gonna to be to uh, redo, uh, redo tools, redo mappings and, and things like that. Um, so in case nobody's heard of sub-techniques before, hasn't read the blog post yet that we put out a couple of uh, months ago, um, this is one example of uh, credential access, uh, so you can see the, the old view on the left of just the credential access tactic with the individual techniques underneath that. And on the right is the potential sub-technique breakout of that. So if you look at the credential dumping technique, um, there's a lot of the already defined uh, ways of doing that in the description. So we'll be essentially breaking those out into structured uh, ways of doing credential dumping for Windows against the security account manager or LSAS secrets dumping. And, and things like that. Uh, so the sub-techniques will essentially be uh, the technique ID for credential dumping .001 or .002 for these. Um, so the, they'll be directly tied to that technique. And so talking about that blog post that we put out, um, the main reason that we did that was to get some feedback from the community to make sure that we're on the right track. And overwhelmingly, people feel that this is very necessary for attack. And even given the amount of work that it's going to be to implement it, it will be worth it longer term. Um, so that was great to hear. Um, people also took the, the opportunity to provide us some more feedback. Uh, so one of the biggest questions that we got, aren't these just procedures? And no, they're not. Um, so procedures have a very specific definition in attack. Um, essentially, when you go look at the uh, technique pages, 
uh, there's that box that has the uh, groups and software examples that are tagged to that technique, and that's what we consider procedures. Uh, so we actually took that feedback and updated the, the name of that box to procedure examples to help that. But even broader than that, uh, procedures relate to how specific adversaries are going about their operation. Um, so it's really hard to capture that in attack without describing how the adversaries are moving between techniques or how they, they piece things together throughout an operation. Uh, a few people noted that there are still going to be visualization challenges uh, with sub-techniques. And uh, even though we're shrinking the matrix at the technique level by quite a bit, um, and we're going to make that sort of the default view of the attack matrix, uh, we want to have some functionality so people can expand uh, the techniques to show those sub-techniques. Um, and the version that we posted in the blog post uh, shows the, uh, the horizontal breakout where, you know, if you click on too many things, it's going to expand out. Uh, but we also have a vertical breakout example. Um, so we'll likely uh, put out some more information and have uh, some community input, and we might actually make both the versions available so people can use what they, what they like best. Uh, a few people also noted that there's a potential for uh, issues from having an individual sub-technique mapping to multiple uh, techniques, and we're trying to avoid this at all costs. Um, so don't worry, we, we got this. Um, and then uh, another big challenge is uh, people identified was uh, having the uh, tools available to map from the old version of attack to new. So we're going to be providing uh, spreadsheets that have that mapping. We're looking into ways of doing uh, JSON to have a machine readable version. And we're also going to be taking advantage of uh, the sticks revocation functionality where we can revoke an object and have it be revoked by its replacement, um, which could be a, a sub technique. Um, so there will be that pointer in the, the sticks data. Um, a few people also noted that uh, this is a good opportunity to do data source refinement, and data sources are a thing that's like five years old, uh, so we know this is a problem, uh, but we can't get it done uh, during subtechnique. So this is something that we're going to be doing after this uh, gets released. Um, a few people also noted that uh, techniques should be OS agnostic. Uh, largely, we agree it's not going to be universal because of what I said earlier about it. There really being different criteria for breaking out sub techniques per tactic and per, even per technique. Um, a few people noted that techniques should always have sub techniques. Again, sort of. Uh, this is something to shoot for, but we're not going to force uh, a decomposition or um, rolling something into uh, a sub-technique if it doesn't make sense. Uh, part of the uh, awesomeness of attack is its flexibility, so we want to maintain that. And then uh, sub-techniques should be specific. I already covered that, so yes, definitely agree. And a few people also noted that um, sub-techniques will help people um, that have a false sense of security because they're just looking at the top-level matrix view, and once they color that green, they think they're done. Um, so it was really good to hear that because that's one of the reasons that we're doing sub-techniques. And so Katie and uh, Tony also already talked about the growth of the community. Um, so I'm going to, too, um, because this is awesome. Uh, we've had 132 different contributors to Attack right now, um, which is incredible. I mean, Attack is built by the community and is maintained by the community. Um, we've had explosive growth in, in Twitter followers. Uh, a year ago, it was about 12,000, and I think we're over uh, 28,000 as of the start of the conference. Um, and there's uh, 99 uh, open source repositories that use or leverage Attack in some way. Um, so Attack is, is global. It's all over the world. It's showing up in conferences, even people not briefing it from MITRE. Um, it's showing up in workshops, in uh, professional or, uh, groups, and, and things like that. So it's, it's great to see. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do, um, so things to come. Uh, we will be continuing to roll uh, the efforts of attack under the attack uh, umbrella. It's, it's just attack. Um, we started this with the initial access tactic, and we're going to be continuing it with the pre-attack revamp. Um, I already mentioned this, but the ICS team is hard at work trying to get this ready to, to go, and we'll likely be publishing this as a separate website um, in a couple months. Um, so the reason why it's going to be in a separate website is to give it some flexibility to grow uh, to better match that, that domain. And then we'll be looking at uh, rolling it under attack uh, later on. And then a lot of people are creating their own controlled mappings to attack. Um, so we think we can help build a community around this. Um, so uh, we'll be talking about this um, over the conference too. So if I didn't cover your favorite uh, topic related to attack, we've got more updates planned that are sprinkled throughout the next couple days. Um, we're going to be talking about our 
uh, threat report, uh, attack mapping, automation tool, TRAM. Uh, we'll be talking about attack sightings uh, later on today. And then we'll be covering uh, ICS attack, uh, our controls mapping effort, um, car and analytics, and then the uh, integration with pre-attack uh, later on tomorrow. And thank you very much. All right, questions. Hi, just curious if Navigator is going to be mapped to the new techniques as well, the new framework. Yes. Yeah, once we roll sub techniques out, we'll have a version of the Navigator that can support that as well, along with the, the different visualization options. Back there in the corner. What's your thinking on mitigations versus course of actions, or are they the same thing? I think it really just comes down to uh, uh, definition. Uh, we're treating them like courses of action um, in sticks right now. Um, so yes, they, they could be uh, very much courses of actions. Yeah, yeah there's James. You can always rely on me to ask you a question. No, I, I actually just want to thank you for uh, putting yourself in this position. I know that, like, trying to steer a ship with 10,000 or 23,000 followers is not easy. And so I feel your pain and keep up the good work. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It's really the community that makes this worthwhile for us. So I should thank you guys. Yep. <laughs> like, I'm going to throw one at you, and we didn't pre stage this, so feel free to yell at me later. Interesting question. Now, Carl asked me last night, where do you see attack in five years? I hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> I see it being maintained by, more by the community. Uh, we want more transparency in the process, um, and we have some ideas on tools and uh, processes that can help with that. Um, so MITRE is always going to be, I think, in a role where we're uh, curating it, uh, but we really want to foster more contributions from the community. Um, so that's where I think it'll be. Any other questions? If not, please join me in thanking Blake Strom. <laughs> so I think in summary, the state of the attack is strong. Um, we'd be remiss if we didn't give a shout out to Nick Carr and Chris Glier, who have a State of the Hack podcast, both derived, of course, from State of the Union Address. But uh, Nick, we see you. We appreciate you. Blake is not going to start a podcast by the same name, so no lawsuits. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> Wanted to uh, call out a few things. Folks online, we have people from around the world. Um, Sarah noted that we have viewers from Mumbai, India, who said they were watching online. That's pretty awesome. Um, we had a tweet from someone named Yazo who said five minutes into AttackCon online and already learned something I was completely unaware of before, which is pretty exciting from our perspective, that online streaming. Um, we also have a really great pun thread. If anyone is a pun fan, um, started by Dave Westgard, um, those little hats that you got. Uh, MITRE ATT&CK has been working on all kinds of coverage. Very good, Dave. Uh, Bryson jumped in there, hatter's going to hat. Hashtag dad jokes, that was good. Uh, Maggie is not here. This is why MITRE ATT&CK is all caps. And uh, even Robert M. Lee jumped in, not to beret y'all, but just pick one pun and stick to it. Play beanie, meanie, miny, mo if needed. So if anyone is a pun fan, um, there's, some, there's some good ones in that hat thread. Please pile on because we love those puns. So a lot of great things going on, on Twitter, um, here in line, online as well. So um, thank you so much to Blake for his awesome State of the, uh, State of the Attack keynote there. And we're now going to send you into break. A couple notes before we do that. Um, we would like to thank our break sponsor, CrowdStrike. Um, they are providing coffee, um, all of the uh, stuff you'll see out there for that. Um, I'm going to throw it over to our online program in just a moment. Um, so Jamie Williams, my awesome teammate, adversary emulation engineer, here at MITRE is going to be chatting with some of our speakers, some special guests as well. 
um, talking to them on the AttackCon couch. So again, thanks to CrowdStrike for our break. And I encourage you to visit the exhibitors here in McLean. Folks online, uh, stick around, because Jamie's going to be chatting with some folks on that couch. So online folks, we'll see you over there. Um, folks in McLean and online, we'll see you back here at 11 o'clock. Over to you, Jamie. Hello world, welcome to the AttackCon couch. Um, as Katie said earlier, um, I'm your host Jamie Williams and I will be sitting down with some of our speakers and a uh, very interesting guest in the morning, uh, lunch and afternoon breaks. Um, first thing I want to call out is uh, thank you for participating, thank you for joining, we really appreciate you joining from all over the world. Uh, we're watching the tweets, we love it, uh, the cat memes, videos, <laughs> keep them coming. Uh, don't forget to download your watch party selfie poster. We want to see pictures of you, we want to see you know where you are, how you guys are getting together, and like you said, close this community. It's not just us here. It's not just us at MITRE. We really want this to be a worldwide, you know, we're all in this together effort. Um, one note is uh, I am not just talking to you. I want to hear back. Uh, if you have any questions you want me to project to the guest as well as anything we want to talk about in this forum, uh, feel free to use the AttackCon hashtag. This is hashtag AttackCon to uh, send messages, uh, messages our way. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce You've already seen her speak. Our, our <laughs> keynote, wine aficionado and former Georgetown Hoya, and I guess current, because you're never really out of it. Correct. Uh, keynote speaker, Tony Gudguana. Thank you. So um, awesome talk. I really love uh, the keynote speech, like you said. Um, I think one of the hardest challenges about doing a keynote is, like you said, setting the tone for the complete day. And I think you did that with the OODA loop, the importance of Intel, as well as Pyramid Pain. You can't do attack without that's a Pyramid right. Pain. <laughs> it's a fantastic talk. Uh, how are you locking the conference so far? Oh, that's great. Um, you know, admittedly, it's been just the key, you know, keynote and kicking off and then seeing what Blake's had to you know, share on the state yeah. of attack. Um, it's a great crowd, though. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a lot of familiar faces, but also a lot of new ones. Yeah. And the range in terms of how many people are tuning in from all over the world, I think, is really impressive and a testament to how much Attack is growing and taking off. Thank you. Appreciate it. And like I said, love your talk. I think a uh, bigger thing that I focused on in your talk was that you said that community and like bring everyone together, but also like bring new people in. I think mm -hmm. you, you kind of highlighted that with the teaching aspect. I really love that. Um, not just bringing like new people on, but also like later in your career, like you're really never like done learning. And I right. really appreciate you like really like, you know, injecting that and like just reminding us as the community that we're all in this together and like, you know, it's never done. So That's right. thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, I think, the, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the biggest takeaway from your talk was that uh, connection between Intel and operations. Um, yep. Do you want to go into a little more detail about that? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, first of all, as a career Intel person, uh, you know, I, that's the, the, the worldview that I've, I've always had. Yeah. Um, and that's a really fascinating place to be. It can also be pretty frustrating yeah. um, because it's one of those things where we're all on the same team, but sometimes, and again, not because of um, any malice or people, you know, 
trying to de deliberately disrupt things, we just have a hard time getting on the same page. Um, and I think when we take a step back and understand that, it gives us a moment to sort of catch our breath and think through what should we be doing a little bit differently. And yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why attack is so powerful for those teams is that it, it brings them together around a common nomenclature and a common level of analysis and abstraction um, in a way that a lot of times the day-to-day -day churn for both Intel and ops tends to not reinforce in that way. I love that. That's beautiful. And like I said, one of our key foundations is that um, that uh, language, like that common language that like you said, goes across Intel and ops, and you know even more people, like you know, C-suite, procurement, yep. et cetera. Even go down to your sales or whatever your other teams are. So I really love that. Um, can you speak a little bit towards the challenges? But like you said, I think um, I think you highlighted this a little bit. But the Intel community has their biases, the way they work. You know, different different types of people versus your operators. You're more you know hands-on, go out doers. Um, both very important. I think I really appreciate you highlighting the importance and like you said, like it's not, it is a group effort. Right. Um, but what are some of the challenges with getting those two different groups of communities basically to come together into a community where we can work together, we can take advantage of each other's skill sets? Yeah, I think one of the challenges in particular is um, we have different frames for the way we consume information um, in those roles. And the timelines that we use tend to be very different. Um, you know, Intel is very focused on sort of that novel, unique, what's next. Um, and the work that we do in investigating these attacks to understand them gives us a lot of explanatory detail. Uh, and that's very powerful, but the more explanatory detail you have, the harder it is to be predictive. And so striking that balance between the two is uh, a real challenge for a lot of teams. And, um, but without that, it's really difficult for ops to consume and really use that information. Uh, because the amount of time it takes them to build detections and field them is just on a different timeline than the way Intel works. Uh, and so again, this is one of the reasons why I think attack is so helpful is because it helps to bridge that, that difference. Um, and it's, you know, I think it kind of makes both sides a little uncomfortable in a good way, right? So by pushing both Intel and ops out of their comfort zone, it's, it's kind of how you know you're actually making progress. Awesome. And you mentioned uh, the stable signal between Intel and, like you said, feeding operations. But um, personally, as an operator, what can I do for the Intel community to you know, provide feedback that is not, like you said, a month later when you know, that topic isn't hot anymore? Right. Like, to stay relevant in your world. That is a great question. Um, so I think, and my talk very much focused on that Intel to ops, but bringing in the ops to Intel angle is what closes that loop. All about loops today. <laughs> ooda, ooda, ooda. Ooda, ooda, ooda. Um, <laughs> So I think one of the things that becomes very apparent when teams start looking at attack is that when you have those discussions about visibility and detection, um, it showcases those blind spots. Yeah. And those blind spots become especially important for Intel to know because then you need potentially you know, earlier warning, even if it's a little lower fidelity, because you know that you've got more work to do there. And so basically by doing this work, ops can help refine the requirements for Intel in a way that's very powerful and helps them, you know, expand their overall visibility. You sound like a true fusion analyst, so I gotta appreciate that. I love that. it. Yeah, that's a, that's a really <laughs> neat perspective. Um, so you talked a lot about, you know, bringing new people into the community and within the community, people still learning. Um, so taking that back to your teaching uh, endeavors, how do you, um, what do you think is the best time to introduce like students or more like uh, junior analysts or uh, experienced engineers into uh, the attack community? Sure, I mean, I think, uh, you know, any time's a good time, okay. right? Um, in particular, I think by, um, highlighting where it is we want to go. Right. And when you can do that with uh, students and junior employees, yeah. like you're building in the muscle memory and the buy-in for the organization, right? It's very powerful yes. if you can uh, sell this idea of this is how we want to work together yes. to work better. Yes. Um, the more that people understand that in the early phases of the career, the easier it is all the way through. Um, and I think that, you know, attack is a great way, again, to sort of break down some of the complexity of, of cybersecurity overall, right? So while at first you look at that matrix and you're like, holy moly, there's a <laughs> lot going on here. Um, it's an easier reference point than, you know, textbook upon textbook upon textbook. Yeah, that's a very good point. Like you said, unless we're dealing with that matrix Blake showed from five years ago, we really are dealing with a big beast. And I like you, I really appreciate what you said about level setting. Like you said, there is those complexity concerns, but you also have to know this is really gonna be hard. Mm -hmm. But um, at the end of the day, it's all about, like you said, scaling, whether it's scaling like junior staff to be more um, more output and more confident in what they're doing, as well as attribution or attrition, I'm sorry. Um, like, you know, as people leave, you know, this is a very dynamic field, people yep. leave, you have to fill in those back holes. Um, so I really appreciate um, everything you've said and kind of like, like you said, level set 
attack con. Um, anything else you wanted to say from your talk that you're getting, getting get a chance to? Or? Who? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if I had enough memes. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did. It was really fantastic. Like, that was one of the things we were definitely watching Twitterverse and absolutely loved it. So really appreciate that. Um, so I guess personal story. How did you get into attack? Like, where did you first hear of it? What was your um, adoption process like? Yeah, so for me, it really came when I got to Threat Connect. Okay. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, my experience starting as an intel analyst in the Department of Defense both predates attack because uh, I'm a little old, <laughs> um, but also just the type of work that I was doing was a little different. So okay. it was when I came into the private sector uh, and was really hit by how tactical the implementation of threat intel was yes. um, that I started looking around for. There's got to be a way for us to draw this discussion up um, yes. to a, you know that more robust level, uh, and that's when I found attack. And so I was very excited about it, but you know in 2015 when it was first coming out, it was still pretty unknown, and yes. so. Uh, it's been tremendously exciting to see over the last two years how the community has really gathered around this and we've sort of decided that this is how we're going to talk about TTPs. Um, and that's really sort of that, that critical mass is the foundation for all the things that we're seeing today, right? The wider spread vendor adoption, more teams using this. Um, and now I think you're getting that velocity where we're going to get a lot more automation both to, you know, produce intelligence for attack and consume it. And that's really exciting. That's awesome. And as I say, I really appreciate what you said about, um, you know, coming from the government side, it was a lot of uh, the focus was on intel driven people. Yeah. And then going to the private, it was the systems. And I think you're really like, you're really kind of highlighting in the talk now, as well as your keynote was fusing those, where I yep. think both communities both need those, uh, both aspects of that. So. Uh, on that thread, uh, more in the private sector, how do you think we can do, you speak of culture, and you said that, like the interrelationship and setting a culture of using attack. What else can we do as a attack community to kind of like embed this intel-driven, you know, data-driven approach to our people? Sure. Um, events like AttackCon, I think, are really central yeah. to that, right? Uh, it's allowing the community to share those lessons learned, what's worked, and equally, like, what hasn't. <laughs> um, that accelerates that learning, right? Yeah. Uh, and the more people that become familiar with it, the, the greater the velocity becomes. Like, the success feeds on itself. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, like I said, I think during the question and answer session, you know, a, a well-timed vignette from a, a peer at a, yeah. at a company in your industry can be really compelling in helping build that buy-in within yeah. the team. And so uh, events like this are really important for, you know, circulating the, that oxygen yeah. uh, amongst a wider community. Like you said, I really appreciate, um, I think it's great. Like you said, even coming to an event like this, I, a lot of people are maybe um, apprehensive to kind of like approach someone like you. Like, wow, the keynote speaker, um, any advice for someone to say, hey, like I have a vignette or I want a vignette. How do I, how do I tease that out of you? Like if yeah. I'm just some lowly analyst from, you know, some company and you've probably never heard of. And so here you are. First of all, yeah. come say hi. <laughs> <laughs> Bring a glass of wine maybe or? I mean, do they have wine at the break now? Perhaps. It's a little early. We'll see, it's yeah. like 10.30. <laughs> I'll look. <laughs> um, no, I mean, don't be afraid to come up and say hi. These okay. are these events are welcoming, and you know, for first-time speakers, like thinking about, or for those with those vignettes, thinking about speaking, it can be incredibly intimidating. But it's a great way to get that story out there and make you clarify in your head, like what worked and what didn't. That's awesome. Um, Got to do my attack trivia. Um, what's your favorite tactic technique? Anything? Oh my goodness. Oh, that's such a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with a, with a simple one. I actually really like spear phishing. Spear phishing. Why is that? Uh, because it's such a central part of a lot of the attacks that we see, yeah. um, and the way that it becomes the gateway to sort of you know the rest of the phase yeah. of you know of how that attack unfolds. Yeah. Um, I it's it's something that's really astounding to me how well it continues to work. It's an oldie but a good. It's an oldie but a good. It's a classic. Yeah. yeah. So it'll uh, never go away. And it's I, never going to go I'm away. I'm sure as we see the sub techniques roll out, we'll still see it. It might grow. It might shrink. We'll never know. But definitely appreciate it. So thank you for your time. And thank um, you. Like you said, thank you for participating. It was truly an honor and a pleasure. So Thanks. thank you. Great con. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, next up, we will be inviting our um, the face of attack, Blake Strom. Uh, but attack con will be back in a couple minutes.
Welcome back, Attack Con. And now I'm going to sit down with the man, the myth, the legend, the fearless leader, Blake Strom. So thank you for being here. Yep, thanks for having me. Uh, what do you think about the conference so far? It's been amazing. We were already one day down, and we had lots of great conversations yesterday with the birds of a feather. Um, we got to get some specific feedback from people on sub techniques, which is really awesome. So that was the, um, the birds of a feather that I led. So good conversations. Uh, had fun at the beer garden last night. So, <laughs> yep, been good great so far. Great to hear. Yeah, I, I imagine you got your coffee already. Yep. Good to hear. Yep. So uh, one thing that Tony said earlier was uh, I really appreciated was uh, attack is everywhere. And like I said, did you five, four years ago when you made that tiny matrix that you shared with us, that was awesome, by the way. Did you think it would grow to what we are, what we're sitting with today, especially uh, everyone here today as well as uh, viewing online? No, not at all. I mean, we were just trying to solve our internal problems of uh, that we're doing for um, adversary emulation, trying to merge thread intel with red teaming to test. Uh, to see whether or not the uh, sensors and analytics that we were doing under another research project were actually useful. I didn't know that it was going to be useful for the entire community. Um, so we we're just sort of trying to solve our own problems, but it was yeah. turned out that there were problems that everybody had. That's awesome. And one of the memorable things I took away from your talk was uh, this wasn't an accident. Like you said, threat informed defense, you guys saw that, uh, that idea early and you thought, hey, this is the best way to do this. And you ran with it, you stuck with it. And I think the community in total as me and Dwell appreciate that. So thank you. Um, so what's next? Uh, you gave some ideas, I know, uh, mitigation, sub-techniques, cloud. Um, you know, what's, what's on the horizon for Attack 2020? Well, we're going to continue doing what we're doing with what's already out there um, because we have to maintain it as new techniques are discovered and used. Um, so Attack needs to, to maintain that. Uh, but we're also going to be uh, doing a revamp of the data sources once uh, uh, sub-techniques is done uh, to provide more granularity and detail there that people can use to assess whether or not uh, sensors are working uh, effectively for them or what sort of data they need to drive their analytics. Um, another thing we're doing is uh, releasing Attack for ICS. Um, so there's been a ton of work uh, going on uh, with that project for the past couple of years. Um, the team's already uh, briefed a couple of presentations out there, so there's some information out there, but we really want to get this out uh, later this year. Um, we're also working on a network uh, devices attack matrix. So. Uh, techniques that adversaries use to gain access and leverage that access on uh, routers and switches. Um, so that's still in the, the research phase. So we'll probably look to publish that um, a little bit further on next year. That's awesome. And like you said, um, it seems like every time we define a new platform, whether it be cloud, IoT, ICS, there's a, people want to attack. They want to attack that same model to apply to it. They want to be able to use that same framework. So I really appreciate all the work we're doing or you're doing to like implement all that. Um, so speaking on, like you said, I think one of the big things you talked about is uh, understanding the threat, understanding the adversary. Um, from your perspective, what do you see as the next big cyber threat? Is it you know a particular adversary, a particular like TTP connection, a certain specific industry? Uh, what's kind of keeping Blake up at night? Um, it seems like different uh, methods of execution um, and different methods of trying to evade uh, current defenses. So EDR products. And, and things like that, I think is where a lot of the focus is because the adversaries are aware that there's a lot of visibility in this way. Um, so they're going to be trying to, to navigate around that and figure out ways of doing things that aren't being looked at um, by, uh, by defenders. So how does the community address that issue? I mean, uh, we I mean, obviously we're always looking for contributions to build that taxonomy and they share that knowledge, but in terms of like you mentioned, the use cases of you know, evaluations, car, there's all this adoption from all these different fields. How do we address a particular issue, like you said, uh, the, I guess, the variance in execution? It's mainly just the, the contribution. So as people see these things, um, they may not see that activity exactly uh, when the act, uh, adversary is, is detected. Um, it might be something that they use, like a credential dumping. And as they analyze what actually happened during the intrusion, they can piece it together like, oh, they were doing credential dumping this way, and we wouldn't have detected it that way. But we saw um, the after effects, because maybe it was uh, accessing LSAS memory in a certain way that was being detected. Um, so it's really trying to look at uh, who has that visibility in the community and make sure that they're able to and willing to uh, share that information with us, uh, whether uh, directly or through uh, open reporting uh, when they see these incidents. Can you speak a little bit towards how the community can be involved with Attack? I know we mentioned you know, the sightings program, we have the email, we love Twitter, uh, hashtag AttackCon, don't forget it. Um, so how, how does the community participate? Like, like you said before, you, you explicitly thank the community. Like This is a 100% community effort and it's definitely a community project, but uh, just to remind people out there and, and me as well, how do, we, uh, how do we keep this community tight? Um, we talk to people at conferences, uh, we hold events like AttackCon, um, but to get directly involved uh, with the contribution process, 
Um, the best mechanism we have right now is, is over email. So email us at attack at mitre.org. Uh, send us your ideas of what you think is missing from attack, along with some supporting evidence. So the things we look for primarily are threat intel. So we want to track activity that adversaries are known to use and have used in the past. So not necessarily academic information. Um, it may not be uh, a presentation that you saw at Black Hat. It's some really cool technique that some uh, researcher discovered. Um, we're not really looking for that. Um, it's cool to send us that so we can have it on our radar in case there is some evidence of use that pops up later. Uh, but we really need sort of uh, the threat intel aspect of, of these techniques because people really want to use attack um, as a way to prioritize because there's a lot of different activity that adversaries can do, uh, but they want to focus on you know what is actually being done first, yeah. and that's that's the real power of attack. Oh, absolutely, and like Tony said, this is a very complex problem. So like knowing where to start is probably the hardest question you'll ever ask yourself. Um, any plans for Halloween? I know you have some kids, you might do some trick-or-treating. Yeah, so I got to fly back uh, early Thursday morning to be home in time to, to take the kids trick-or-treating, so. Any yep. spoiler alerts, but uh, any any uh, costume ideas yet, or? For me? Oh, uh, for them, you? No, I mean... I'm, I'm not a costume person. <laughs> <laughs> I have more fun with my kids doing it. Yeah. So my daughter is going to be uh, like a scary cat. She's got a scary cat costume. Okay. And then my son has a, a dinosaur costume. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge the community to some uh, tweets and Blake, uh, uh, Costume ideas for Blake. Maybe we can get him in a syringe for process injection. Oh, or <laughs> feel free to Photoshop him as well. Um, me as well. That'll be that'll be excellent. Um, anything you want to tell the community? I think we have a pretty a great following online. Hopefully, a lot of people are watching the stream and we'll be reading the tweets in between breaks to follow back. But anything you kind of want to push the community in terms of? I know you mentioned like contributions are key as well as feedback on sub techniques and all these uh, as as we develop and evolve the kind of the matrix. Like feedback is critical. But anything else explicitly you want to? push out to the, uh, all of our fans, friends, fan. Yeah, just tell us what we can do better. I mean, we're here for the community, um, and we need your feedback in order to help improve attack uh, over time. So if there is uh, new domains that you think uh, could help from uh, a matrix and the attack sort of modeling methodology to describe adversary behavior, let us know, and we'll see what we can do about it. Um, so this extends beyond just contributions to attack itself. but. Um, also, analytics for CAR, we're taking contributions there. Um, if you have uh, data related to uh, attack uh, sightings, uh, that would be really interesting for us. Um, so that's another effort that we kicked off uh, this year, um, and we're trying to partner with uh, various organizations and industry uh, to share information with us based on uh, what they're seeing. So a lot of vendor products are now mapping to attack, um, so their detections are actually labeled with attack techniques. So that's really interesting information for us because it gives us a more real-time view of what adversaries are doing uh, beyond the finished threat intel reports that largely are just fact of uh, evidence of attack uh, uh, technique use. Um, so getting sort of that, that trending data so we can say, you know, uh, these particular execution techniques were uh, more popular in quarter one than quarter two. Um, would be really interesting for people because they know sort of more uh, what to focus on um, over time. Awesome. Um, and I think last question, I think we're running out of time here, but a uh, little history lesson. Like, how did, where did the name attack come from? Was that a backronym or? Uh... It was definitely a backronym, and I will give Eric Sheasley all the credit for that. So he was <laughs> part of the original four um, that, that created attack, and I think he was just driving to work one day. He was like, hmm, attack, attack. How do we backronym attack? And then it, it just stuck. <laughs> It was a really catchy term that you know was not too bad, but you know it, it caught people's attention, and that's what we really wanted to do with attack. It, it stuck indeed. It surely yes. did. And uh, with that, um, I'm going to remind the community: please tweet us uh, attackcon. Uh, don't forget about the watch party poster selfies. Uh, download those. We want to see your best Halloween costumes as well as if you have any questions for the couch uh, as we invite our next speaker session at uh, the lunch break. Uh, with that, uh, attackcon will be back in a few minutes. Right. Thank you. Thank you.
effort everyone will make to help part. Come on, folks, stop talking. <laughs> I know, that's a good idea. Welcome back to Mitre Attack on 2.0. Please give a warm welcome to Katie Nichols. Welcome back from break, everyone. Hope you enjoyed some of those donuts. Thanks to CrowdStrike for providing those. Appreciate that. And while we were taking our break here in McLean, got a tweet from Don M that uh, students at a watch party in Virginia Beach, uh, not too far away, were also snacking during their break. So. Again, we appreciate all the folks joining us online. Hopefully uh, you online, as well as those of you listening here in McLean, enjoyed uh, the AttackCon couch time with Jamie, Tony, and Blake. So thanks to them for that. Now my pleasure to introduce our next speakers coming from Nationwide, David Weston and Andy Cattell. Um, one of the best ways to learn how to use Attack is to see what other organizations are doing and see if that works for you. And uh, Threat Intel is in their uh, presentation title, so probably no surprise that I pretty strongly advocated on the committee for accepting this one because they have such great content about threat intel, not just related to attack, but how to use threat intel to prioritize your defenses, which is something that we on the team and I believe in really strongly. Um, and I also love that they share both the successes they've had as well as uh, maybe a rocky start, some of the failures and challenges they had as they started. Um, so please join me in welcoming David and Andy. <laughs> All right, good morning. Katie, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. We're, we're excited to be here today to tell you about Nationwide's journey to operationalizing the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Like any good story, uh, it started off with a lot of promise, this MITRE ATT&CK thing, how great this could be for our organization. And then we tried to do it in our own environment and realized how tough it was. Uh, and we tried our own ways and ended up realizing and going into despair as, as we realized we had no idea what we were doing uh, and, and realizing the enormity of this situation. Uh, in getting to the point where we almost gave up on, on MITRE ATT&CK, almost threw it in the trash because we just didn't fit, know how to figure out how to get value out of this. But then we stumbled upon this thing called intelligence, 
it kind of shed some light on, on, on how we could actually go about doing this, gave us some focus, gave us some prioritization, gave us, uh, allowed us to see the light, to be able to seize the day, do all those famous things like, like slaying dragons, uh, and ultimately being able to operationalize this within our own environment. So quite, not quite a Hollywood uh, story here, but we're really excited about the journey that we've been on over <coughs> the last several years, and to be able to talk to you today about that. But first, we're gonna hit our introductions here. I'm Andy Cantel. I've been in IT security for the last 20 years and spent the last four in Nationwide Insurance and their Cybersecurity Operations Center. I'm also our attack champion, spreading all the goodness that we can do with attack. Awesome. And David Weston, I spent 20 years as an intelligence officer in the Marine Corps, spent the last year, four years uh, helping to stand up the capabilities at U.S. Cyber Command, ended up retiring at the end of 2017, joining Nationwide early in 2018 and have been there since then. So we also have a couple other folks that have been on this journey. One of the big key lessons that we learned, I think Tony mentioned it, was it can't just be a couple folks doing this. We've had a, quite the village that have helped us out over the last uh, year in particular. One of our associates is actually across town right now giving a presentation at another conference, very similar to the presentation we're giving here, except focusing on the collection tools that we use and spending. Uh, so. Uh, uh, we also have uh, the Columbus Collaboratory. That's a, a group of seven different uh, companies, some of the largest companies in Columbus, Ohio, that bandied together uh, to focus on the cybersecurity challenges. That's another topic, if, if anybody's interested offline, that we'd love to chat with you about. So we're gonna start fo by focusing on how it didn't work, and I'm, I'm gonna give this over to Andy. <clears throat> yeah, so like with many organizations, getting started with attack can be quite challenging. Um, understanding what attack is, who should we involve, how do we use this, uh, is a few questions we wanted to answer. So we put together a project with the approach of looking at taking the MITRE techniques and lining them up with our security tools, and also the second focus of testing out our endpoints to identify any potential uh, security threats. So <clears throat> we uh, started off, yep. So we started this project Squishy, it's a great name. Uh, Here's what we ended up doing is we had uh, members from the attack and penetration team as well as security tool engineers uh, coming together and performing some of these tests. Like any great road trip, we were high energy, excited. Uh, we had all the, the techniques, the MITRE framework. We had security tools to, to look at and we had all these techniques we wanted to assess against. Um, we started off testing each technique one at a time. Uh, we went very deep and very wide on those techniques uh, sometimes knocking down lines of defenses on the endpoints and retesting it again and again. Um, great approach, very thorough, got a lot of good understanding of how the, uh, the attack techniques operated. Um, but then leadership started coming to us saying, are you done testing all the techniques? You've been doing this for a while. Uh, wh what are the results? And, and then we kind of started understanding a few months into the project that our current methodologies and approach it will probably take several years going through this, and, and it wasn't, wasn't working out. <clears throat> so for our first attempt, uh, we learned a lot of what to do and what not to do with the MITRE framework. Uh, the primary thing is, is the lack of focus. Uh, when we got done with testing a technique, we went forward and grabbed another technique. No real rhyme or reason. Maybe it was something we heard in the news, some approach that some of the AMP team wanted to test out. So we didn't really have that, that focus that really drove a lot of this. Um, we also weren't really formalized in how we wanted to document this. So we went forward, we went forward testing out a technique, and when we were done, we moved on to another one, but we really didn't capture the consistently how the results were done. Uh, that also led to uh, lack of uh, participation because while the attack and pen team was working on it, the other engineers were were participating, but they weren't able to be active in that project. Uh, so we had some participation fee that, that came up as well. <clears throat> so by the summer of 2018, we'd been trying to, to operationalize, operationalize MITRE ATT&CK for about 15 months, and we were go and the ATT&CK framework was going nowhere at Nationwide except maybe into the trash. We just, we had no excitement around this, this framework. We had no, nobody really still understood what it could do for us. Nobody, none of our leadership could find value in what we were trying to do. So I like stories. I think stories help uh, embrace uh, new concepts, especially uh, tricky concepts. And one of the challenges we were having is we couldn't tell our story for what we were trying to do with attack. 
Uh, if, if you'd asked us what our story was for MITRE ATT&CK back uh, in the summer of 2018, it would be something similar to this. Hey, boss, you know, we've got this 240-some-odd techniques uh, that tell you everything that all threat actors are going to be able to do in our environment. We're, we've we've kind of looked through those. I think we're pretty good against most of those techniques. We've got some other ones that we probably could work on. And uh, we're going to go and we're going to deep dive into a couple techniques and see what we can come up with. Kind of boring not really giving any excitement, not really giving what leadership needs, which is an understanding of what's going what's gonna to affect him and, it, and his job, what's going to kind of get him in trouble. And so let's add that intelligence into there, and let's, let's change the story. So if we came across it, so we, we added intelligence, and our story started sounding like this. Hey, boss, our research indicates that there are 27 threat actors that are known to target similar peers in our finance and insurance industry. Those 27 threat actors are known to use 91 specific techniques in their attacks. Additionally, we can further prioritize those, those techniques based on widespread use and ease of execution. We are going to test those 91 techniques, and we're going to come up with mitigations and detections. We're going to implement those environments to protect against the, the most likely threat actors that are facing our industry. That's a lot better story. That's something that tells to risk, that tells senior leadership, gets them excited about what's, gonna, what's most likely to affect them and, and affect our company, and what's going to keep them safe, uh, what's going to keep our company safe and keep our, our CISO's job safe. OK, so the process that we ended up using at Nationwide was a five-step process. We're going to talk heavily about the threat intelligence phase here. But there are four other phases. And, and I will tell you that the best thing to say is that once we figured out the threat intelligence phase, everything else kind of fell into place. And we'll talk about this slide here in a second. But really, the threat intelligence phase was the roadmap that we used. And once we had that down, everything was pretty simple. So I talked a second ago about 27 threat actors. That's what we ended up with that we, we were focused on uh, at Nationwide, focused on the finance and insurance industry. How we got there was actually uh, almost pure luck. In the summer of 2018, we had an intern, and we gave her a typical intern project. Hey, go figure out all the, all the threats that could potentially uh, affect Nationwide. So she, we did this project actually completely separate from MITRE ATT&CK. And, and uh, if you remember, at the time, MITRE ATT&CK for us was going nowhere. We were, we were basically getting ready to scrap that. It turns out that putting those two together is when we realized that we had a lot of value for our organization. But so the 27 threat actors, so uh, again, we gave this intern a, a project. She went out and she did a whole bunch of open source research trying to figure out. Uh, and she ended up finding this spreadsheet uh, out there that had a, a couple hundred different <coughs> threat actors. This spreadsheet had a number of different tabs based on, on geographic location. It had a whole bunch of columns that, that uh, I think we mentioned, you know, uh, a threat actor has 12 or 13 other different names. So it had columns for those. It talked about the attacks that they were involved in. But it had a really neat column on there that talked about the industries that each of the threat actors were known to target. We saw, we saw that as something that we could be able to take advantage of in our, in our organization. So we did a bunch more research. We, we uh, fine-tuned that spreadsheet. We, we added a few threat actors that we knew about that weren't on there. We kind of cleaned up uh, some of the work that was in there. We still had this big spreadsheet of, of data. And we're like, OK, so we need to make this more valuable to Nationwide. And that's where we came up with a, a scoring system like you see on the screen here. So this scoring system, again, it's very basic. All we did was we, we started taking a look at, at just kind of guessing at what each of the threat actors' capability and, intents, and intent were. So intent for us, we're a US-based company. So if the, the threat actor was targeting overseas and not targeting anywhere in the US, we're not going not gonna to care about it as much. If they're targeting, uh, if they're financially motivating, we'll give them a point. If they're uh, targeting the, financer, uh, the finance industry, we'll give them a point. If they're targeting the finance and insurance industry, we'll give them a point. If they're targeting nationwide, we'll give them a whole bunch of points. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Point is that it wasn't very scientific. It was just, it was kind of name, let's go throw, throw a number on there. And we really didn't worry about so much about being exact on that. Same thing with capability. If, as we went through our research, as we uh, were studying the, the different threat actors, if somebody had come out and said, this is a really capable threat actor, these are very sophisticated threat actors, we'll give them more points. If they were saying they're kind of more script kitty-like, we wouldn't give them a lot of points. And uh, ultimately, you know, if they had additional resources behind them, we'll add up, uh, we'll give them a few more points, again, on a scale to one to five. And then we aged off that number. So if we hadn't seen a threat actor, uh, any activity in the last six months, 12 months, uh, et cetera, we'd start taking away half a point here and half a point there. So that way, we didn't end up with our top threat actor being somebody that nobody's heard of since 2011. So 
ultimately, we have this great spreadsheet now. It still isn't, it, we've got a whole bunch of numbers on it, but it still isn't telling uh, a full story. So what we, uh, we realized is we needed to do what any self-respecting Intel shop is gonna, would do, which is we put it into a chart. And it's a very pretty chart indeed. Uh, here's where we actually taken threat intelligence and visualize the threat actors, and we can now quickly learn a lot about our adversaries. Uh, one thing we picked up was a great aha moment is that they were evenly spread across the chart, and they weren't clustered in any one central area. Uh, this is also the first time we're able to take threat intelligence and the MITRE attack framework and start make, bringing awareness to our, our security teams and to our leadership, who especially like the chart because now it, it really brought home almost a face to some of these threat actors that are operating against us. <clears throat> As many security professionals, we want to sit there and try to evaluate every single technique, every single threat, every single tool. Uh, following this approach, we're now able to take that down to uh, the top 27 threat actors that are operating against us. Uh, we're able to look at the TTPs that they're using, and we want to give those the highest uh, prioritization and understanding of how they're, they're working against us. <clears throat> so now we're, we're armed with uh, a focus. We know who we're gonna go after, and we know who we're looking into, and we can move on to the what. So to get to what, we went back to the MITRE ATT&CK uh, website, a great resource to be able to pull down the techniques that are associated with, with each of these threat actors. So we went there, we went to, to uh, the attack uh, what is the, uh, drawing a blank the on navigator. that, but the navigator. navigator, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Uh, and went to the navigator, you love, you put in a threat actor, it gives you uh, all the techniques associated with that. Fin7, there's 22 different techniques that are associated <coughs> with them. Uh, so we, we did that, but we realized that with 27 threat actors, not all of them were on the MITRE ATT&CK sites. We had to do a lot of research ourselves. We used our, our own intelligence collection uh, service. We used Recorded Future, but any of the other Tip, uh, typical uh, intelligence collection uh, services are going to be able to give you a similar uh, capability to be able to dive into each one of the threat actors to be able to understand uh, how do they, the anatomy of how they attacked and then to understand the techniques associated with that. So we spent a lot of time, we, we grabbed research from FSISAC, from our friends in the Columbus Collaboratory, from Twitter, from any, anywhere we could find it, we just, we threw it all together into a big pile. Again, we're not so worried about being right or wrong so much as we're trying to just get as much information on each of these threat actors as possible. So we, we tried to put it into attack, uh, we started off by trying to put everything into attack navigator, realized that we wanted to, to shape the, the data a little bit differently. We wanted to be able to put a heat map for how many, the widespread use of certain techniques. So we did, uh, we exported all of that into a spreadsheet because we like spreadsheets and uh, we ended up with something that looks like this. So all of the yellow on there were, were where we had one or two threat actors that were using a technique. The ones that are closer to red, we had more uh, threat actors that were using those techniques up into things like PowerShell, I think eight or nine, uh, the threat actors that we had noted were, were using that technique. But it's still kind of clunky. There's still, it's still a little bit messy here. We're still not being able to tell the full story. And I, the problem is that this, you're still talking in this huge spreadsheet and it's, it's still cluttered with a bunch of information on here. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna remove all of the techniques that we're not gonna focus on. And now you get what I think Blake had mentioned earlier about not being able to put, a pot, put all your, your MITRE attack on one slide. We've got our MITRE attack on one slide. These are the things that we care about at our organization. And the neat thing on this one is, I've actually presented this up to our CIO as far as uh, on, on a PowerPoint slide similar to this. And it's, it's something unlike you know, as everybody else struggles with trying to get this, uh, what a MITRE attack looks like in one area. But most importantly, we have a manageable project. So we started with 240 plus techniques and we had no idea where to start with on that. Now we have 91 techniques. We've had, we have some tactics that only have four techniques that we need to focus on. This is, a true, this is something that you can actually get into. It's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, just you're, you're taking that first bite of the apple. You need to be able to take it before you can move on. And this, is, this enabled us to do that. So, you know, in our mind, this was the most important thing for us, was to get to this point. Once we had 91 techniques, everything else, you know, no, our, to my favorite uh, action character growing up, G.I. Joe, you know, we had the information and, and knowing is half the battle, and, and quite honestly, that's, that's true. So the next thing we need to do is we need to actually put that into the rest of our process. So we talked about a five-step process that we had. Uh, once we had this, everything else really just kind of fell right into place. So we, the next thing that we did with each one of those 91 techniques was we tested those. So we have an attack and penetration team at Nationwide. 
uh, that we, we ended up using to test these. But quite honestly, the, the Red Canary uh, Atomic Red Team uh, scripts were uh, used on a, quite, uh, a great majority of these to be able to, to test. So you don't necessarily need your own attack and penetration to do this. As we tested these, we realized that there were some things that uh, did work in our environment. Uh, there were some things that didn't work in our environment. Uh, for those that, uh, that our attack team was able to execute in our environment, we went back to the, to the MITRE attack site, pulled down the recommendations for mitigations and detections. Each, one, each recommendation we put onto a, a separate line onto our spreadsheet, because we like spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. And we then used that, and we started working with our infrastructure folks and started talking to them based, hey, in our environment, can we execute this recommendation? If we can execute this recommendation, we did. If we could not, we pushed, uh, we, we uh, modified that in some way that would work for us. So a lot of the recommendations were secure config recommendations, very easy to do in our environment. There were other ones that, that we couldn't do because of uh, the way our network is set up. And there were still others that we realized if we put them together into a big project, we could actually get uh, resourcing and funding for that. And because we were able to talk and tell a story about how this is impacted, that these are threat actors that are specifically targeting our industry made it a lot easier to get the funding to be able to get those projects, uh, projects started. Then the last thing that we did was the leadership phase. In the first go around, we kept everything very close hold. We, we actually classified a lot of the data that was coming out of there. And so only a few people actually knew what was going on. Well, only a few people knowing what's going on doesn't get people excited about what we're doing here with MITRE ATT&CK. We split the script for this time. We, we told everybody. We, we had weekly updates where we would share, here are the techniques that we tested, here's, the, here's what we were successful on, what we were not successful on, here are the mitigations, detections, and here's what we're doing about that. We had monthly meetings with executive leaders where they had an opportunity to help ask questions and understand what this MITRE ATT&CK thing was and how we were implementing it in our environment. And when we were done with the first testing phase, we said, we need to go on a roadshow. So we spent two months going through out nationwide talking about MITRE ATT&CK, talking about all the different techniques, walking through each one of those techniques, the 91 techniques, and showing them where we're uh, protecting nationwide against the most likely threat actors uh, to target our industry. And then we also took it on the road to outside of nationwide. You see us here. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also got uh, somebody over at another uh, conference talking about ATT&CK. We're excited about it, but that was really one of the things that we found was very beneficial for uh, operationalizing this. So where did we end up with all, this, all of this? with a lot of work. So there was a lot of recommendations that came out of the work that we did. Uh, we've implemented a lot of those. We still have a number of projects that we're working on right now. But most importantly, we ended up with uh, a change in our culture. So if you had asked me 18 months ago what our culture was at Nationwide, I'd tell you it was a, a compliance-based culture. We worried about audits. We worried about regulations. If you ask me today, we talk about intelligence-driven operations. We focus on what is the most important threats to our environment and we actually go out and we start uh, making our security, sure our security controls are covering against those most likely threats. That is a huge change, and that's all because of what we did with MITRE ATT&CK, and because we started prioritizing, because we focused our efforts just on those 91s, just, just on those threat actors and techniques that we're targeting uh, our network. So are we done? No, so we've got a whole bunch more that we're doing, and I'm going to show you a few things. So I, we, uh, Andy showed you that chart that we had earlier that had a whole bunch of threat actors. That was just a first go. We, we winged it. I'm, I'm not going to try to uh, lie up here. We, we basically just said, hey, let's just throw this out and see what happens and, and what sticks. So over the time, we've refined that. We've gotten down to a better understanding of certain threat actors that are targeting us. Well, we threw this up about six months ago. This uh, specific one, we're still refining from there. But we realized that, obviously, with, with MITRE coming out with new techniques, with threat actors coming out with new techniques, we always have to iterate through this. And, and we did so. We, uh, so we had 19 new techniques that came out of this, uh, the time that we, we updated this chart, uh, went ahead and tested those, mitigated and uh, put in new mitigations and detections on those. Uh, and we're constantly reviewing that monthly and, and a quarterly basis. We talked earlier about prioritization of the, the techniques. So we talked about widespread use is the first way that we prioritize. We've, we've uh, gone back and we've looked at it again. We said, hey, not only widespread use, ease of execution, how dangerous is it in our environment? That's led us to a 1 to 91 ranking of the, of the techniques in our environment. And we've added the 19 new ones that we've done now. Uh, but what this does is this enables us to have that conversation. Now I can have a conversation if there's two different projects that need funding or two different projects that need resources. Was that project dealing with one of these top uh, couple of techniques or was it dealing with 
uh, one that's 89 or 90 on the, on the ranking chart. I'm sure going to get the funding for the top five than I was before. This is something that we didn't have before. We couldn't have those conversations. And, and quite honestly, we were spending a lot of time focusing on techniques that didn't matter to us at Nationwide. And so now we actually, every single time we, we talk about new projects, we talk about in prioritization, where does that, where does that rank as far as priority? Intelligence driving security. This is an area that has me excited the most. Uh, as a lot of us receive our news from the intelligence feeds, uh, it's typically just threat actors, what they're doing, maybe some malware, what's happening there, and a, a little story of what happened. Like they get into an environment, the, the, the normal uh, stories that we typically hear. Here, we're taking that intelligence and we're combining it with the attack framework to capture a, a strong message that goes across our entire organization. There, the attack framework is now a common language. Uh, we still have the information about what the attack is. We still uh, maybe include a visual representation of how the attack was executed. But now we lay out technique by technique how that attack was performed. Uh, this is invaluable. Uh, here we have an anatomy of a breach, an example we try to use, and, and we hand that off to one of our security engineers. Our security engineers, they know our environment. They know our security tools. They know our lines of defense. Taking an information like this, intelligence-driven, and adding MITRE to that, they can quickly start looking at where do I need to step in, where can I implement the kill chain, and, and we found that to be a huge success. Yeah. So key takeaways, you know, uh, lessons learned from the first project uh, helped drive some of the, the behaviors in this successful project that we took on. Uh, the, the key one there is, is focus. You have to have focus. Uh, documentation of, of how we're going to do the assessment process w was key and involving a, a large team of people. Uh, I know one of our, our feedback we heard from the first project is that like the attack and pen team would go off and do a finding and throw that on to our IT organization. Here in this project, they were on board day one. We were engaging them, we were asking them questions on how should this attack work. Uh, and we were also spreading the, the good news about what attack can do for them. So we, the other key takeaway too is involved leadership. When they're on board on a weekly basis, and we had like a, a quarterly readouts too of, of like major findings that or recommendations we come up with, but involving them on, on a con constant basis was invaluable. All right, so that's our story. Uh, we've, I think we've got a couple of minutes if there's anybody that has any questions. Thanks for sharing that. So as you implemented these 91 uh, attack controls, did you get any other benefits? Like did the red team quit because they couldn't hack into anything more? Did you get more visibility in the stock, too many alerts? What, what were some of the other effects? Uh, for, for us, the, the effects is just, for a lot of the, uh, the changes we had to implement, those teams are overwhelmed. Uh, they have a lot of news coming out, a lot of changes they have to look at Dawn. Here we're saying, hey, I need these recommendations done because we have 27 threat actors that are operating in the finance and insurance sector that are coming at us. So help prioritize the work they need to do. And it also wasn't uh, one of those audit driven, oh, we have a finding, oh, we got to solve it. It's like, hey, this is a real world uh, type of attack that's coming at us. So that helped drive the behavior and thinking. Before they're thinking like, oh, I got to go and implement this in a, in a casual time frame. Uh, they felt engaged. They thought they were on board in the whole process. So. I think that's the most exciting thing is that people believe in what they're doing. Uh, they, they believe in why they need to make these changes to the environment. So uh, before we did this, we would get a lot of pushback from our infrastructure folks. It, we're adding work to their, to their workload. Now we're talking about, hey, this is an actual threat to your environment. This is a, there's a, it's not just a regulatory piece or audit. This is an actual threat actor that is known to target this area and we're putting in controls to, to stop that. That tells a much better story for them. It gives them much more excitement and, and reason to, to act and act quickly. Uh, it seems like one of your, there we go. It seems like one of your successes was um, filtering according to industry. Um, I was wondering if you think maybe that's something the community can add to Navigator um, where just like we can break it down into threat actors, maybe we could all help gather intel and break it into industries um, to help others get past that learning curve, maybe. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let Miter take that one on for, yeah. for action. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, I mean, it, you know, obviously one of the biggest concerns by doing this is, you know, there are 266 now techniques. 
what about those other, I can't do public math, but 266 minus 91 is a lot. What are we doing with all of those techniques? And so what we don't want to do necessarily is make sure that we're forgetting about those other ones. And, and that's kind of the sequel to, to some of the stuff we're doing is we're going back and we're going through some of those other techniques. So I wouldn't necessarily, I'd, I'd be a little hesitant because of the, uh, by, uh, you know, it gave us a start, but we still need to go through some of the other techniques into my MC privilege as the attack team and say it's really tough because sometimes in the open source reports we do from the attack team side, those industries aren't always identified. So um, you're going to be hearing from my colleague John Wonder who's going to talk about an exciting effort called the Tax Sightings, where hopefully we can get some of that industry data to do something along the lines of what you asked about. All right, so we're at time. Thank you, Andy and David, Thank for a great much. talk. So the, uh, the debate over spreadsheets is heating up online. I'm glad David is on uh, Team Katie here with I Like Spreadsheets, but we have some spreadsheet haters. So um, I need to chat with you during the breaks at lunch, and we'll, we'll convert you all. And uh, shout out to them for a great talk on prioritizing Intel, such a valuable topic, and a great project name, Project Squishy. I don't think anyone's ever used that one. That was, that was new for me. Now my pleasure to introduce our next presenters, uh, Philip Langlois and Joshua Franklin, who are coming at this from more of a controls perspective. I also love that they're across two different organizations. Great to bring those two different perspectives together. Um, so, you know, Threat Intel, it plays a big role in how we understand why defenses are needed. But it's sometimes tough. How does that Threat Intel fit in with the controls? And so we hope that... Uh, Philip and Joshua will give us some insights into that topic. So G please join me in welcoming Philip and Joshua. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So um, I am formerly from CIS. Josh is from current CIS. Yep. And when choosing a presentation, um, don't include your previous employer in the title when you're presenting. Um, but I want to be, obviously give a big thanks to Verizon CIS for letting me do this presentation. This is something I worked pretty extensively while my time at CIS. Um, so this is probably less of a presentation, more of a journey. So let's go together. Oh, sounds so uh, philosophical, man. Yeah, so my name is Joshua Franklin. I am the product owner of the CIS controls. Uh, I, I did 10 years in the federal government, most of it at NIST. If you have your favorite NIST standard, I probably wrote that. If you have your least favorite, I didn't write that one. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. I did a lot of telecom work, also worked on uh, mobile uh, attack. So that one's super important. And my voice is so low that I'm causing this rumbling. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I'm a cybersecurity standards guy. All right, and as mentioned, um, I'm currently a Verizon DBIR co-author, which is weird because I haven't authored anything because I started in September. <laughs> but I'm going to keep writing that as long as I can. I was previously at CIS. Uh, I was the product owner for the controls. Um, and I also did a lot in terms of doing assessments for helping organizations kind of understand their security posture. Um, and if paper bag is wet, I can maybe code myself out of it. So while working at CIS, one of the kind of persistent problems that we've seen is what we like to call the defender's dilemma. So I don't know who here does threat intelligence as kind of like their primary job function. All right, who's here is kind of threat, you know, threat intelligence, defender, everything else? Yeah, right. So, as a defender, a lot of complexity to the problem. The biggest problem is really, how do I know what the right thing to do is? Right? There's a million different options. NIST 853 provides close to a million-ish. Yeah, right. There's a lot of different <laughs> options, and there's a lot of different possibilities, and a lot of different things you can do. The next part of the problem is, how do I actually do it? Right? How do I convert this into something that's actionable, something I can actually do in my environment? And then how do I demonstrate to others I've done the right thing? Because right? you may figure it out for yourself, but you have internal stakeholders that need to have confidence in you. And you also have external stakeholders that need to have confidence in you. So that's really kind of what CIS is really surrounded and kind of focused on, is addressing these type of questions. So yeah, who is CIS? You know, we are a nonprofit based out of Albany. Uh, New, New York. Uh, basically, uh, you know, we have both an operations side and a, you know, best practices slash policy side. Um, yeah, next, next slide here. Um, a lot of folks know us because operationally we actually run the MSISAC or multi-state information sharing and analysis center. Basically have a whole bunch of sensors in a, a lot of the state and local government networks uh, that we, you know, basically let them know if they've been popped, right? 
Um, next slide. Uh, on the you know, operations uh, security best practices side, we have both the benchmarks and the CIS controls. In terms of benchmarks, basically pick your favorite tech, and we probably have some sort of cybersecurity, you know, super hyper detailed guidance for how to configure it. I like to say uh, they're sort of like you know stigs, but they don't break stuff as as much. Um, this isn't going out anywhere, right? Anyway, um, and then the uh, CIS controls. Uh, that's where you know, like uh, Phil used to work, and I currently work. Cool. So the actual CIS controls came from uh, you know NSA, the whole you know you know DoD side of things, uh, and most folks here probably actually know the CIS controls better as the SANS Top 20. I actually said the SANS Top 20 in my interview at CIS for this position, not the best thing to do. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, nowadays the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, they are referred to as the CIS controls. Um, so, as you can uh, expect, there are 20 of them. Here's what they look like. Uh, this isn't really a master class uh, in the top 20. Uh, some of the you know, larger things I'll sort of point out here is with most controls frameworks, there's basically, you know, identify what's, uh, you know, in your network first. Uh, you know, what's on the left is, you know, some of the more basic things, and then it gets, uh, you know, typically more and more difficult uh, all the way to the right. Uh, on the you know, furthest right side there, you actually have the organizational controls, which are a little more squishy to like, you know, harken back to the last presentation. Um, we have the implementation groups, which is our new jam, uh, basically taking all of the 171 CIS subcontrols and splitting them into basically, you know, low, medium, and hard. Uh, we are basically preaching that everyone, uh, at the very least, should be implementing, you know, IG1, implementation group one. That's what we are defining as basic cyber hygiene. A, a lot of folks use that word, uh, and they all mean different things. So this is what we think, you know, basic cyber hygiene means. So in terms of like, you know, creating best practices, there's really kind of a spectrum, right? Right now, we are still in the early phases of developing best practices as a community, right? The CS controls is community built, has a lot of really smart people that work behind it. Um, we like to call them the five schmucks in a room. Right, that's where it starts, is where you bring smart people together in your team, and you say, what do I need to be doing? Right? How do we get started? And as we grow as an industry, we have to start looking at how can we find data to support our position? Right? How do we know what are the actual shifts and you know, changes in the trends in terms of ad what adversaries are doing? Um, and this is kind of a bit of a complex problem, especially you know, as we, we scale, we still bring in our biases. Right? We still have your inherent biases in terms of what's going on, um, but that's not necessarily what the data is going to be showing. So what we want to do is move us towards a data-driven model for controls. Um, and that's where we want to go and start looking actually at testing, right? Creating hypothesis. Does this recommendation actually prevent what we're claiming it prevents? So that what kind of brought us to our pre-attack. So we've taken a couple stabs at this initiative, right? Let's start looking at how can we really get a good understanding for what's happening for adversaries? The first one we created was released in 2016. Um, it utilized a kill chain of a cyber notion um, and also the NIST cybersecurity framework. It was really about helping organizations kind of understand those trade-offs, right? What's the right thing to do and how much do I need to do it? And as a community, we can also do this together, right? We don't have to figure it out on our own we can actually collaborate on an initiative. So especially because not every organization has access to you know, the brain power in this room. Right? We're very fortunate. We're very specialized people. At the end of the day, that's not the access most organizations have. So we're trying to look at this from an industry perspective. How can we benefit everyone? So if we can start understanding what the general trends are, maybe we can start helping organizations make those decisions without having to have you know, large staff. So this is what it looks like, our version one. Um, as you can tell, it's got a kill chain-like style um, phase in the very top. And then you have the NIST cybersecurity security functions, right? So that a control really will do 
one of five things. It's going to help you detect, protect, respond, recover, um, and identify. And this is what obviously was our first cut. It was kind of an ongoing process. And from there, we identified what do the controls do at different steps in the process, right? So that if maybe you can't implement application whitelisting, there might be an alternative control that can help either in front of the process or later on in the process. So it's all about making these educated decisions in terms of what the overall um, control selection is. However, there's limitations to that, and that is not every attack will follow that pattern. So when I joined the team, so let's look at literature, right? What's everyone writing about? What are they saying in terms of the trends? Because there's really great resources, some from Verizon, obviously, um, and other fire. So there's a lot of resources out there. So how can we go and make sense of this? All right, so for six months, I went through every single report, right, and codified every single finding. Super fun? Super fun. Super fun. Oh, yeah, it was super fun. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it takes a large amount of resources, right? But that's ultimately how you can really leverage these things. But it's not really scalable, right? Reviewing these very time consuming. Um, some of these reports tend to be a little bit marketing focused, which is fine, right? This is a marketing tool. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to get an understanding of the underlying data, right? Every organization has a different view of the same problem, right? So how do we actually go and kind of make sense of all these different views? And then how can we really leverage them? So thankfully, attack came along, right? And uh, helped us kind of get a better understanding as to what's going on. So we can start looking at this and look at attack as kind of a standard language for what adversaries are doing. All right? It's been evolving over time. Right? Mitigations where I think we're actually a very big improvement in that evolution. Because right? now we can start looking at very tangible objects within the framework. It's not this thing that we have to pull out from the text. We can start looking at it. And we can start tying it back to the controls, which will help us at least understand what's the relationship between mitigations and the controls we recommend to MITRE. And then this is obviously a giant eye chart, um, but this is just to prove that we did it. Right? We'll be releasing this publicly probably in the next couple few weeks. Months. Couple no. months. A no. <laughs> few weeks. Tomorrow. Totally talked about ask that Josh. Yeah. He'll give it to you in a pen drive. Um, but the idea is we can tie back you know, our content. Right? We can start looking at, we've said prioritization matters, and this is you know, the first six controls. Right, as it ties back to the mitigations, and as those mitigations tie back to the techniques. However, there's still limitations to this. Right? It doesn't really tell us where to start. We're assuming that our prioritization scheme is correct. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So what we want to do is a second version of the community attack model. And you tell me I'm supposed to transition it over. It's next I mean, slide. Yeah. We'll roll with it. Yeah, man. So we're, we're reamping the community attack model. We want it to be really founded in MITRE, right? Because it provides a standardized language. We can all tie into it. There's a whole conference about it. I felt like it was a good way to sneak in here and talk about this, was to tie <laughs> into attack. Um, but it also helps us really kind of talk the same language, right? So what we've done is, oh, OK. Timer. Timer is finally up to date. Cool. It's like the longest mint in the world. Um, so <laughs> it's, what the community attack model is going to be is going to be an understanding of what are the most common things happening, what are the techniques that are involved with those common occurrences, and what are the controls. So as we're moving and progressing, you know, the status controls is an evolving thing. Right? We're on version 7 right now. Josh is tomorrow writing version 8 after he updates and publishes the, the mappings. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but next year he'll be working on the next iteration. Ooh, okay. So, how can we start using the data and our understanding of what's happening in the industry to inform us? Part of that, we obviously have to tie our contents together, um, which we've done. So, we have a, a mapping of the controls to the techniques and the controls to the mitigations. The ne next thing we really want to do is start looking at the data, right? What are the techniques that are most commonly used? And fortunately, Actually, that's the next one. So there's different ways in which we can look at prioritization. Um, so obviously, I want to be an artist. Uh, but this is an interesting way we can start looking at the MITRE data. It, it, I think it warrants a little bit more insight than I have done. Um, but if you can look at MITRE attack as a graph, 
there's a lot of really neat things you can start looking at. So what are the most commonly used techniques? But the thing is there's also issues with this approach. It's limiting, right? There's a very, very much a focus on APT, right? Because each citation largely tends to be different APT groups or different tools. That's not what's hurting most people, right? So there's very much a, a focus in terms of that. Um, but it's a starting point. Um, I actually have the data in graph format. If anyone's ever interested, um, talk to me. I'll, I'll post it on Twitter or whatever um, and get it out there. Yeah, so as we said, data is very important. Uh, and so uh, you know, through the MSISAC, our you know, operational arm, uh, we have lots and lots of data with basically sensors in a lot of the state and local counties. Um, and we're basically able to you know, leverage that data to see if the, you know, if the controls that we're recommending make a lot of sense. Um, and so here are the, uh, you know, this is the top 10 malware that the MSISAC is reporting. Um, and uh, this, you know, this information basically gets posted on our blog every once in a, and a while. Um, but we could, you know, say maybe we want the CIS controls to actually mitigate these top ten pieces of malware. And if we want that, how do we really check that out? Um, so if you sort of overlay all of the, uh, you, you know, at least six of these uh, of these uh, attack matrices over one another, we uh, you know basically want to make sure that we have a control that basically mitigates each of these techniques. Um, and so that's something that we're you know really going to be uh, you know thinking is one of the most important outputs for the uh, community uh, uh, attack model. Um, and uh, you know we, we have. 20 controls, but, but we actually have 171 subcontrols. A lot of these subcontrols have just kind of, you know, made their way into the CIS controls over time, and sometimes it sort of feels like, you know, technomancy, just a mixture of, you know, magic and tech. It's, uh, you know, they're just there because some smart person a long time ago said that. It should, you know, it should really be there. So we, we basically want to figure out which uh, attack paths we want the CIS controls to mitigate uh, against. And it's, you know, more than just the top 10 malware, right? There's, you know, you know, phishing, but also accidental incidents, those sorts of things. And so we're basically going to be, uh, you know, defining uh, the top X uh, attack paths uh, inside of the community uh, attack model that the CIS controls are going to defend against. Yeah, and the concept of the attack paths is really looking at the sequence of events, right? I think we have a tendency of looking at, you know, some of these things as individual moments. Um, but there's really a series, right? There's a sequence of things that occurs. And part of that, there's also preconditions for those things to occur. So as we're starting to look through, you know, understanding, okay, this technique requires administrative privileges, right? It requires system level access or requires such and such. Well, what's the thing that happened prior to that for them to get that level of access? Um, so if we start understanding what's the sequence, because we can't defend against all the techniques, right? But there's probably a handful of techniques that are more commonly used and used because they're effectively um, but we don't know that, right? And I think as, as a community, that's what we want to move towards is really understanding what are the most common techniques, what should everyone really be defending against. Yeah. And that's what the controls kind of would be looking to do as part of the community attack model. Yeah, so um, we are basically you know, going to be embarking on this whole journey of figuring out uh, you know, what these top uh, attack paths are. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of different ways that we can be doing this. Uh, you know, what were the largest breaches ever? Um, maybe it was based on the, you know, criticality of the, you know, assets that were uh, affected. Um, did these breaches cost a whole bunch of money? Um, did Brian Krebs, you know, blog about it way too much? Right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of different criteria that we can use for basically inclusion uh, of these uh, attack paths. 
um, to sort of take a small bite of that, um, since Phil's here, uh, there's a really nice Verizon report out there that basically says 20%, sorry, 28%, I can number, uh, of all breaches can be uh, attributed to malware. Um, about 30% of those breaches can be uh, attributed to ransomware. So let's take a quick look at this and see um, you know, how we would use a, a, a tech here. Well, here's WannaCry, right? Um, and so uh, it does a whole bunch of different things, but what's the, you know, what's the really important thing that actually makes it ransomware, right? And we can see uh, you know, you know, data in, in encrypted for impact, highlighted in the top right, and then inhibit system recovery in the bottom right. Next slide. Uh, for the not, you know, for the not Petya, uh, we just see the actual data encrypted. And so, uh, you know, at the very least, we want to make sure that we have a CIS control that basically mitigates that, uh, and we have some sort of, you know, uh, authoritative data source that's, you know, justifying that subcontrol's existence. I would like to point out that there is ransomware on mobile. Um, and uh, they have an encrypt files impact uh, there, um, but uh, the same type thing is not inside of mobile uh, attack. I'm just drawing y'all's eyes to the fact that mobile uh, attack is out there, okay? Folks, don't forget, okay? It's really important, okay. Um, next slide. Cool, so, um, you know, we've already seen some of the uh, attack patterns that we're really interested in here. Um, so MITRE has two mitigations, uh, uh, you know, uh, associated to the data encrypted for impact technique. Um, we have five subcontrols uh, that could potentially help out here, um, but uh, specifically only 10.1 and 10.5 actually mitigate this individual uh, attack pattern. Um, so the the big question here next is. Do we need subcontrols two, three, and four? Um, and it's worth taking a step back and you know, you know, going through this big exercise. Um, and we're basically going to be using a uh, tack to really do that. <laughs> so this is what you know we try to do in terms of CIS is find a way to bridge our operations and policy, right? And do it at scale. Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that our recommendations, you know, the CIS controls or benchmarks can tie back to something that's consistent. So this is kind of our, our pipe dream, is having a community attack model, obviously powered um, by attack, be that translation point, right, where the SOC and incident response can either codify or tie their data and tell us how trends are changing in these patterns, right? There's a finite number of patterns. There isn't gonna be 266 patterns. There's probably only gonna be a handful of them. Uh, we don't know that yet, because we're still in this very early phases, um, but that, I think that's what we need to move towards, right? Is really understanding what are the things that are most in common and how can we start as a community, address them together. Um, so yeah, next steps, Josh. Yeah, I mean, so we are you know, going to be de de developing the CIS community uh, attack model. Um, we are looking to basically get it out sometime later this year or early next year. Um, I don't think Phil knew that. That's not his fault. Um, we are looking for folks to contribute. And so if you have data, if you have a, a lot of, uh, you, know, you know, knowledge and specialization in this, like in this area, if you just like to talk loudly, um, we want f folks to basically chip in. Uh, and uh, you know, this is a community-driven standard. Um, yeah, so reach out to us at controlsinfo at cisecurity.org. Or Workbench, which is where we do all our community activities. I'll, I'll get you hooked up into, into Workbench, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's it, and it looks like we have a, a few, few little green seconds here for... Uh, we had 45 minutes worth of content that we got into... 30? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's awesome, it's awesome, yeah, yeah, all right, cool. All right, so questions? You guys are so loud. So thinking about so so often these communities of like people who do the day-to-day -day threat defense and threat intel and network defense are often separate from the controls folks. What have you seen there? What can you comment on and how do you think the rest of us can help you all bridge those 
I mean, that's why I wanted to have you here, but anything you can comment on for that? That's a really good point. Um, uh, they are definitely two separate communities. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, events like this that basically brings, you know, you know both halves to, to together. Um, I would say uh, in the actual best practices and, you know, you know, standard side, we need this community's help to basically make sure that everyone is, uh, you know, able to leverage these, you know, free, large, open, uh, you know, con trolls frameworks. Um, it really, uh, you know, things won't get better unless we all pitch in. Right? Yeah, and, and to build off what Josh is saying, you know, the, the problem is complex. Cybersecurity is complex, otherwise we wouldn't have jobs. Um, it touches a lot of different fields as well, right? The more we can speak a standardized language, the better it is. However, you talk to legal, or you talk to risk, and you start talking about individual techniques, that's not always going to translate. But I think if we start looking at an abstraction, we start talking about patterns, and I think a lot of different speakers nationwide did a phenomenal job about kind of doing that extraction. You know, what are the things we're actually concerned about? That's what's key. And I think as a community, we can come together and really figure out, you know, what are the things that we can extract out? So from a threat intelligence, you know, obviously tracking APTs is a big part of your job. Um, however, that's not the only thing that's impacting people. I think if we can start looking at the different languages and start looking kind of with standardized, we'll be in a much better position. Yes, sir. Oh, they're coming. Oh, boom, mic. Okay, there we go. I just wanted to know, um, maybe just real quick, because I know you're running out of time, a little more about how you decide um, where things fall on those implementation levels. Um, that was the only part that I was a little lost on. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole other talk, right? Um, so yeah, th the implementation groups were a big thing that uh, you know, CIS rolled out in, in April. Uh, basically took about a, a uh, year. Um, there was, uh, the, you know, there were literally hundreds of people in the community um, that basically, um, it, it was a standards development act Activity, right? It was a bunch of folks kind of arguing about which, you know, you know, what makes the most sense. I see this a lot. I see this a lot. But that's definitely, um, you know, sometimes, you know, vulnerable to the, you know, loudest voice in the in the room threat, right? Um, and so that's one of the the uh, big hopes that we're going to get out of this is that we will basically, you know, be able to reassess if we have the right subcontrols in the, you know, super super basic group. You know, you know, the one that's sort of meant for like smaller businesses and small organizations. Um, yeah, and uh, it's uh, it's going to be a big effort. Yeah. Yeah. So part of the implementation groups is we set a criteria. Uh, we basically said, okay, what were the resources we expect an organization to have, um, just in terms of IT and then specialized in cybersecurity, and then what is the potential impact, right? So if someone is responsible for a critical piece of infrastructure, you know, getting away with the bare minimum isn't going to be necessarily good enough. Yeah. So we took that into consideration. Um, so far, we've gotten really good feedback on it. Yes, sir. I'll let you wait for the mic. Oh dear. Your voice is low too. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll ask it quickly. The question I have was, are there controls that we have in place today that are doing such a great job, the tactics and techniques aren't even showing up in the attack framework? So, so I had another slide um, <laughs> that looked at some of the different controls. Um, and application whitelisting is one of these that comes up very, very frequently as yeah. being very effective. Um, however, it's also very hard to do, right? It takes a lot of resources to do, um, but it's, it's one that, that ties back. If you just look at the mitigations, it ties back to a lot of the mitigations. I don't have the exact number, um, but I also have something on my GitHub that has that broken down in terms of administrative privileges, um, general configuration, and then application whitelisting. But there are also a lot of subcontrols that don't have a direct cor correlation, right? Stuff like, um, you know, uh, stuff like accidental errors, fires, floods, acts of God, aliens, those sorts of things. <laughs> you know, Will Smith, yeah, yeah, all that. <laughs> That's a great note to end on, huh? Will Smith. <laughs> Thank you so much, Philip and Joshua. Thank you. 
And so we have a little more to come on the controls topic. Um, make sure you too catch my teammate Mike Long has been looking into this from an attack perspective, how we can do that to bring together these two communities. Starting to see some themes here. You know, I loved how they talked about this data-driven approach to hedge against biases. Anytime someone mentions biases, uh, I get pretty excited. It's a great topic for threat intel and for this, for this conference. So moving on to our next speaker, Tony Lambert from Red Canary. A lot of things I love about this talk. One of them, uh, as those of you who know Attack pretty well notice, we're pretty strong on Windows. Maybe not so much on Linux. So Tony is one of the people who is actively looking at Linux threats in this community. Um, another theme of his talk, alertable. What is alertable? And something we often hear from our, our team, you know, we started using Attack and I'm drowning in alerts. So Tony's going to walk us through some tips there. Also wanted to thank Tony for contributing to the Cyber Analytics Repository. Ivan's going to talk about that later, but um, really appreciate all the work you're doing. I, so I really hope that we can get Linux stuff into the Cyber Analytics Repository too. I hope so yeah. too. <laughs> With that, please join me in welcoming Tony Lambert. Thank you. See you. All right. So this talk kind of started off with a nebulous sort of cloudy mission from one of the managers of Red Canary, Joe Moles. Uh, if you've ever met Joel, Joe, he has uh, this propensity to talk with his hands waving all the time. When he talks at a full tilt, he looks like a windmill. And when he, when he talked to us, he said, hey, we have a lot of people asking about Linux coverage. We want to expand things. We want to make things better. And as we did more research, we started looking at you know, what public research existed, and there's not a whole lot of public research, except for like a few very notable instances where people talk about their data server Linux systems being breached. Everybody and their brother has an IoT device that's been breached, however. And you know, we can kind of glean some things from that. So we really dove into figuring out some of the payloads that bad guys use, some of the tools that are used, and how to do process monitoring around this. So. A little bit about me. My name's Tony. I work at Red Canary. Uh, most of my day job is finding out what bad guys use, how they use it, and how to detect it. Recovering systems admin, I used to work in the higher ed and state government sort of area, so it was interesting. And it's an entirely different environment than Red Canary is, and I love the change. I used to teach on the side, and I still love to teach. That's why I'm here doing this. This is also kind of why I'm attracted to threat intelligence, because when you start looking at intelligence, it's lifelong education just by another name. When you really think about it, it's like when we have intelligence-driven security, it just means we're educating ourselves before we defend. So I wanted to start off talking a little bit about what an actual alertable technique is. We deal a lot with alerts in various parts of our lives. Alerts aren't necessarily just something that happens with security products. They happen with your smoke detector at home. They happen in all sorts of areas of your life. You may have a car alarm, something like that. And I want to kind of show what the difference is between an alert from your security product and alert in your daily life and how we can kind of draw some of that context from the daily life that lets you immediately know something is wrong and put it in your security products. Figure out how to make your alerts not suck. We want to cover a little bit of decision criteria. How do you make a good alert? You know, what, if you want to go at it from a systematic, repeatable process, how can you kind of grade some of these things? There's no matrices involved with this. There's no spreadsheets, so it's significantly less structured than some of the previous talks. But we're going to talk a little bit about it anecdotally. And we're going to cover some actual hard, fast, to the weeds, like analytics that we have actually implemented in our organization that have been relatively high fidelity for us. Some that, some that haven't, and some that absolutely sucked when we tried them out. Um, hopefully, this is going to help you a little bit. This is stuff that's been derived from adversary payloads, raw data. It's something that's not necessarily from a synthesized report. This is stuff that is seen in the wild. To start off, we have to define what an alert is. At its core, an alert is going to be some sort of notification that an abnormal condition has occurred in the environment. If you have a car alarm, it means somebody's breaking in. If you have a smoke detector, this means there's smoke somewhere in the house. Something is going on that you don't want to go on, and you need to fix it really quickly. Um, the idea behind an alert, though, is for you to understand what's going on and act, you have to have some greater context. 
You have to know why the alert has fired. You have to know what condition that alert is telling you about. And you need to know how to act afterwards. So for example, with a smoke detector, the context for this, for this you know, alert, there is smoke in your bedroom. You need to get out fast. If you had security products that gave you that kind of immediacy, that kind of context, and you know, we've all had those smoke detectors that go off and there's no smoke, you know, stuff like that, you know, false positives, but the more you can kind of provide that context in, the happier your analysts are going to be. With anything, your alerts require care and feeding. We, we try to look at alerts as kind of a diagnostic process of something that is going wrong in your environment. When you go to the doctor, you know, some of you, your care requires some care and feeding. You know, you may have an individualized care plan for you. This is going to be the same thing with your alerting. This is going to be the same thing with your security program. Any security program that you implement is going to be a little bit different from your friends. The best security program is one you can stick to. It's like an exercise plan. So as long as you can keep with it, as long as you can keep tuning, you're going to get better at this. What does the alert workflow look like? Most of the time, we have a condition has occurred, and the alert will fire soon afterwards. Just because the condition has occurred doesn't necessarily guarantee the alert will fire. This is a really good thing to focus on when you look at sensor placement. You know, if a fire happens in a house and there's no smoke detector, there's no alert. It's the same thing in your network or on your endpoints. If, you know, an activity happens on an endpoint or across a network and there's no sensor, you won't get an alert. So to move on down the workflow, we have to have a sensor. Somewhere between two and three, you know, if the alert fires, defender investigates, your analyst comes in for the day, they check their email and outlook, they grab their coffee, and then finally they dial in and they start looking at their high priority alerts in a sim. And eventually, the alert has to go somewhere. There's an escalate or there's a hide. Um, your escalation may be to a threat intelligence team. Your escalation may be to an instant response team. That alert has to go somewhere or else it's dropped in a bottomless hole. If you want to hide things, you have to you know, document false positives. And every time you have a hide, you should learn something new about your organization. We talk a lot about threat hunting, that there's no such thing as an unsuccessful hunt. Because every time you hunt, you learn something new and you should have documentation. The same thing should be true with your alerts. Every time you have an un, a false positive alert, it doesn't mean that it was an unsuccessful alert, it just means you know something new. There are some problems with alerts. And I, I actually, I have to say, my wife helped me proofread my slides and she's a wonderful person and she panicked when she saw this picture because she, uh, she's not used to having more than like 10 unread emails in her inbox at a time. If you buy a security product, most of the time if you leave it at its defaults, there's a lot of context missing. When you buy something from security vendor X, vendor X has no idea what's going on in your environment. You may have a special snowflake product that is only in the auto industry. You may have something in the Department of Energy that has never seen the light of day anywhere else. So that may cause tons and tons of false positives. Vendors will err on high volume by default because they don't want you to miss something. They just tell you everything. For you to make things better, you have to give a little bit of context. You have to show analysts why it's important, what to do afterwards, and provide guidance for this escalation process. So as we set down the path of trying to make alerts better, we have to take some time to you know, do a systematic process of what actually makes an alert better. What do we qualify as a good alert? Theoretically, we want an alert to take very little time to investigate. We want that alert to have enough context that that analyst can come up, have that alert right in front of their face. They can say, all right, thing number one, thing number two, thing number three has happened. We don't have to do a lot of investigation. We can just follow back to the origin and then mark up all this information, give it to our incident responders, and they can go towards remediation. The quicker they can do that investigation process, the better the alert is going to be. You can go on to more alerts afterwards or, you know, Take a break afterwards. We want alerts to be you know, fairly significant in terms of abnormality. We don't want an alert that says, hey, somebody has logged off of a Windows computer somewhere at like five o'clock. That's an alert. It's not a significant alert. It's what the less significant alert do is it trains your personnel to ignore alerts. That's not something that you want to do. 
how would you feel every time you, know, you cook dinner and your smoke detector goes off? Sooner or later, you're going to learn to ignore the smoke detector and there's a real fire in the house. It's the same thing with security alerts. We want to have a, slow time, or a low time to respond for any sort of alerts. We want things to you know, be quick to investigate and quick to remediate. The more information you can have in this alert to lead your incident response, to inform your remediation, the better it's going to be, the happier your IR team is going to be, the happier your analysts are going to be. Everybody's just happy. It's a win all around. So we wanted to take a look at some alerts for the Linux side that don't suck. They've worked really well for us. Um, tell you about the ones that didn't work well on towards the end. All of these have been, like I said, derived from real life adversary tools. Um, my wife has been actually kind of entertained by me snake handling payloads at home, like figuring out what bad guys use and looking at the malware. So it's been an interesting experience with this. The first one I wanted to touch is time stomping. If you're not familiar with time stomping, this is going to be a practice of you know, changing timestamps on a system to hide adversary activity. This happens in opportunistic attacks. This happens in targeted attacks. Anywhere that a bad guy can drop a file, they're going to want to try to shield that it's there or slow defenders down in forensic analysis. Most commonly in you know, some of these opportunistic scripts, we see the touch command, if you're not familiar with the Linux side, touch will be used to modify timestamps or create empty files most of the time. We'll see touch with the ACMR command line flags. What this does is it's a change access time, creation time, modification time, and we're using a reference file. We're taking the timestamps from one file and planting it over on another. We have to think of you know, what's, what's the bad guy's intent with this. They want to make whatever file they're time stomping look like it was there at the time of installation alongside bin sh. Most of the time when we see timestamps being modified, this is going to be something from an installation, something from normal system management. Most of the time with normal system management, you're not going to see all of the timestamps being modified at the same time, and you're probably not going to see all the timestamps modified at the same time from timestamps of a file that has already been originally installed on the system. This is going to be something that is really suspicious right off the bat. It gives your analysts a, some quick investigation time. They can look for what issued this command, they can look for the origin of the file that's being timestamped. They immediately have two investigative leads that they can run to ground. And you've also informed your IR team, we definitely know that this file is probably going to be evil, we're going to have to get rid of it, and you know, they get a head start on things. The next one is diving a little bit into process injection. This is notoriously kind of weird on the Windows side, it's still just as weird on the Linux side. Um, some of the techniques are a little bit odd to spot, like ptrace, some of those. For the one we're covering here, we're going to cover process injection using LD preload. If you haven't floated around Unix circles for a while, LD preload was this wonderful functionality from the glibc library that lets you specify a shared object library, the, the Linux equivalent of a DLL, and inject that DLL into any process that is running for a particular user context. So let's imagine that you have an SSH process. You want your adversary's library that steals credentials to load into this process. You want you to have, you know, you want PS to not return back malicious processes whenever you get started you know, investigating things. You can preload a malicious library into these processes to manipulate output, steal credentials, do something else. So most of the time, this happens on the user side, but it can happen at the system level. If you have tools in your environment that lets you audit command line flags, or that especially at the um, uh, environment variable level, this is going to be really awesome if you can look for LD preload in your specified environment variables. There are very few times that you're probably going to be using this in your environment. The only time that I've seen in our data set where it's being used legitimately is for folks that are using very specific monitoring software. Uh, and if you're using that monitoring software, you're probably going to know. Your systems admins are going to know. This is going to be a documented exception. The thing that is much less common is going to be modification of this LDSO preload file. This lets you define preloads for the entire system that you know, the root user can ex uh, will execute a process and it will preload in. 
you know, your Apache, pro your Apache user may specify a process and that preload comes in. You end up defining something that gets preloaded for the entire system. The really cool thing about this is it's really quick to respond to. You can delete the LDSO preload file without harming the rest of your system. Most of the time, if you have one of those monitoring solutions, you may not want to do that. You can typically unset, undefine your environment variable, and it'll help you know, clean this up very quickly. And you can go and, and you go and tackle whatever library has been specified inside that variable. It's very quick to respond to. The really cool thing, this is used by rootkits. This is used by like user space rootkits to hide activity all the time, hide network connections, hide process activity. By doing just a little bit of quick deletion, unset environment variables, you can undo the functionality of a rootkit that may be hiding processes and go after the real threat on your system. And the final one for the, you know, the, the ones that don't suck, I want to talk a little bit about masquerading. Masquerading, we talk a lot, of more, a lot more about on the Windows side because every process likes to hide as SVC host. On the Linux side, we see some of the same things. If you dissect some of the um, opportunistic crypto mining resource hijacking scripts from the past, you'll see a lot of process names that look like KWorker DS, KThread DS, KThrottle, KAudit, things like this. These are intended to confuse defenders and make them think that they're looking at a kernel thread. When you're looking at a Linux system, when you do PS and look for all the processes, chances are you've seen some weird looking processes that start with K and have brackets around them. And those are processes that are correspond with kernel threads. They don't have you know, binary images that back them on disk. They don't have a path. They don't have a valid MD5 hash, things like that. So whenever you do see a process named KWorker, whenever you do see one that's named after a kernel thread or has the name of a kernel thread inside it, and it's you know, represented in something that has a path, especially temporary directory, this is going to be something that is immediately suspicious, immediately should you know, fire an alert and investigate for your crew. This is going to be quick to investigate. You just find what has dropped that file. You find, you know, if you have the right tooling, you can go back and figure out what processes executed around that time, what files were dropped around that time, and run it to ground from there. You may have noticed a trend so far. The uh, which tactic have all of these analytics fallen into? Yeah, I heard evasion. All right. So defense evasion. We've typically seen with various public research and payloads that attackers will follow kind of a specific methodology. They'll compromise a web app, they'll compromise a database, something that is a public facing application, use curl or wget to pull down a payload and then execute that payload immediately afterwards. In Windows land, we call this living off the land because they're using built in tools to the operating system to download and operate their exploits. With any sort of living off the land opportunity for an adversary, we have to assume that their capabilities are the same as your system's admins. We have to assume that they're the same as your desktop admins. What is going to be the telling difference here is that we have to figure out what the adversary's intent is. The most, the most functional analytics for us have been the ones that show intent. Masquerading shows really clear intent. There is no reason a kernel thread should be living in a temporary directory. This is definitely going to be evil and we can track it down a lot better. We're going to see this trend continue on. Here are the, the analytics that we can kind of make work. They start off a little bit noisy, but as you tune them in your environment, they're going to get a lot better. Remote file copy, this is going to be where an attacker tries to download and uh, execute their tools. Most of the time, using a curl command going to paste bin is going to be evil. If you have a business case where this is legitimate in your environment, please contact me. I want to know. <laughs> and we can work it out from there. We can find if there's a better way. Um, and typically, so that is probably going to lead to a high fidelity alert. What is less high fidelity is going to be something like curl or wget reaching out to a random IP address to download a Mirai variant or some other tool that is going to infect an IoT system. What you'll have to do is you'll have to figure out what IP addresses, what scopes are usually talked to by your systems, and then start alerting on the things that are outside those scopes. So if you look for wget and an IP address that's outside your scope of management, that's something that can turn into a high fidelity alert depending on your environment. If you manage a large IP space, I'm very sorry. That's going to get rough. 
The next one is going to be remote services for lateral movement. This is an actual example of what I believe Rock or another threat actor that's done opportunistic cryptocurrency resource hijacking, what they do to try to move laterally on a system. If you've ever done key-based authentication and configuration for um, uh, Linux systems or Unix systems, you'll typically see that there's an authorized user's file, an authorized host file, and there's going to be you know, all of your good key stuff that goes with it. What these opportunistic scripts will do is they'll parse that authorized host file and try to contact every host that you've contacted in that authorized file and try to issue a curl command like curl a pastebin.com and the payload and funnel that script into a bash shell or sh shell, something like that. This is going to be a little bit more high fidelity depending on the site that's being used. We found that sometimes, however, this matches up with an application deployment pattern. If you deploy Docker in your environment, if you deploy some cloud stuff in your environment, some installers, you know, depending on how you use them, might match this pattern. You just have to tune those out. And now, this is the hall of shame. Anything discovery is going to suck. And mostly it's because operating system noise. When you log on to a system in Linux and it has the little prompt that says, you're logged in to this host with this username, how do you think that all gets generated? Recon commands. And if you're going to alert on recon commands or any sort of combination of recon commands, it's going to be really rough on you. What works best for us is looking for some sort of cluster of activity where we can say, okay, there's maybe a little bit of recon or a little bit of user recon, a little bit of network recon, a little bit of you know, use, uh, what users are on a system. When it occurs in a cluster like this, chances are you're more likely to find somebody that is enumerating a system looking for privilege exploitation vulnerabilities. It's not going to be something that's alertable on. This is going to be something that you're examining logs or examining a report after the fact. The use of sudo. Uh, it's admin's favorite, helps you make sandwiches, helps you do all the things that admins don't want you to do. Um, this is going to make long investigations with very little return. You're going to have very long rabbit holes that your analysts run down and get nothing out of it because you're going to flag on every time your system's admin is trying to do something on a Linux system. It's going to make the admins mad, going to make the analysts mad, going to make the managers mad, and everybody's just going to have a bad day. If you really have to look at sudo um, alerting in your environment, do it in an audit, do it in a report, something where you know it's not a continuous monitoring effort. I have to make one caveat with this. When I made these slides, I did not account for the edge case vulnerability from a couple of weeks ago with a, a sudo with a negative one username and all that mess. That one's a high fidelity alert. Get, get that one in. But uh, otherwise, it's better for reporting and audits. The final one, I have to include this because we did have somebody ask about it. Um, if you're not familiar with Unix and Linux land, RM and RF means delete all files recursively and force the deletion. Root is obviously the equivalent of C drive from Windows over on the Linux system. And theoretically, this is going to delete everything on the system and it's going to do it very quickly. When somebody approached us with a question about this analytic and says, you know, can you guys detect on this? We said, well, we can write an analytic for it, but it relies on you basically winning a race. And so what about winning this race? And you have to rely on your sensor making it back to the server that this RMRF command has arrived before the RMRF has messed up your sensor. You're not going to win the race 95% of the time, especially, you know, we're in the land of SSDs now and really high-speed Xeon processors. So you're, you're just not going to win it most of the time. If you do win it, again, let me know. I want to see how this comes out. And I would additionally argue that if you ever see this alert, uh, if you ever have this alert and you actually get a hit on it, the bad guys probably didn't get a successful execution because most of the time on modern Linux systems, you also have to include a flag that says no preserve root because you know modern Linux systems said, hey, we need to put some guardrails on this sucker before people start blowing things up. And you know that's one of the good things about it. Most of the time, your help desk is going to know that something has gone wrong with this system 
before you know if somebody has wiped it. It's just, it's just something that happens. Um, and hopefully there'll be evidence for you to figure out what happened when you get there. So, kind of close up, we've got a little bit, five minutes left. Um, alert where you can, where possible. The first ones, you know, alert on as much of those as you can. Um, report and hunt, do cluster analysis where you can otherwise. I wanted to additionally share some resources that I thought were awesome. The most successful organizations we've talked to so far that haven't been using some sort of process monitoring commercial tool have been using some form of OS query, audit D, combinations thereof, trying to figure it out in their environment. If you want to learn about audit D and you want to be able to implement some attack style analytics for audit D, both of these resources are really awesome to do that. Be fuzzy, I'm not sure what your real name is, but thank you, dude. And Florian Roth has a really good Audit D project. Um, both of them have some really high fidelity alerts in there. Some of them won't, or some of the alerts won't be high fidelity. So just use what you can and improve the rest. So I want to open it up. Does anybody have questions? Yes, sir. Raise high. Test stop. <laughs> when you talk about the, uh, I, I call it actionability of, of an alert, like the mm -hmm. amount of context that the data source is providing and stuff like that. How much um, effort are you putting into ensuring that your analysts know, like how much of the context is just the analyst knowledge about these sorts of things. Like a lot of the stuff you went over today is just like, hey, be aware of this. So right. are, you get, are you finding a lot of success just doing that? So what we've tried to do a lot in our organization is really make it possible for our analysts to do just-in-time training where if they run across an alert that they don't know, they can really read up on it really quick to be able to help triage and take action on the alert. So what we have tried to do in our organization is try to make all the details of an alert extremely visible in front of the analyst at the time of investigation. If we have particular use case analytic, we have the description for that use case. We have example cases of where it's been seen it's evil, where it's you know documented false positives, where they can go and read why the alert was generated, things like that, and give further resources where if they want to do some additional ad hoc research. So what's, what's been a key success for us is focusing around some form of just-in-time training to make the as many resources available as at the time of investigation as possible. All right, I think we got one in the front row. We'll get to you in a second, sir. Thanks. Nice, nice talk. Uh, most of the techniques you have presented here are, let's say, limit of the land, copper on Windows. Mm -hmm. Have you seen like uh, prevalent use of uh, more exploitation kind of techniques that maybe are uh, snooping into memory of other processes? So. Or they're just like rare events and they're not, they get fixed right away as opposed mm -hmm. to Windows. Right. So there are some more advanced attacks uh, that are kind of interesting. I know at least one threat actor has started, or a couple of threat actors have started using Go binaries that are platform independent where they'll curl down a Go binary to try to evade some of this process monitoring activity. And I've we kind of take the standpoint that the greatest enemy of EDR solutions, the greatest enemy of process auditing is a random process doing a random thing at a random time. So it's, we've, we've started seeing adversaries do a lot more of that in public research. Um, as for the specific kernel exploitation stuff, um, there have been some documented cases, public cases of that. The hard thing for seeing that in public research is that we see a lot of kernel exploitation stuff in proof of concept phase, but we don't see as many in the actual reporting afterwards of somebody that has figured out it has happened in their environment. So. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Really interesting presentation. One question. To what extent, if any, do you see uh, changing behavior in auto-scaling groups for cloud workloads, for example, affecting the type of alerts that may be relevant? So all of the alerts that I've talked about so far, all of these analytics, 
are assuming the perspective that you have some form of console access to a server that assumes you own the machine and it's not, well, I say own the machine, it assumes that you're the administrator of the machine and not just a consumer of its services. As you start to move towards more cloud, work, uh, cloud workloads where you're a consumer of the server, server resources but you're not an admin of the resources, hunting with these analytics is going to get harder. What becomes more important in that phase is figuring out the right way to consume logs and enrich those logs to make your analysts have the right evidence in the right place at the right time. Well, we're about to go to lunch, so I encourage other questions. Tony, hopefully you're around yeah. today and tomorrow and to talk. answer questions. Please join me in thanking Tony. Thank you. So hopefully, if you're using Linux or not, a lot of great takeaways there on what are alertable techniques, maybe discovery, stay away from that a little. I wanted to call out a couple tweets online. Um, as thanks to all of our speakers, NetBiosX said, I think um, the attack conference is one of the very few cons in the world that almost all the talks are around real world security. Please keep the good work. And some folks watching from uh, their SAN Security 511 boot camp in Amsterdam, they're tuning in during their breaks. Busy day for them in Amsterdam all around the world. So thanks again to Tony for that awesome talk. Um, we're now heading into lunch. I um, encourage you to visit, visit the exhibitors. Thank you to our lunch sponsor, VMRay, for sponsoring that. So chat, network, tweet at us what you're doing, what you're seeing. As a reminder for the online folks, stick around because uh, Jamie is going to be interviewing folks on the Attack on couch, quite a few folks there to talk to. So we'll see you all back here in the room and online at 1.20. Enjoy your lunch. Welcome back to the Attack on Couch. Um, I'm here with Dave Weston and Andy Kittle, who just delivered an excellent speech on using threat intelligence to focus on attack activities. Um, how are you guys liking the conference so far? It's been great. Yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. loving it. We loved your talks. We really appreciate it. And one of the things, I uh, first want to start off by saying thank you for not quitting. I know you had some, uh, <laughs> some struggles yeah. early on, but uh, good to see you persevered and made it through. And here we are. Yeah, now you're talking to the attack community about how successful you are. So Absolutely. congratulations. Um, one of the things you mentioned, though, was you started uh, going through the matrix one at a time. Mm -hmm. And you didn't had a hard time maybe selling that to leadership or getting buy-in. Uh, can you speak a little bit towards identifying when you know that was not the right approach? Yeah, so uh, as we went through each technique, we, we took the red team approach and we're testing it again and again and again. And this is what we'd love to do. Let's go in there and tear it apart and see how it works. Uh, I think what we ran into is we noticed over time is like the detections that we were hoping for weren't coming out as much. And the leadership, was because we had a lot of resources, we had other uh, duties as assigned there in our, in our job, but then we're also segmented off for a period of time throughout the week uh, testing this. And we're like, well, you guys are in there, you're doing a lot of testing, a lot of good work, I'm hearing a lot of good things. What are the results? What's happening here? And, and as the months went by in the project, you start noticing like, hey, this, this approach, we're, we're getting some great mitigations out of it, but it's taking a little bit longer than what we thought. And we realized maybe this is not going to be able to help digest all, you know, 240 techniques. Yeah. yeah. I think Andy brings up a great point that uh, as we were going through this, the, the engineer piece Everybody was excited about it. I mean, it was it, having fun diving into each one of these techniques and, and driving it. But from a leadership perspective, from from what's in it for me, what's in yeah. it for uh, kind of the overall story, we just never 
were able to tell that story. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, this was about a 15 month process. It would, we'd have little uh, uh, spurts where we'd go a little bit further and then it would die off and nobody would pay attention to it for a couple of months. And then we'd go for a couple more months as, as somebody found a new technique that they were mm -hmm. working on. But there was no momentum, yeah. never any momentum until we actually started putting all the pieces together. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, it was, it was at a point where just until you tell, until you convince the leadership to give you the resources and the, and the funding you yeah. need to move forward, it's, it's not really going to go anywhere. And, and we weren't doing that until we put the intelligence piece on there. That makes sense. And like you said, um, that linear one by one approach really kind of lacks like a story. And like, I know you guys have claimed great storytellers, mm -hmm. like, whereas you scope it, with, uh, scope it with that CTI, you're kind of like, at least the analysts, even from the ground up, can see like what the progression is and like, yeah. hey, why are we doing this? Why is this important? Yeah. And you're kind of like Lego is building the giant puzzle that makes more sense. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate that, guys. Um, so one of the interesting things that uh, actually, circling back to that before I uh, move forward, uh, you mentioned communicating results back to leadership. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we on the MITRE side have developed recently or in the last couple of years to help do that is the navigator. Um, mm -hmm. Any other pro tips you guys have on like making sure leadership understands the value of what you're doing and will actually, like you said, devote resources to those efforts? Well, I, I think the navigator is perfect. Yeah. I, I love it in the fact that you can you, you get a picture. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of pictures. So I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. So, uh, you know, when you when you put a picture out there, it tells, tells you exactly what's going on. And I think that during the presentations today, you saw a couple of, uh, of ways to do that. Uh, and, and we talked about that those 91, putting those 91 techniques yeah. all on one page uh, and, and then being able to uh, to be able to tell a story across uh, yeah. across all of those techniques. Mm -hmm. Now, when we now we didn't show it up here because well, lawyers and they, they wouldn't show, <laughs> let us show exactly uh, where our security controls are. But when we showed all 91 security controls, where we were on yeah. each security control, and then we showed where we will be on each of the security yeah. controls once we make those mitigations and detections and actually put them in place, yeah. it, it was just like I mean, it just made everybody's eyes go. We need to go, and we need to go yeah. here. We need to go there, and we need to do it now. And that was really kind mm -hmm. of the really the defining moment for for us was uh, getting the leadership going, not in their head, and going, yeah. "I have to do this." That's awesome. Like you said, that's actually a living document. That's like one of the questions we very often get is how to, you know, where, what to do next, but also how to make sure that you're covering your tracks from previous efforts. So, like right. you said, yeah. that kind of document you can enable even quarterly, quarterly, week to week, and do a side by side and do that type of analysis. That's really and that's something we learned from one project to the next right. that it's our security landscape is, is dynamic. It's a yeah. living environment. Absolutely. So something we would test uh, in earlier iterations, it needs to be tested again and again and again, even over the last several months doing this. So. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, great transition. Um, one of the big things we always preach is attack is not it. Yeah. Like that, that's not the stopping point. That's actually a start for you to mm -hmm. take it in your own environment yeah. and fork it. And that's why you mentioned the 91 tech is something really I appreciate what you guys did is you took attack and you made it your own. Uh, can you give us a little, um, I guess, uh, insight and some lessons learned on that process and how that went? Yeah, I, uh, I will tell you, uh, Andy actually talked during the presentation about uh, how we use MITRE ATT&CK now, uh, and we've created, uh, our threat intelligence team creates what we call the anatomy of an attack documents. And so we'll take a, uh, a significant security event, so the Ryuk uh, ransomware incident from earlier this year. Now, we took that and we broke it down based on all the security research that came in. We broke it down to how did this attack actually happen? Yeah. And then we broke it down by technique. And then we shared that out. This was about a three page, four page document. Then we shared out to a wide audience. Okay. So now our security, uh, now our, our uh, in our security operations center, they can take these and start building out detections. We can tell, we can start having the conversations with our infrastructure folks. We can, mm -hmm. The leadership can see this and start seeing it. And you're all the time, you're talking about attack techniques. Yeah. And that's really been one of the big uh, keys that we've done is that we consistently are using the terminology from attack and that's, that's enabling everybody to start communicating in that language. Uh, the other thing that I think was kind of a neat thing that we did was, uh, so October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And uh, for cybersecurity, for, the, for this month, we actually created a video and it was uh, related to phishing, uh, but it talked through each of the, a lot of the MITRE ATT&CK techniques okay. and how when somebody clicks on a link and then it started walking through each of the techniques that were associated with uh, malware being uh, installed on a, uh, on a device. And then, uh, so it was kind of a neat way yeah. to get MITRE ATT&CK into the hands of 40,000 associates who are now looking at this, this yeah. video well beyond just the IT folks that normally see this stuff. Absolutely, and that aligns with one of our key foundations is like it's not just a security practice, it's a community effort. And like you yeah. said, whether it's procurement, whether it's your C-suite, whether it's the person at the front desk, 
all being on that same, uh, I guess, wavelength and being able to communicate back and back and forth intelligently is really critical. Absolutely. Um, one of the things we actually saw Twitterverse asking about quite a bit was uh, your scoring system. It's actually really innovative. Mm -hmm. I like the what, capability intent. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper into you know what makes something like Fin Seven uh, like stand out so much. Like what. Are there, how do you quantify those two values? And are there other values that would be applicable that you guys maybe um, you know, have between your ears that maybe aren't like completely documented yet? I'll grab this one here. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah what, I mean, quite honestly, it's not scientific. That's yeah. the key piece on this one is that, uh, you know, we had a scoring system, but we're not beholden to exactly, I, I think people get bogged down a lot of times mm -hmm. in saying it, uh, trying to make it this perfect scoring system. And quite honestly, we just guessed. Yeah. We did a lot of guesswork. We, we, uh, did more of as, art yeah a did a lot of research yeah. and and that came up with I feel this one is more mm -hmm. capable than that one yeah. and uh, bottom line is it doesn't have to be perfect yeah. all it has to do is to get you from this big blob of a whole bunchness down to a smaller blob that mm -hmm. I can then work from uh, and that was really the key was not we didn't get bogged down in the minutia of yeah. trying to figure out this perfect scoring system uh, and and you know, it's actually worked pretty well now we we find it uh, refined it uh, over the course of the last year as, as we see more reports coming mm -hmm. in. Hey, you know what? That one isn't as capable as what we thought it was. Or this, this organization doesn't have quite as much intent to target our industry as what we thought originally. So you, you saw in the presentation we had 27 threat actors. And I, quite honestly, I don't even know what the number is right now. But we have a you know, top 10 or 12 yeah. threat actors that we're, we're working on. So there's a lot less now than we had before because we've refined this over the course yeah. of the last year. And, and that's not really necessarily a, a new scoring system or additional yeah. prioritization. It's just more of a better understanding on our part of yeah. of what the threat actor actually does. Yeah. How did you actually generate those uh, quadrants? Those are actually really interesting. Is that a tool you guys have in house, or was it just it's Excel? Okay, yeah. Yeah. It's Excel, yeah. the spreadsheet it's, debate yeah. continues. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah, so I guess you guys are team Excel. It, 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 well, we're in that meeting where we're trying to this the, the, the second phase or second effort of this project. It's like, okay, how do we narrow this down? As soon as uh, they we put it into that spreadsheet and put it into that, it's like there it is. You can tell exactly where you can focus on, and start diving into the techniques in the top quadrant. So yeah, it was really helpful. I hear that Twitter? Where I think I'm hearing. Excel three, uh, not Excel zero. So yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll keep going throughout the day while I try to keep score. Uh, final question I had for you guys was uh, you mentioned uh, one of the big things I heard to take away from your talk was taking from that IT audit uh, culture to mm -hmm. a security focused culture. Um, and I know you guys did a really great job highlighting like that transition, but yeah. how do you guys maintain that? Well, yeah, we still maintain the IT audit culture. That, that is <laughs> that's that's our bread and butter. I mean, that's okay. something we're, we're a highly regulated industry. However, uh, adding the uh, threat actor focus and, and intelligence yeah. focus to that uh, it enhances some of our, because we have a lot of uh, uh, the priorities and demands being placed on the different teams inside organizations. This helps enhance that. It's like, hey, I can now drive some, some positive behaviors on actionable intelligence. Yeah. And that helps uh, put a different lens, because before that might have been like, oh, we have this request, or oh, we'll digest it, we'll put it in. But now it's like, hey, you haven't looked at it from this method. And so now that when they do like secure configurations, they've looked at it from one way. Now we're trying the MITRE approach. Mm -hmm. and, and it, it does, uh, we've seen a lot of effectiveness with that. Okay. It's been, uh, our operational security has greatly improved just by adding this extra uh, vehicle now we can start using, so, so it's good. It's really innovative. And thank you yeah. for your talk and thank you. It was completely a pleasure and an honor to sit down with yeah. you. So oh, it's thank great you. being here. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Jamie. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, so I'm going to transition to my next guest, uh, but in the meantime, definitely wanted to call out some special tweets we saw online. We see you guys in Virginia Beach. I uh, hope the Jack Black impersonations are going great as well as Sands, Am Sands Amsterdam. I uh, hope the great time out there. Um, also, um, personally, Jacob P. Mental, that was an awesome tweet. Really appreciate the meme. I'm gonna actually print that out and put it on my wall. Uh, so one second while we transition to our next uh, speakers. This will be Phil Langlois and Joshua Franklin. Oh, and it, actually, we're gonna take a minute. Uh, TACCON will be back in a couple seconds once these guests are ready. Yeah. yeah, thank you.
Welcome back, and I'm here with Josh and Phil, uh, who just delivered a great talk about controls. Um, so a couple questions Shucks. initially. <laughs> <laughs> really, DBIR is your only authorship. I mean, <laughs> are you calling it quits after one? One for one, obviously. Uh, but, uh, no, I think we're going we're gonna to try for one, and then uh, we'll see where you know, life takes us. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've been fortunate. I joined the team just in September. Yeah. Um, so we're about to ramp up and, uh, and hopefully get another report out next year. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, Josh, the, the pending question everyone's asking is, all the, are the glasses always blue or is it just like, are they always is blue? it a mood ring? It is a mood about? ring. Yeah. yeah. I've got about 10 pairs of glasses. Okay. Some of them are like 3D printed and I, you know, and I bring them places to get them, uh, <laughs> have special lenses put in. Um, my favorite ones look like Stegosaurus with like, you know, giant emoji eyebrows. My wife hates them and says I'm not allowed to wear them at professional events. Feel free to bring them tomorrow. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to steal any of your thunder, but do we have a special pair on deck for Halloween? Um, no, I, I, I wish. Okay. I, I wish, yeah, man. Uh, I will definitely wear the, you know, Stegosaurus pair tomorrow. Appreciate it. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate your guys' talk. Um, you said controls is one of those topics that a lot of people, it, it resonates with, but it's kind of maybe underrepresented. So especially in communities like this, we're very happy to see that different perspective. Um, I think one of the biggest questions I had initially was, you guys mentioned low, medium, and high, like, I guess, maturity controls. Uh, what's a good approach to define those in terms of, like, if I'm a system admin, I'm like, what do I need to worry about first versus, like, down the road? I think you were just talking about this outside. I mean, uh, we, we actually get this question fairly often. Um, so, uh, you know, CIS has the implementation groups. Yep. Um, and so, you, you know, it's... You know, implementation group one is basically, you know, low and then implementation group two and three. Um, so we actually let folks choose their own, uh, you know, group yeah. essentially based on basically, uh, you know, resources dedicated to cybersecurity act activities, basically knowledge or um, or uh, contractors that you, that you basically ha have access to, and then criticality of assets. Okay. Um, and so what that means that sometimes a very large organization actually starts with implementation group one or says we are mm. an implementation group one organization. Um, and sometimes a really small organization has really critical assets actually will say that you know we are group three, and that, would, and that we need to do all 171 subcontrols. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes there's some tailoring based on mission as, as, as well. Yep, and resources and what's available. I mean, there's always limitations in terms of technology. Yeah. Um, so it's all about kind of hitting that balance. We provide as a general guidance, and, you know, I think it's really there to help organizations get started. Yeah, right? it makes absolute sense. Thank you. And like I said, uh, scaling's hard. So like you said, 50,000 people doing something really easy 50,000 times, very challenging. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting things um, I was thinking about, though, is um, as we talk about going from low, medium to high, and you talk about uh, evaluating controls, sometimes there seems to be a uh, understanding there's an abstraction between like a behavior and a control. How do you guys, what's your best practices and approach, I guess, any pro tips you can give for how do you actually like something as abstract as like, you know, privileged access? How do you... How That's, do you evaluate that? As a, as a red team, we're asking that, personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that is a loaded question. Um, so the way we've been looking at it is really from the system level, right? Yeah. We get a ground truth looking at things like configuration elements and vulnerabilities and, you know, what are the artifacts on the system that will yeah. actually allow certain activities to occur? Okay. So I think, you know, and that, that comes back, you know, a little bit from the CIS history where we, you know, we originated with the benchmarks, with okay. secure configuration guidance. Um, and from that, we've built assessment tools that look at configuration elements. So the more we can understand the relation between the system artifacts, you know, does it have certain types of logging or does it have certain permissions around certain folders that we know are being used by malicious actors, um, the more we can kind of start looking from that ground truth and build up, you know, the, the less abstract it's, it's going to be. So that's yeah. really kind of one of the, the main goals is, and that's why I think attack provides a really good junction yeah. is because it is extremely technical. And it's extremely, you can't go much lower level than, like, than that. So it's, it's a good place to, to start and then start building in level of abstraction. Yeah. Oh, okay, you know, user access control means this, but from a system level, it means you have restrictions to these folders and these permissions to these functions. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. And like you said, I think uh, one of the things you kind of mentioned was mapping controls to techniques, which is like, seems like your vector is detections and mitigations. Yep. But coming, asking from attack, is there anything we can do on our end to make that like transition or that like mapping to mapping a little smoother on your end? So one of the, 
the difficult, I mean, you guys really made the big step, right? You, you released mitigations <laughs> as its own object. And, you know, I think that's a big step in the right direction. Yeah. I think there's, obviously, there's always going to be finessing the languages, making it, you know, all nip talks and everything like that. But I think that's more of a, a general statement on the industry. It's hard to talk about defenses in yeah. a standardized way. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So what is really AV? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it can be anything, right? There's a, there's a lar large amount of interpretation. Um, so I think as an industry, we have to get better in terms of how we define yeah. what a security control actually does. Yep. Um, you know, I think we're, we're moving in that, that direction. I just don't think we're there yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of my favorite sections, uh, I think I've seen this a couple of times, mostly in CTI talks, but it was interesting to hear it from your perspective from the control side is harassing the literature. Like you said, we're all, we all want the data, the data, the data, the data. And we get it, and it's not what you wanted. Uh, and actually, sitting with the DBIR author, yep. this is a great time. Um, what can CTI producers do on their end to provide the right data? Love it. So it's it's really about having a level of standardization, right? Okay. Being able to talk the same language, and even that is. It seems like we're we're moving towards that, but even that's not super simple, right? When someone releases a report and says there's an increase in phishing. Okay, <laughs> like is that phishing? Yeah. Is that an email with a link? Is that an email with an attachment? Is that just an email requesting my HR lady to send me all W-2s? Because how you defend against those is significantly different. Yep. Also, does that link then lead you to another place collecting your credentials? Or is that link dropping you malicious malware? Right? All these things are very nuanced, and it's important to understand because yep. it implies and changes how you're going to set up your defenses. Right? Absolutely. How you defend against the malicious attachments different than how you, you know, defend against someone getting their credentials popped. Um, so I think we have to start moving towards a, a more, I guess, in-depth, granular level. Yep. And, you know, that's, I think, attack is providing part of that language. And do you think something, I mean, like piggybacking on attack, do you think there's something or a need for, like you mentioned, the standardization, something like sticks, where, like, we're all, like, even if we're, we all report different things, I write differently than you do, but yep. do you think there's a need for, like, a standardized, like, hard format where we can, like, you know, pass things back and forth, or do you think we're kind of on the right path as is? I think eventually, um, but I mean, I have this philosophy against uh, you know automation. I love yeah. automation, um, but if you can't do it manually first, or you yes. don't necessarily have processes in place, then sometimes you're just doing automation for the sake of doing automation. Yeah. So I think as an industry, we have to come together and really figure out you know how do we describe these. And the community attack model might provide at a non-automated but higher level concept. You know this is yeah. what attackers are doing. This is the pattern, the paths they take, yeah. um, and maybe eventually we start moving towards you know automated sharing where you know, we can get the latest, greatest. It doesn't have to be in like an annual review or quarterly review. We can just say, okay, well, we all know this technique is up yep. as of today. And you check the clock, oh, tomorrow it's down, yep. right? We're not necessarily making strategic decisions based off of those kind of, I guess, small time base. But from a tactical standpoint, okay, well, if everyone else has seen this, then maybe I should also start looking into it. <laughs> Makes absolute sense. And one of the themes I kept picking on throughout your talk was, uh, you know, the, the need for making universal decisions. Like, you know, we all see this, this is the same thing, as well as, um, you actually mentioned a lot of it kind of almost intrinsically and implied, but uh, data sharing. Yeah. And you mentioned like your work with the ISACs and like Krebs and like understanding where to start. Um, so coming from your perspectives, uh, is there anything that you guys would suggest for um, like, you know, enticing more data sharing? I know there's sometimes there's like mm -hmm. equity concerns or like there's sometimes of like, you know, doubt, like do people actually care about this stuff? Like how do you actually probe people to come together and share data that we need as a community to uh, push forward? I, I can hop on this one. <laughs> I, I'm not question. necessarily gonna have the um, <laughs> most popular opinion. Okay. Um, data sharing I think is useful for very trusted communities, okay. right? I think, and this is one of the successes of the ISACs and the ISA, yeah. right? Is you, you've created a small community of, you know, people that have similar interests or similar types of attacks. Um, to share information, but it's not necessarily the data sharing that's important as much as the data translation, yep. right? Is how do we go and make sense and how do we inform our defenses based on that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's really this this balancing act. And I think there's more people that are going to be consuming the translations, like the so what, yeah. than necessarily the raw data. And I think that's where, you know, and especially because we have a very concentrated industry, yeah. right? Vendors play a very large role in this yeah. because they are running the tools, they're seeing the larger trends and all these different pieces. Um, the more we can translate into actionable things, you know, what do I, what am I actually responsible for from a defender's perspective? Yes. Updating my AV, that, that's mostly done by the vendor. You know, signatures is mostly done by my vendor. Yeah. Or maybe I do some internally if I have those resources. But for majority of people, they just need to know that, you know, I need to make sure my systems are up to date or I need to make yeah. sure I have an asset inventory. So that's really, which is kind of the foundational to the, to the controls.
Right. Sounds like context is the word of the day. Yes, yeah. yep, yep, exactly. So I wanted to give you guys one second to plug your, you mentioned the CIS attack model. Uh, yes. Coming out later this year, workbench.cissecurity.org. Um, you guys mentioned you wanted uh, community feedback, so I'll give you a second to talk about what you're expecting there or what would help you guys. Definitely, yeah. So um, uh, so we are basically bringing people into the, uh, con, you know, uh, into the community uh, attack model now. Uh, so we're basically asking people to, uh, you know, send us an email at a con Trolls info at cisecurity.org or join Workbench, what we just heard there, um, or you know, hit us up on on uh, Twitter. <laughs> at, you know, at the you know at the Josh Pitt. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Hey, thank absolutely, you thank Great you so much. Great presentation, and just thanks thank for joining you. me. Uh, thanks we're gonna a quick break, and next we'll have Tony Lambert talking about his Linux presentation. So, thank you. Cool. Welcome back. I'm sitting with uh, Tony Lambert, uh, who just delivered an excellent talk on alertable techniques for Linux. So I really appreciate the time. I think um, how has AttackCon been so for, for you so far? It's been awesome. It's been very well organized. Everybody's been a pleasure to work with. Like if you're used to doing B sides, you know, like some of the B sides are a little bit hairier than others when you try to go and speak when you go to attend. But everything's been like really well organized. Like it's amazing. Everything's been figured out for you by the time <laughs> you get there. I'm sure our staff loves to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate your talk, actually, because um, although it is one of our like platforms representing an attack, it's mm -hmm. actually to me it se kind of seems like the ugly stepchild sometimes. Yes. Like it's really underrepresented. So despite, like you said, how prevalent it is, like mm -hmm. IoT is everywhere, and it's like yeah. a big problem. Uh, so first thing I wanted to pick your mind on is like why do you think there's such a uh, slight on Linux? I know I, I had some ideas, but so I I think some of it comes from simply population when we look when uh, and how the machines are being used. When we look at the population of Linux machines, Linux servers, we do have like an increasing number in IoT devices that are out in the wild, but we also you know, traditionally kind of associate Linux systems with data center environments, server environments, and Windows systems are typically found all over the place. Mac systems are found all over the place, end user workstations as well as servers. You're not going to see as many um, Linux desktops out in the wild. I'm I'm one of the two percent that's still waiting on the year of the <laughs> Linux desktop. But you know, it's it's really kind of. I think some of it is they're a victim of the population. Yeah. And then when people do have breaches that involve data center systems, they're not as willing to talk about it. Yeah. They, they they document. They do their forensic analysis, and then they you know they keep their reports internal. They may not publish them publicly. But I gotta say, if anybody and their brother has a DVR that is exposed to the internet and they find they have malware on it, they publish that immediately. <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing like, it's to see headline. how many of those, yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so you mentioned like, we're, in a, we're all in a lifetime of learning. Like we're, mm -hmm. We can never stop. Um, and one of the biggest things I see with the Linux community, is it seems like you either know it or you don't. Like some of the techniques you mentioned, it's like LD preload and Ktrace and all this yeah. stuff. It's like people might not know that. So you have any recommendations for people who, you know, are have an eager or desire to work yes. in the Linux space, but it's just 
It's hard. So some of the some of the best resources uh, I know over on the the Windows side, people really swear by some of the Windows internals books, things yep. like that. What has been really helpful for me? There's a no starch book, the uh, Linux programming interface, yeah. and it's written by the same guy that does a lot of the man pages for um, a lot of the manual pages for Linux systems, and it's been really helpful. It covers a lot of the system calls that are used in legitimate and malicious programs yeah. so that you know how they work and how a lot of the programming works behind the scenes. And then when you go and look at exploits, when you go and look at what bad guys are using, when you find those articles, try to find the original payloads. Try yeah. to find the scripts. Maybe you find them on Virus Total. Maybe you'll find them somewhere else. You may find them on Pastebin somewhere if you start searching. And really dissect those. Go into what each command does. Research, do the manual pages, figure out how all of this works and puts it together. And the more you deep dive into this, the, the weirder some of it gets. Like when yeah. I started off with this, LD preload, like some of that process injection stuff, was very much like black magic to me. And then I realized, <laughs> wait a minute, this is a 20 year old structure yeah. that nobody has bothered to like, you know, it, people have known about it for 20 years, but nobody has really tried to put in a lot of security around it. And people have always assumed that you know, if it's going to mess up things for everybody, you have to be an administrator. Well, what happens when the bad guys get administrator privileges? Yeah. So the more you understand about how those structures work as you start going through those payloads, it, it gets weird, it gets fun, and just what has helped me the most is that book and looking through the payloads. So what I'm hearing is the Linux beard is truly earned. Yes. It's, it's a writer, it's a badge it of honor. It's a <laughs> badge of honor, badge of embarrassment for how much time <laughs> you spend looking at manual pages, but... Um, but yeah, there, there is a significant amount of time to work on it. Some things are fairly simple, falling off the log with, but if you've grown up on a Windows system, it's going to be significantly harder. I, I got a head start with some of this because at my previous job, I used to work on various systems. I used to be a systems administrator, and I used to do um, a little bit of Red Hat administration in that. So I got a head start on some of this. I, I was prepared for success. and. Um, some folks have never encountered it until they get into their first security job. Oh, yeah. And that's when they have to learn the hard way really fast. That's a tough lesson to learn. Yes. Um, so getting back into like the meat of your conversation, or your presentation, you were talking about alertable um, mm -hmm. detections, like what makes a good alert. Um, yes. So one of the things I wanted to ask about is like, how do you really build that context that you like really focused on? Is it you know based on the specific behavior detecting? Is it based on okay. the environment? Is it based on other variables such as like the capability? Like what are you actually collecting data from? Um, how do you build that context that's so crucial for that? That no works. So what what we try to do for I know at least in my organization for alerts, we'll try to actually put the criteria for the alert in front of the analyst. We'll try to put all of the process details of the, the process that's executing at that particular time. And then within a couple of clicks of their mouse, they can bring up an interface that shows a process timeline and do things like that. So already we have the processes context that has happened, all the things that it has touched theoretically, assuming data gets captured properly. And we have the alert criteria. So they already know two pieces of data. They have two investigative leads. And we can zoom back in the timeline for parent processes further back. What we've also tried to do with um, with some of our alerting criteria, we have kind of an interesting little alert page where if an analyst isn't sure of what's going on in a particular alert criteria, they've never seen this before, maybe they're not really familiar with Linux, they can go and click and look at that alert page and have examples of things that have been seen in the wild that are malicious, and documented known false positives, and if they want to learn more, a few reference links where they can go to the attack framework, they yeah. can go to other resources to understand how it works and be able to detect it. Okay. So it sounds like it starts with collection, uh, proceeds through analysis, and then Absolutely. I guess goes follows up with IR and all the response. So it's actually a full process of context. So it's, it seems like it's everywhere. It, it like absolutely is. And if you're the the thing I always hear from people is like, what do you mean by context? What what sort of context do you need for this? And I think a lot of that is a self-defining criteria in your yeah. organization. You don't know what context you need until you talk to your analysts. <laughs> If you really want to know what context you need, go talk to your analysts, figure out what they want, what's going to make their job easier. You're going to be happier, they're going to be happier, you're going to have higher morale, you have like a sense of ownership in how this system runs. 
it's going to be a better thing for all of that. Yeah. And the everybody. analysts don't know until you test it, like you said. Exactly. We've got to do that unit testing, that atomic testing, and really tease out it, that data. Yeah. And it's, awesome. it's, it's, it's one of those things like shopping for a car. You don't know what yeah. you want until you see it sometimes. Yeah. And it's the same thing with some of these alerts until you start asking people, I'm like, well, I've never thought of this before. <laughs> and you can figure it out from there. We've all been there. <laughs> so uh, wrapping up, um, mm -hmm. you know, you've, you've expressed or shown a great deal of a sub subject matter expertise. Uh, but in your opinion, what's next for like Linux? Like you said, it seems to be more ubiquitous. Um, mm -hmm. How can we as a community grow and kind of embrace the future challenges? So I think the, the next big thing of trying to do continuous monitoring and security on Linux systems, we're fairly used to doing um, threat hunting from logs. We're used to gathering logs and all sorts of forms from Linux and Unix-based systems. We're not used to doing continuous monitoring via process monitoring, mm -hmm. things like time. that, yeah. the real-time stuff. And to do that a lot of times, you know, if you're using a commercial tool, chances are that commercial tool has a kernel module involved, it has a driver, it has you know, something that is going to be a little bit unstable for the system, and people really kind of get uptight about their production Linux data centers. They don't want to introduce kernel modules that can cause instability. So what's, I think, the, really the next big thing that we're starting to see with some commercial sensors and we're starting to see in some other tools is the implementation of um, where they take advantage more of audit subsystems that are built into the Linux kernel, like audit, D, uh, like audit subsystem that fuels audit D, and also a technology called eBPF, which is um, process tracing. Okay. It's been really heralded. It's been really awesome for performance diagnostics and tooling. The, the folks do container scaling, Kubernetes, they love it. But you can also do some good process and system call monitoring that's resistant to rootkits hmm. using eBPF. So once you start seeing a new generation of sensors and a new generation of things like OS query starting using these new technologies, you're going to have a lot more reliable data collection that you can build your, you know, continuous data collection that you can build your analytics on top of. Sounds awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's it's an fun. exciting future. But <laughs> yeah. thank you for your time, Tony. No problem. And before I sign off, I want to. Uh, now, once again, thank the attack community for your great tweets. We're loving the memes. Keep them coming. Uh, don't forget about the selfie posters. Uh, like I said before, we saw you out in Amsterdam, Virginia Beach. Keep them coming. We love it. Um, I'm going to sign off for the rest of the lunch break, uh, but stay tuned. AttackCon will be back in about 25 minutes. Awesome. That, was, that was awesome. Well, thank EBPF. you. EBPF. EBPF. Yeah.
Miter's Attack Con 2.0 will continue in five minutes. Please take your seats. Attack on 2.0 will continue in two minutes.
If you're under attack, she's got your back. Welcome back to Attack Con 2.0 with Katie Nichols. Man, these are these are awesome. Can, can you be my hype man forever? Just follow me around and hype me up. That's wonderful. Welcome back from lunch, everyone. Welcome back to those online. Um, thanks so much for to XM Ray for sponsoring that, or sorry, VM Ray um, for sponsoring our lunch, um, including ice cream. I was particularly pumped about the ice cream there. Some of you are still wrapping that up. I'm going to be doing the same thing. Thank you so much. Hopefully you got to connect with some folks online here in person. And uh, thank you to Jamie Williams and our special guests, our speakers, and others um, on the AttackCon couch. Hope you enjoyed that online as well. It's now my pleasure to introduce Gary Gagnon. He's the Vice President of Cyber Strategy and Chief Security Officer here at MITRE. Gary's responsible for leading MITRE's overall cyber strategy and execution. As MITRE's Chief Security Officer, there we go. The, the audio was excited about Gary coming on. As MITRE's Chief Security Officer, Gary directs the physical and cyber security efforts, promoting security as a strategic asset across the company. He pioneered MITRE's transformation from a vulnerability-based approach to a threat-based strategy, allowing us to identify and respond to emerging cyber threats. Gary's leadership and vision also helped lay the foundation on which attack was built, and he also championed its release four and a half years ago. Please join me in welcoming Gary Gagnon. Can you guys hear me? Is this turned on? Okay. Yeah, so thank you, um, Katie. That was um, incredible. I can't believe I actually did all that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I'm the Vice President in charge of Cyber Strategy here at MITRE and the Chief Security Officer and we purposely line those two up so we can actually eat our own dog food, try things out ourselves inside our own enterprise for, um, to try concepts out that we're going to advise our government on. Um, I've been at MITRE since, uh, since 1986 in cyber security, pretty much all that time. I had a brief um, time where I was outside of MITRE, most recently as the CISO for Amazon. Um, and it was the public service mission that MITRE had that brought me back here to MITRE, and um, I'm really excited that, I, um, that I'm back. So this year, the vibe in this room has just been incredible. There's been so much excitement. The team, um, the, the MITRE team coupled with what you guys are doing in a partnership has really been just outstanding. I never would have thought in 2015 when Blake presented the, um, the attack framework to me that we'd have this type of um, commitment across the uh, across the ecosystem. So I really appreciate all the um, all the enthusiasm. Um, so instead of talking about attack, because you're going to hear a lot about attack, um, what you know, I, I think a lot of us should be thinking to ourselves right now: What is it that we want to get out of this time together today? Um, you know, we're certainly building a partnership. We're building a uh, you know a strong partnership where we want to continue to advance attack and advance. Uh, threat informed defense writ large. Um, I think this is an opportunity for us to network, socialize, and really get to know each other and try to figure out what we want to do next. Um, you know, in 1999, when we released CVE, who would have thought 20 years later that would still be a industry standard? And you know, we um, just quick statistics: 143,000 named vulnerabilities now, um, and we have 109. CNAs, CVE numbering authorities, companies who have agreed to um, release their uh, vulnerability information in 18 countries. And so I think we're in the same trajectory here with what we're doing with attack. I think we've got that same, the same type of momentum. And uh, I really want to encourage us all to continue with the engagement and, and work towards that. Um, so the idea behind attack was formed out of, I'll call it frustration on my point. Um, I was watching the security community doing what I called block and crouch. Um, we were vulnerability based, we were blocking and then we were crouching until we saw the next attack coming in. Hopefully we saw it and then we blocked it again and then we crouched waiting for the next one to come in. And it was not a proactive defense at all and so we decided we're gonna tr we want to try to change the game. And simple, that simple high level strategy uh, with a talented team underneath you, you can actually do a lot of great things and that, I think that's what's happened um, here with us and now with you guys. So. Um, getting out of the vulnerability-based block and crouch approach to threat-informed proactive defense is kind of the message that I think we've been trying to um, d deliver. I just got my talking points like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so, um, so 
you know, again, I encourage us all to kind of continue to work together and try to stay engaged. I think Blake did a great job this morning in kind of laying out the framework and what the future is going to hold. Rich Struess is going to do a presentation later on today on his vision for how he sees attack on, um, over the next few years. Um, we're looking for feedback and response on, on what that could look like. Um, we've got some ideas, but we, um, we're really looking for the community to help us shape it. Um, so again, by numbers, we have more than 5,000 people who are attending this event, um, both here in our watch rooms and uh, online. So we've got a tremendous, tremendous turnout. Um, and again, that excitement, I think we want to take out of this conference into the future and what we're trying to do with the tech. So um, thanks again for all your support. Thanks for, guy, for coming out. It's kind of interesting. I'm doing a welcome a day and a half into a conference <laughs> with a day and a half left, but that's okay. Um, so welcome, and um, let's keep up the um, keep up the momentum. And th thanks. Thank you so much for your welcoming remarks, Gary. Yeah, it is day and a half already. Time flies when you're having fun, and we really do appreciate uh, Gary's leadership as the attack team and being a champion for getting it released. Can't believe it's been four and a half years, huh, Blake? So thanks so much. Now, coming back from lunch, we have a pretty special treat for you. Um, I'm not hyping them up too much. It's awesome. It'll live up to your expectations. My own teammates, uh, Sarah and Jackie, are going to be talking next. And it's kind of funny. It, it, I always enjoy introducing people from our team, because um, I remember earlier this year, when they both came into my office and um, I had been teaching them how to map things manually to attack, like we did for a lot of you in the CTI training yesterday. And um, they were picking it up really well, but they kind of looked at me and were like, uh, Katie, can, can we like write code to do this? And I was like, yeah, sweet. Um, I've just been spending a couple of years doing this, but if you want to like write some code that automates it, yeah, go for it. And they did. And I think it's a great story about the power of bringing new people onto teams, because if they hadn't come along, I would just be manually mapping this stuff. So I'd encourage you all, bring new people, new perspectives into your teams, um, because it's really paid off for us. So uh, Sarah and Jack, you're going to be talking to you about an awesome tool that uh, they've been working on. So I'm not really going to steal any more of their thunder. I'm going to let you uh, tell them about it, uh, tell you about it themselves. So please join me in welcoming Jackie Lasky and Sarah Yoder. Sarah Yoder, Security, Security Engineers here at MITRE, and today we're just going to share with you some of our methodology behind um, TRAM, which is our project that we've been working on to create an easier way to map threat reports to attack. So we'll start with how does, pro how does information get into the attack site? Um, this usually starts with finding open source threat reporting, so looking at common vendors like FireEye, Secure list, cyber reason, those kind of things, and basically choosing reports based on the content that's in them. So we're always looking for new reports on do, new APT groups, on malware, things like that. And then when we have a report, we'll finally go through and we'll start from beginning to end reading the report and looking for different attack techniques that are in there. And some of you that may have been in the CTI workshop yesterday have learned that this is a really manual process and it takes a long time. Um, we usually start when we're going through a report with looking for the tactics. Um, we'll kind of highlight along the way any verbs or any um, tactics that we may think an adversary is trying to do. And then when we're done, we'll kind of repeat this process and look for all the techniques in the report. So it takes a really long time to be able to cross-reference uh, the tactics, the sentences, and going and looking for the techniques that they map to. Um, yeah, so all the data that's added into our attack site is done manually, um, which means it's hard to keep it up to date. Um, we usually often have a huge backlog of reports that are unanalyzed, um, and we have to prioritize some over others. So we also have things like human error. Um, so two analysts may look at a report and have two different interpretations of the same text. Um, this also introduces things like availability bias. So basically, um, what that means is that you're more likely to think of the attack techniques that you're already familiar with or that you already know of, which can cause you to overlook some of the less common techniques that are out there. Um, so that's also a challenge that we have. And then also training new team members is really hard to do too. Um, Attack is a huge site and it's continuously growing every day. So it's a, it's a lot to take in when you first start here. So that's where our solution called the Threat Report Attack Mapper comes in. 
Um, we call it TRAM for short. And basically, um, obviously, as Katie said, this project grew out of a need to be able to automate some of the stuff that we do here. So we're just gonna give a quick little overview of sort of the details to our technical approach as we started this project. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to get into too big of the details, but you can always find us after. Um, so the first step in our process was to get data in. And how we did this is we used a sticks and taxi server. And basically, we just grabbed down all the example data from each techniques page, and we were gonna use that for our training data set. So before we could do that, um, a lot of the text in the world is unstructured raw text, so in some human language. So we had to be able to get it into some language that the computer can understand. So this is where a lot of our data normalization and natural language processing occurs. Um, so doing a lot of things like removing stop words, um, doing our stemming, lemmatization, things like that, that's all gonna occur in this step. And then once we've got the data in a good format, um, we can start building and training our models. So to do this, we use Python's logistic regression, um, which is a supervised learning classification method. And essentially what each technique has is they have their own model built for them. So we'll have a positive and a negative class that we build for each technique. So the positive class consists of the examples from the attack site, and then the negative class consists of a variety of things. So maybe like true negatives or sentences that don't relate to any technique at all, or maybe other techniques examples um, to also differentiate between different techniques. Um, yeah. Uh, so after we've trained and built our models, we had to collect a good, um, reliable test data set that we could use. So we did this using our own um, Feedly CTI RSS feed. They have a Python API where you can just kind of grab a bunch of reports that you want to look at, and um, we use that to collect sort of the test data set that we used. Um, so once we had our test data, we were able to transform our um, test data with the models that we built from the previous step. So this is where we can perform a lot of our cross-validation and checking how our, um, our models are performing as we go through this process. And then once we have ran our reports, our test reports, through the models, um, we get sort of a printout that the analyst can look at and decide whether they approve or um, reject basically the techniques that were found in the model. So they'll have a list of all the techniques that were found in the report and they can go through and decide whether they like them or not. And then we can also add in ones that are missed as well. And to pull it all together, we have a feedback loop to be able to improve our model as we go through. So we use a database to be able to track the different true positives, false positives, um, true negatives, things like that, so that we can include it and make the model better each time. And we use a serialized format in Python called a pickle file so that we can reload and rebuild the models um, whenever new data gets added to the attack site. So this is still, um, along the way, we had a lot of challenges that we still had to overcome. But the most obvious challenge is extracting meaning from text is still really hard to do. Um, humans are still needed in this process. We haven't got rid of us yet, um, but we still are using us. So we still need to be part of that process and improving the feedback loop, um, improving the models as we go. Um, but the problem almost always comes back to not having enough data to train with. So this can lead to things like imbalanced data sets, so maybe having a really large negative class um, of training examples, but a really small positive class of examples that are good. So that's one of the challenges we had to face as we went through this. Um, we had some techniques in attack that don't have any examples at all, or maybe they only have one or two examples. So for those kind of cases, we had to look at them on a case-by-case -case basis and sort of build out regular expressions and string matching kind of things to be able to kind of handle those cases um, that we couldn't build, in, build enough models for. Cool, so now I'm gonna go over just how it looks. So uh, because we have a short time slot, a lot of this demo we're just gonna skip through. So at this point in the tool, uh, we would assume that the analyst has gone online, found a report that they're interested in, they grabbed the URL and ran it through our, our tool tram. So when they go to analyze that report, this is the view that they would see. And as you can see, if they click on the highlighted sentence, it'll show you a couple of techniques that TRAM found. So in this example, uh, spear phishing link and attachment. Going back to what Jackie said, uh, sometimes the computer still has trouble distinguishing very similar techniques. From here, you can go ahead and um, reject spear phishing link since that wasn't what this sentence was talking about and confirm or accept the spear phishing attachment uh, since that was correct. And as you can see, it got rid of the spear phishing link from the list and add spear phishing attachment down into the confirmed techniques. Um, so from here, uh, as Jackie mentioned, the, uh, the models will be updated based on the accept or rejects as an analyst goes through this report. So you would follow this uh, process for the rest of the report and you can then uh, export it as a PDF. So at the bottom of the PDF, um, 
you would get a chart that looks like this that has all of the confirmed techniques from the report that you analyzed. So we hope that this is a useful little snippet that the analyst can use to share with maybe other members on your team or for us at the use case, we'll probably be feeding this into a TAC to uh, get more information into the site. So why does this matter? Um, other than our use case, which was to automate our jobs, we hope that it's useful for you as well. Uh, we know that mapping reports to attack can be kind of overwhelming. There's a lot of techniques to choose from. And so we hope that this is a good starting place since there's only a handful of techniques that the analyst needs to review per sentence. Um, as Jackie mentioned, remembering 266 and growing, uh, techniques is hard, and there's many techniques that sometimes I forget about, uh, and so luckily the computer doesn't have that problem, so it can remember them for us. Uh, and next, uh, we hope that you can use reporting that's important to you, so whether that's an internal report source or uh, if you feel like a TAC doesn't have enough information on maybe the financial sector or healthcare, whatever your use case may be, we would hope that you can use this to get more data for the techniques that you care about. Uh, so some takeaways, uh, many people have talked about uh, attack helping to frame behaviors, uh, moving away from IOCs, and uh, we hope that you can use a lot of what other people are discussing today, uh, mainly our four you, uh, main attack use cases, which are detections, kind of the SOC assessments and gap analysis, can track adversaries you care about using a cyber threat intelligence, and then potentially emulate uh, those adversaries. Uh, we acknowledge that mapping data to attack is hard, but that's where we hope that TRAM can come in and make that easier. So with that, we have some time for questions. Oh, most importantly, this will be open source and available to the community, hopefully by the end of the year. Microphones come in. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, ladies. This is fantastic. Um, I'm wondering if you've had any, I guess, experience, or if the community's had any experience with overlapping this with like a tip, whether it's MISP or a commercial tool, and uh, integrating those two things. Yeah. So we're still really early in this process on building this, but. Uh, I could see as it gets more mature and if the community can help make it even better, that maybe that definitely would be an option uh, yeah, to be used. Just a real quick uh, technical question on your NLP. Um, was that the only um, library or learning model that you considered or were there maybe a couple other candidates? Mostly just using the natural language toolkit in Python. Um, it's one that I was already familiar with, and we definitely, both of us kind of have a small background. Um, I have a computer science major, but I've never, I don't have a PhD in AI or machine learning, you know, so um, I just kind of went with what I was familiar with and what she was familiar with um, using our backgrounds, and that's kind of how we went from there um, in the limited time that we had, so. Any others? Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't sure if it was my turn. I got my PhD from uh, YouTube on machine learning, so we're in good company. Um, when you do the uh, release in open source, Jupyter Notebook perhaps? Our old code used to be on Jupyter Notebook, but we're actually, we have it in um, a web app now, so no more Jupyter Notebooks, unless people want them. But I feel code. like that's my old code. <laughs> Thank you, it was a mm -hmm. great effort. You did a great job on this. I think that the community can really run with this. So I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Any questions? Any other? We back. have one in the front here. Getting your exercise today, huh? Great. So if I'm understanding it right, basically it's going to be a web app um, that's going to be hosted by you guys, correct? No, so or it's actually all run locally. So. All run locally, yep. okay. Because the next place I was going was how you were going to deconflict potentially if two people submit the same report and then train it. But Yep, so right now it's run locally on the user system. Um, 
looking, we have looked into having it in more of a centralized location so that multiple analysts would be able to use it at the same time uh, to kind of uh, curb your thought of deconfliction where we have some features that are in the works to kind of tag reports that would say like Sarah's working on this one, Jackie's working on this other, um, so that hopefully the same analyst isn't working on the same report. Would you have the option to send the reports back to you guys to then update the attack matrix? Um, yeah, through our normal contribution methods, yep. We would yeah. love to get more reports in uh, that we didn't have to do ourselves, so yeah. No. Definitely interested there. Yeah, we think it will definitely help increase co um, community contributions that way too, because that will give you guys a way to find reports, um, have them mapped, and get into us as well. So, great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I think Sarah and Jackie have generously offered to do live demos for folks, not on stage, but <laughs> folks in McLean, um, pull them aside. It's, it's a pretty slick tool, and I'm pretty excited to hopefully open source that in the near future. So. If there are no other questions, catch them during break um, during the reception tonight because they've done some great work here. Please join me in thanking Sarah and Jackie. Thank you. A quick logistical note um, for folks standing, you are welcome to come and fill in the seats. We don't bite this side of the room, I promise it's going to be all right. Um, folks online also really appreciated Sarah and Jackie's talk. Uh, John Stoner from Splunk said, very cool overview of TRAM from Sarah and Jackie to map more threat reports to tactics and techniques. Um, Daniel Riedel said, uh, Jackie and Sarah are writing software to automate threat intel parsing for attack. Uh, he said, data normalization is really hard work. Impressive. So some kudos from the Twitterverse, those of you watching online as well. Um, thanks, for, thanks for your appreciation for Sarah and Jackie there. Now, really, really excited to introduce our next speakers who flew um, the farthest of anyone, any of our attack con speakers, all the way from Argentina. I still remember um, when we were first on a call with them. We're really lucky as the attack team. We get to talk to a lot of you, how you're using attack. And, you know, we were chatting and they were screen sharing with us. And like many of you, of course, I'm on Slack typing to Adam and Blake, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. Like, can you believe this? What are they doing? They created this whole threat library, way more than we have on the public attack site. They customized it, they added new techniques. Our minds were blown. Um, this was about last year this time, and since then, it's been such a pleasure. We got to meet the team for the first time in Vegas. It's been a real pleasure to kind of see how their work has evolved, and um, they were generous enough to let me use some of their content in my own Black Hat presentation. So you're in for quite a treat here. Um, they're gonna talk to you about how they did all of their awesome work to create this threat library, and uh, give you some tips on how you can maybe create your own. So please join me in welcoming our two Deloitte Argentina speakers, Valentina Palacin and Ruth Barbasil. Thank you everyone, thank you Katie for the introduction. Uh, well, as Katie said, we are Ruth and Valentina, and we are the writers of the MITRE framework, and we are going to show you how to build your own threat library. First, we are going to go into what is exactly a threat library, then we are going to cover how to build one, to speak a little about uh, the problems that we encounter, and to finally, we are going to end with some lessons we learned that you can take with you. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about our backgrounds. So Ruth is the Threat Library team project leader. She started with the project around almost four years ago. Uh, she is an information security specialist and information system engineer. And myself, I have a background in translation. So I contributed the project uh, for two year, almost two years now. Uh, with the helping with the editorial process, and I'm also using my programming skills to help with automation and da data analysis. But first, let's introduce you a little bit about what, uh, why we uh, came out with this project. Um, when I first started in cyber threat intelligence, one of my first tasks was to collect indicators of compromise from public sources. Uh, this was a really exhausting job. Uh, it was really uh, messy. But we learned a lot about uh, in the way, and now it's uh, uh, luckily everything is uh, scripting, so now we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> but we learned a lot in this process. 
So one of the things that we have to do in those uh, Excel spreadsheets that we use for uh, indicator collection uh, was to describe the malware that we were uh, collecting the indica indicators from. So uh, what is interesting about this is that the description often uh, mixes where, where the malware, the redactors, and the campaigns. Uh, and pivoting through this data was really difficult. If I wanted to know what other uh, malware pieces were using as redactor, it was really difficult for me to do that. So one day, uh, we were with Shedlag and we were talking with the director of the threat intelligence team, which is John Martin. Um, and he uh, and me, we were t thinking about how we can improve the information that we were already collecting, but showing in an interesting way that you can uh, query in, in an easy way. So this is how this uh, library is started. But what it seems to be like the solution to all of our desires and needs uh, may not end up destroying us if we don't do it well. <laughs> so let's start a little bit managing the expectation of a process uh, of this kind. So it's not a solution by itself. The project is, is uh, meant to be for analysts so they can dig into data uh, regarding the threat actors in, a, in an easy way, but they are the, the main th the thinkers about what it, the output is going to be. Also, this is not a collection of all existing attacks. There is too many information. There is too many things happening out there. So we focus only on highly targeted attacks, uh, focusing on industries on which Deloitte has clients on. This is also not an indicator feed. You may find some indicators, but it's not meant to be as a feed for a SOC or something like that. It's only to check the information and validate the information that we're already putting in the page and also extracting some useful things that can be helpful for threat hunting. Uh, it's also not perfect. People that is writing the reports that we are consuming is people, we are people, so we are prone to errors and we are not perfect. Uh, so we, can, we have to put a workflow which includes the, the quality assurance to be able to put the, the most uh, information that we can in the most meaningful way. And it's also not fixed in time because think how this is the way as Frankenstein monster, information is alive. Uh, so what to do expect uh, of a project of this kind uh, is to have a normalized and catalog information uh, so you can uh, find the information that you are trying to uh, spot in a, a particular a specific place of the report. Also, you can see this as an activity journal. We have uh, key observables for each one of these threads. Uh, we gather a lot of operations uh, of the APT, so this is a way that we can see the evolution of them. And also, the idea is to have all in one place, so you don't have to query and go through uh, multiple sources and dig through a lot of information because we already done that for you. So when we started with this, we, ha we are seeing this huge monster, which is, a, is a composed of volatile sources, private feed, OSINT sources, naming conventions, and a lo lot of things that overwhelm us, and we feel really tiny ag against this huge monster. Some of the issues that we came across, uh, we are st still struggling with, and we are not going to, to get rid of them sooner. <laughs> But uh, we have observed a lot of diverse formatting uh, and distribution of the information even for one uh, organization. They have different uh, formatting uh, between uh, one report and another, so you don't find the information always in the same place. Also, we observe a lot of uh, overlapping and attributions that we can't really validate because we have a lack of context or indicators and evidence of what they are reporting on, and that is really difficult for us to, to put uh, uh, confidence level on that. But this makes us feel really like we are going to be crushed by stress and fatigue, but don't worry, we are not going to die. So, moving uh, on forward with this uh, Indiana Jones analogy, uh, we sometimes think like being a threat intelligence analyst is a little bit of like going through a jungle of information, open our way with a blade and finding ancient data, trying to dig and find the treasure in it. Uh, so what to do to not get swamped and buried with all that, uh, that huge ancient information? So what we do is to follow uh, a structure pretty similar to the one MITRE used on the web page. Um, we distinguish the bands and we kind of organize them uh, against what are the industries they hit, uh, mostly based on Deloitte's industries of interest. 
Uh, we also relay them with the threat actors and with the tools, and we use the attack framework to identify the, tool, the tools, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, well, let's talk a little bit what you will find when you get into the threat library. So the first thing we do is to um, offer all the campaigns around the day they happened, or if we don't have that information, at the, around the day they were released. We also try to follow the same structure for all the titles. We, try, we would like to be able to see at a glance the APT involved, what was the target, could be the industry, the country, or even an entity, and with what. And we find that this structure is pretty useful when you are doing analysis and also when you are trying to prioritize or are you reviewing process. Uh, then when you get into one incident, this is like the scorecard. So you can see the campaign period, the release date, the confidence level, also which region, country, and industries were affected, and a, a little summary about the incident. And then, if we are lucky enough, and there's some information about the victims, like in the other this other case, well, you will see that too. And we follow sticks terminology to classify the campaigns according to the intended effects behind them. And finally, we provide a brief description of the associated actor and a link to the threat actor page. Then, all these scorecards is followed by what we call the main information. And the main information is structured in three sections. The first one is the initial access section in which we try to publish everything related to how the threat actor gained foothold into the victim system. Uh, we provide a screenshot and also the files that were used, inform information about the files that were used, and a list of all the tools involved with a description and a link to the tool page. Also, after that, we provide a technical description about the campaign. Finally, the page closes with what we call the analysis, attribution, and geolocation information. So, for example, we put there, if we have something that could be meaningful to know where the threat actor is located, or if there are similarities with other campaigns or other uh, groups. And in the last section, which is the analysis, we gather all the information related to why the attribution was made or it wasn't made, and also, when we can, we also provide our own assessments about the incident. In the case of the tools, we call it tools because it's not only malware, they are also legitimate tools being abused for this uh, kind of stuff. But we uh, are following some, uh, some patterns similar to the attack software pages. But we added a couple of uh, additional things. Uh, we added a description and a details. And in the details, we put uh, specific technical stuff that they are using in that specific uh, campaign. And we put a column of campaign uh, on which that malware was seen and was reported. So we do this because we think that this is the best way to spot when a procedure is changing, uh, when a procedure is, is changing the way that the technique is being applied so you can uh, further understand how the threat actor is evolving. Uh, we are also adding information regarding the indicators that we've seen in those campaigns, uh, mainly uh, network and file related. But this, again, is not an indicator feed. This is only to validate the information that we are already putting there and to uh, also uh, further extract characteristics that may be helpful in threat hunting and threat reporting. Uh, for threat actors, talking about having all in one site, in one page, I think that this is the most clear uh, way to see it. Uh, the threat actors has an uh, interesting scorecard in which we put all the things that we think that are really important to spot at first which are the affected regions, countries, and industries. But we also try to uh, understand what are the threat actor types, if they are, are state sponsor, if they are a cybercrime actor, also the sophistication level of these threat actors, and the motivations behind it. And to do this, we follow, again, the sticks of vocabulary because we want to use the same language uh, across uh, all the industries. And if you see in the right part of the screen, you're going to see the content table uh, one of the things at the bottom are the tool set and campaigns, which are just a summary of the tools and campaigns that we are already mentioned, uh, but you can see uh, everything that is related to this actor and pivot through the data. 
And we have also a part of relevant information. This is done because sometimes we find information that it can't be fit in any of these sectors that we already mentioned, or we can't link them with a specific campaign, but we think that it's really important information to have. For example, you can see there it, we have the zero day vulnerabilities used by APT28. And um, there it says point of entry. Why? Okay, so when we started this project, we thought that understanding the initial foothold on the threat actors uh, that did in the organization was really important to our clients, but the tactic initial access didn't exist at the time, so we came up with this point of entry tactic. And then when uh, attack added to it, uh, we deprecate that one and st stick with the framework. So now that we talk about what and the how, let's talk a little bit about the problems we encounter. So for sure, the most difficult to identify are the full flag campaigns. The analysis bias, we have to remember that we work mostly with Western so sources. Uh, we'll try to do otherwise sometimes, but it's difficult and time consuming. And also we have to carry it with our own bias too. And also the misattribution, because as Ruth mentioned, sometimes a report didn't have information about what, uh, why an attribution was made, or they don't have indicative compromise that we can download to carry out our own, our own analysis. But uh, remembering that we are all humans, there are other things that sometimes we spot, and we have some examples to show you. Um, these are some that hit us in some way or another, so we, we identify and we are going to share with you. For example, in this case, we find that uh, an alleged leader was a threat actor targeting Argentina. So we were fairly curious, because it's our er area of work, so we went there and it turned out that actually what happened was that indicators were uploaded for, um, by our research team. So it's, it's important to remember that not all the time where, where a file is uploaded is that it means that the attack is happening there. Uh, but I'm sure the, this redactor is going to hit us sooner than, rather than later. Uh, another thing we find uh, problematic, and this is a especially tricky one, because we cannot know it all and none, none the, the, the people that's publishing the report, neither us. Uh, so sometimes we find things, uh, if you can move me to the other slide, please. thank you. Like this, in this case, which is referring to a phishing campaign that happened uh, a long time ago. So uh, some beautiful soul found an Spanish expression, which is actually an, uh, um, a swearing, uh, which uh, it's pronounced la concha de tu madre. Uh, <laughs> uh, so now we, we, you can swear like an Argentinian. <laughs> uh, but this beautiful soul translated as the shell of your mother, which is adorable, but it's, <laughs> 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 but it's not exactly that. It's a clean set meaning will be something like your mother private parts. And why, why we are talking about this? Why we are showing you this? Well, if we go to this map, there are 20 countries in which Spanish is spoken officially. And I, I'm stressing officially because there are more countries in which Spanish is spoken. But from those 20, that expression is used only in seven countries. And we know this observable is not enough on itself to assure that the threat actor comes to, from these places, but maybe we have another indicator, indicators that we can add up to, to say, well, it's from here. And especially considering that we have a fairly threat actor, fairly active threat actor on the region. And finally, we, le we left the biggest headache for last, which is the overlapping attributions. That is the way we call the multiple naming for the same threat actors. So the way we dealt with this is to create something similar to the attack matrix for tactics and techniques, but with vendors and aliases. I'm sure you all really want to see it, but I'm not going to show you that. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of research and really complex and refined work. So we have to especially mention one of our team members, Francis now that couldn't be here with us, but we need he credit this to you. Uh, he's helping in a little with it. And what also do is to, is to rate the sources. So 
we find a way to rate the sources consider, considering its type. Also, the, using the matrix, we rate the vendors according to the visibility by region based on public reports. Remember, we are always talking about public reports. Also, we rate independent researchers by their reputation. And also, we judge if the, if the source has ASCs available to carry out our own analysis. But even though having a formula is awesome, and we encourage everyone here to come up with your own formula to do this, it is important to remember that you need to be able to overrule it as you see fit when necessary. Now let's keep on moving and I want to, to, to teach you how to read the book of secrets. So let's keep in mind that when you're reading a source, you have to identify if they are reporting about a threat actor, a campaign or a malware piece or maybe a combination of those. In this case, we're going to focus only on what are malware reports uh, because we are going to extract the TTPs from those. Uh, first, I want to, you to read the source and identify the paragraph uh, describing the behavior. I think if someone was, uh, yesterday, uh, they did a CTI, uh, CTI training here that was great and they explained this in a pretty neat way. Uh, but you have to, you, it's basically the same, the same uh, process. You have to read the source, identify, identify the paragraphs that are describing the behaviors, and then you can move and identify the tactic. I uh, think just one second, uh, we have already, uh, attack has uh, 266 only enterprise techniques and only 12 tactics. So clearly identifying the tactic is going to be much easier than spotting the technique. Once we have the tactic that it belongs to, we can go through the attack navigator, for example, and look for all the techniques that fit in under that specific tactic and uh, being able to spot what are the description and the technique that belongs to that description. But you can maybe don't find what you are searching for, and in that case, you should create your own. So let's move to a couple of, um, of examples of this. This is a, a piece of malware that the threat actor is not really using a lot of evasion, but they are using a valid certificate to sign on this malware piece. So this is clearly a defense evasion technique. And under the defense evasion, we can find a lot of techniques, but there is a specific technique that suits the specific um, description of this, which is the uh, code signing technique, okay? So we can see it's saying the same, the signing certificate to masquerade the malware and make it appear like as legitimate. So it's clearly this technique that we are trying to spot. We have another example which is a, a little bit more trickier. Um, in this case, this is a locker goga extract of the raw report. Um, and the, in this case, the threat actors behind this malware are changing the default uh, the credentials of the administrator accounts. So the users can't access to their system. They can work, and of course, they can even read the re ransom note and having the chance to pay, which we don't recommend at all. <laughs> <laughs> but this is clearly an impact tactic. Um, at the time that we were writing this, uh, this presentation, uh, we couldn't find any techniques that suits under this specific uh, description, so we came up with our own. <laughs> uh, in this case, we are going to use the naming convention of uh, attackcon001, <laughs> which is uh, our first technique created. <laughs> uh, you should do the same, you should stick with one specific format so you don't get lost. And also we put a clear description of the name so you can understand more or less what uh, we are trying to, to say with that technique. Uh, but a week ago, uh, attack added this technique <laughs> uh, with another name, so now we can deprecate this one and we can stick with the taxonomy that they are using and stick with the framework and, and move on. So now that we talk about the what and the how and the problems, let's uh, summarize everything with some lessons we learned that you could benefit from. First, choose a good technology to build on. Think that information, again, information is alive. <laughs> The framework is con constantly evolutioning and it's changing and it has to be that way. So the platform you're going to use must support this kind of evolution and this kind of changes. Also, do not misunderstand the objectives. Again, there is a lot of information, a lot of attacks going on. So you have to understand that you don't have unlimited resources. You have to focus on something. Uh, so it's not about collecting everything. Again, in our case, we are uh, specifically trying to 
cover what are highly targeted attacks against the industries on which we have clients on. And really important is to define good quality workloads. So think about this. Um, poor display content, uh, poor presented content is the same as not content presented at all. So what we do is we have a, a simplified version of the editorial process. So first someone goes to production and creates the, the, the report. Uh, for example, extracts the tactics and the technique. Then someone else review it. And maybe it could add something. Uh, some, maybe the, the producer forgot a technique or missed uh, something. Uh, the formatting is not right. And then we will be sent back to production until, un until it's, it's sufficiently good enough to go to the proofreader, which will be the final set of eyes that will review the, all the content before it gets approved and it will be accessible to the client. So sticking with uh, good presented content, it's important that you should all be choosing a taxonomy and a sticking with it. Uh, in our case, uh, for example, if you want, we call threat actors, but MITRE uses adversaries. And you may want to call cyber actors or enemies. It's your, actually, it's, it's your choice. But the important thing is that you are not changing between terms in a WIMP. So in our case, we chose a sticks for vocabulary and we structure all our content around the attack framework. Also, it's important to think how the information is going to be consumed. Uh, we learned this the hard way. <laughs> so when we started, our first reports were really messy and complicated to go through. Uh, but then when Valentina joined, uh, she really helped us to put a template and a structure for the information. So now all the reports are really easy to understand and are really easy to spot the important information that you are after. Uh, and also think about how all the information and the intelligence that you're collecting can be transformed into more information. So you probably may want to know which are the most active threat actors in a specific region, maybe the most targeted industries, or maybe uh, what are the most used techniques for a specific country. Uh, or, or maybe you want to only know what were the most used techniques in a period of time. So having that in mind uh, will uh, allow you to understand better how to structure the data. Uh, and also, about just uh, like a summer of everything, you have to think that it's really, really, really important to be consistent. So that's kind of all from our part. Uh, before finishing, we want to thank all the Threat Library team members that couldn't be here with us, but it wouldn't be, the project wouldn't be possible without their help. We also want to thank the attack team Katie, Adam, Blake, uh, Debbie, and all the people behind Attack for all their support and collaboration. And well, thank you all for listening to our presentation. And if you have any questions, you can ask or you can hit us with our social media. Yeah, we have time for questions. So who wants to ask some questions? You might not have a chance to see them very often to pick their brains on this awesome threat library. Um, while people are thinking of their questions, oh, we got a hand? I was gonna throw up, jump in, it's all you, um, in the front. It's your moment to shine, no pressure. Thank you. Um, so we have something similar that we we uh, track our threat, uh, threat actors with. And I'm curious to know, um, you know, after you document, say, a, a campaign or a TTP, how often or how frequent um, are you going back to update that content within the repository? Because say you have a campaign from 2019, 2020, all those indicators might be irrelevant for the new campaign. That's the hard question. Do you want to do? Yeah. In fact, we are not all, uh, all the time trying to read again all the sources because we have a lot of information. Uh, but uh, we are tracking every update that uh, people is doing. Uh, also, we are using our own uh, internal information. So once we spot something new, we go back and we uh, in the, we have a workflow. So we uh, require updates, and someone is going to be assigned to that uh, specific uh, item, and it's going to update everything, and all again is going to go through the workflow and the quality assurance and everything. So it will go back to production, what back to review, and back to proofreading, basically. Um, keep also in mind that Fed Library is part of um, 
big area. We, it's not the only thing that we do. We also have another project that uh, update the information and where you can find more indicators. Um, so one that came into my personal Slack via someone, Adam Pennington. Um, any more tips for people creating your own techniques? That's something you did really well. Like, could you talk about, you know, what, what, would you, what advice would you give to others on that? Well, in fact, uh, the most important thing I think that is to keep a, a specific format so you don't get lost, just keep enumeration, something like that, something like the ACON001 is, is enough. Uh, and keep in mind that this may be added, uh, also shared with attack because it's going to help to everyone. Uh, but just don't be afraid to create your own technique. Uh, just be sure that there is no uh, a technique that already covers that. But don't be afraid. I mean, we, you can do it, and we, we do it. <laughs> and we started like this, and we find a lot of in, uh, interesting information related to uh, a couple of techniques that we created for our own uh, use. Uh, even we create uh, a couple of techniques because we think that it's important to like uh, create like a sub technique, <laughs> which we are already talking about. Nailed it. So, um, but doing that, we, for example, discovered a lot of DNS tunneling uh, abuse. So we uh, started uh, doing some research on that, and it, there is really interesting information by covering only, only that specific uh, part of the technique. Yeah, and also just to add, uh, not everything is worth of being a technique. Just make sure there's something that is unique or uh, you are seeing repeatedly and there's really an, uh, you really have a need to describe that behavior. See Blake and Adam adding along. We face similar challenges to you all, and Blake, can I just get a thumbs up that it is okay for people to create their own local techniques? That is attack approved <laughs> from the lead himself. It's okay, because we realize not everything is in attack that people might use. So I love that you all, you all took that perspective. It's awesome. And of course, you know, let us know. And I think some of the techniques you created, like some of the virtualization evasion, yeah. we then later added. So you're just a little quicker than us. But we appreciate you sharing that back. Other questions for Valentina and Ruth? All right. Please join me in thanking Valentina and Ruth. So getting some love online, wanted to read some of um, the favorite tweets. And my, my Spanish is from college. It's been a little while. So uh, um, Andrew P. said, me enseño como maldecir mejor en español. I think that means like he learned to say bad things, maldecir. I don't know if anyone can back me up on that. Um, Nicole, a threat hunter girl, commented, I agree that overlapping can be difficult when researching historical threat data. I agree that organizing the data with proper attribution is a lot of work. Great job, ladies. So giving uh, some credit to the hard work of Valentina, Ruth, and their whole team. Um, Ismael Valenzuela is in the room, I believe, tweeted, uh, being a CTI analyst feels like being Indiana Jones going through the jungle, digging through ancient data, having a lot of fun learning an attack on how to build your own threat library. So yeah, I think they might have won for the coolest slides. Um, so any future presenters, if you're still working on your slides, cough Rodriguez Brothers. Um, you can uh, go ahead and uh, try to up your game in terms of slides there. I also wanted to uh, take a moment to uh, thank Bryson Board, who's been a serial tweeter. Um, he gave a mind blown emoji for their content and a um, face with the hard eyes for the graphics. Love that. So I wanted to invite Bryson up. We have a special prize since Bryson has some great tweets. Um, this is a vintage edition attack flag signed by the co-creators. You get one too, Fernando, we, we got you. So Bryson, thank you for tweeting. Is that a picture? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your tweets. Keep it up. If you'd like to fly off stage, we're not gonna stop you. <laughs> Excellent. So thanks so much for that great presentation. Um, this is sort of a threat intel afternoon, so I'm, I'm digging this. And our next presenters are in that same theme. Um, Carl and Piotr come from CrowdStrike, from the Overwatch team. CrowdStrike is one of the many organizations who started mapping to attack. And as the Threat Intel lead, it's been really exciting for me to see all of these companies start to do that. Because what it lets us do is, well, we have, you know, for example, our top 20 techniques from open source reporting the attack team has mapped. And the Overwatch team releases their report, and they see their most frequent techniques. We all have different visibility, different biases, another theme of the day. Um, so um, really excited to um, introduce these presenters to talk to you about how they've mapped to attack and how they've found value there in comparing what adversaries are doing. 
So please join me in welcoming Carl Sharman and Piotr Bortiwa. Is that better? There we go. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is a privilege to be here and presenting at AttackCon. Thank you very much to Katie for the introduction and to the Attack team for having us here. I'm Carl, and I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Piotr. We are from CrowdStrike. We are uh, members of the CrowdStrike Overwatch threat hunting team. Overwatch is our threat hunting service. And on the Overwatch team, we have been using Attack for a few years now, and it's been great for us. And what we'd like to talk with you about today is how, in particular, over just this past year, we've made some significant enhancements and improvements to how we are implementing attack into our threat hunting processes. But first, a quick word on our backgrounds. I started my career in, in government doing the military and intelligence community thing, and I've now been at CrowdStrike for over four years, and I've been on our Overwatch threat hunting team for that entire time. I also still serve in a part-time capacity in the Air National Guard. I'm the Director of Operations for a Cyber Intelligence Squadron up in Washington State. So I know a few speakers already today have talked about ways that you can serve and give back, like being an adjunct professor and teaching. Well, of course, serving in the reserve component is another way to give back to the community. And as a National Guardsman, I'm obligated to be a shameless recruiter. So if anybody is interested in <laughs> serving, giving back in that capacity, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about that during one of the breaks. Hello, yeah, cool. Uh, hey everyone, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Piotr Wojtyla, and uh, I've been previously involved more, mostly in incident response, but now uh, with uh, our threat hunting and Overwatch team, more in a research position, so I don't really know what I do. I just do different things that they ask of me. All right, so our agenda for today, we are going to talk to you about attacking the hard way, that is the way that we were doing it before this year, which had some challenges that we'll talk about, and then I'll talk about the ways that we have made some improvements to that, and now we're implementing attack in a much uh, easier way, you could say. And then we'll wrap up with talking about some interesting TTPs we've seen in the wild over the, the first half of this year, which uh, sharing those examples we think helps validate the successes we've had in these improvements and how we've been implementing attack here more recently. Also, a few other notes I should mention is uh, when we refer to specific adversaries, of course, as has been mentioned several times today, there's different naming conventions, right? We use the, that CrowdStrike naming convention, which is the national animal theme. So when we say a panda, that's a Chinese adversary. And when we say a chalima, that's a, uh, a North Korean adversary, bears or Russian, and, and so on. And then if we say spiders, that's referring to a criminal adversary. So sometimes we throw those things out without just some, somewhat naturally, but that's what we're referring to. And one other note as we get started here is uh, that the, the content we're sharing today, these interesting findings, the, the valuable work that's been uncovered, that has led to uh, significant findings from our threat hunting operations is the result of an entire team of Overwatch threat hunters. Piotr and I can't take all the credit for what is being shared today. today. They're, they're the ones who, who deserve that credit. We have a great team of very skilled and experienced hunters that we are grateful for. And so this is very much a, a team effort that's resulted in this presentation. Okay, attacking the hard way. How are we implementing and using attack prior to this year? Well, it was a challenge in the sense that we, uh, it, it was laborious. We, we got a lot of value out of using attack. Attack has given us some great improvements overall in our threat hunting service that we provide for customers because it's allowed us to standardize and more clearly communicate our threat findings to customers. It's allowed us from an intelligence perspective to more effectively and accurately track adversary trends over time. That's all been really good stuff. And as far as how we've gone about uh, using attack in the past, more specifically, what we do is when we identify targeted intrusions, we go back and we review all of the data and manually map that back to attack techniques. And we, we leverage all data sources we have access to, so primarily that's our Falcon endpoint product. Uh, we have endpoint event data that comes into our cloud and we can uh, you know, 
uh, partition off the, the portions of that activity that's relevant to a targeted intrusion and, and map that. We also rely upon any forensics data that our services incident response teams can pull back for, for us for relevant intrusions as well. And then if there are samples from the activity that our intelligence team can get a hold of and, and reverse and do some, some binary analysis on, we'll, we'll, we'll pull that in as well. So any and every resource we can, we, we pull that in. And, and, and then map that manually by going through that data as human analysts and identifying when certain techniques are employed and, and manually map that back to particular techniques. Now, uh, when we have done that mapping, both pre prior to this year and still this year, we're only doing that for targeted intrusions, and that is those state-sponsored or even criminally motivated uh, targeted actors who are going after specific organizations. Oftentimes, that's interactive, hands-on keyboard type of activity. We're not targeting the more common, low-level, uh, noisy commodity type malware threats that is also seen often uh, out there in the wild. These are, these are those targeted adversaries that we're taking the time to map. But even still, given the fact that, that we're, we're analyzing new targeted intrusion activity on a daily basis, like this is, uh, this, is a, this is a laborious process when you're having to do all of this manually. Hence the illustration here of Sisyphus constantly pushing that rock up the hill. It seemed like we were constantly overwhelmed and having a difficult time keeping up doing this in a very manual process. So we've made some changes this year. And we decided, hey, we need to automate some of this, at least as much as possible, at least as much that makes sense. And some of that automation was motivated by some of the presentations given last year at Attack On, where there were some presenters who talked about the pros and cons of automating attack technique mapping. So we decided, yeah, we're going to give that a shot this year. What are some ways we can do that? And so that's taken a few different forms for us. Uh, first and foremost, we have taken advantage of, of our own uh, product itself, so the, the Falcon Endpoint product that, that we use for a lot of our hunting in and of itself. It, it already is looking for specific malicious behaviors, and those behaviors, when they uh, are fired, when they're triggered as detections in the product, those detections are already mapped to uh, the most likely, most common attack technique for that type of behavior. So hey, that's a, that's a resource we can take advantage of to help automatically populate these technique mappings for targeted intrusions, because those targeted intrusions are going to oftentimes trigger at least some of those detections within, uh, within that product itself. So that's good. We can take advantage of that. Also, as a threat hunting team, there's a lot more beyond our product detections of, of behaviors that we are looking for, a lot more experimental hunting leads that um, similarly can, to an extent, be mapped uh, in advance to uh, a most common, a most likely attack technique associated with that behavior. So hey, there's another whole batch of resources we can take into account. So using some of those types of capabilities, we uh, scripted up some capabilities that allow us then to take a set of targeted intrusion data and run it through that scripting engine and output for us automated mapped techniques for that particular targeted intrusion, which is great. So here you see a very stripped down version of the output from that automated mapping that we do. Some of the fields are limited, but, but the most relevant key pieces here we've, we've, we're, is what we're honing in on here for focus. So in that first column, you've got the technique that's been mapped, and then of course a timestamp, and then the associated command line activity for the behavior that was auto-mapped, if you will. So we'll look at that first line briefly up here in the, uh, process, the process injection technique mapping. So what's happening there is in that uh, search protocol host process, uh, a cobalt strike implant has been injected into that process and is acting as that malicious implant. Therefore, oh yeah, process injection is making sense. And I, I should say too that this is, this is a real world example from earlier this year. There, this was a criminally motivated targeted intrusion against a uh, financial sector institution. And so, yeah, this is all from that same intrusion, real world data. And the next technique, if you go next down the line, you see there's masquerading that has been mapped to a similar search protocol host process. Now, what's uh, happening here is uh, this flagged on a particular behavior that was pre-mapped that we map to masquerading because it's looking for unusual execution of search protocol host. Essentially, when search protocol host is executed normally, it's going to have additional command line arguments with it. So when it's executed in this, fa this fashion, there's no additional command line arguments. Something weird's going on. We typically would think that that's maybe a, 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 some other piece of malware that's trying to masquerade as search protocol host. Well, what's really happening here 
is that search protocol host is, the, is what is actually running here. This is legit search protocol host, but it's, it's behaving, it's, it's executing in a, in a strange fashion because of that cobalt strike activity I mentioned earlier that had been mapped previously to process injection. So for masquerading, it's not a true mapping. It's not a very accurate um, automated mapping because that's not the type of masquerading that we were looking for when, when we originally created the map from that pattern to the, uh, the technique of masquerading. So this right then and there shows you some of the limitations that come with automating attack technique mapping, at least in this fashion. So that would be an example of something we'd filter out from our final results and have to go through. So even here, even still with, with this automation happening, you still need that human analyst in the loop to go through and, and verify accuracy, validate those findings to make sure that the automated mapping is correct. Uh, continuing down the line, uh, command line interface, that's pretty self-explanatory. The adversary was using a command shell for some of their operations. Uh, next, you'll see a couple techniques listed as sensor-based ML. Of course, we recognize that that's not a that's not an official attack technique. That's an internal naming convention that we use just because there are a couple pieces of malware as part of this attack that were executed that triggered uh, our next-gen AV machine learning algorithms that uh, that were identified. And since that malware, in, a, in that generic sense, doesn't really it's, it's too difficult to map it to a single technique. We just have that placeholder as sensor-based machine learning there. So that's what's happening in that those two lines of results. Results. And then the final result, uh, you see Windows admin shares was automatically mapped to the behavior in that last final large command line here. And what's happening in that behavior, what the pattern was that triggered on that was a pattern looking for SMB exec. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with SMB exec. It's that open source tool that acts like PS exec, essentially allows Adversaries, we see targeted adversaries use it from time to time. They, they use that to perform execution of malicious activity on remote hosts. So because of that remote behavior, we, we auto pre-mapped that to Windows shares because it, it often uses Windows shares to perform that execution on the remote hosts. But you can see here, um, this is, uh, there's, there's something different happening here. This actually is the SMB exec tool used in this intrusion. Um, and there's a lot happening there. I don't have time to go into all the details, but essentially what it's doing is it's actually executing on local hosts. It's not reaching out over the network to perform its, uh, its malicious activity. Therefore, again, this is another case where even it's a, tr it's a true positive hit of something malicious happening, the pattern being mapped to Windows shares doesn't really match. It's not a, that's not a correct mapping per se. This is, this is yet another example of something that we would need to filter out of our results, and we wouldn't necessarily say that this is Windows shares in this example, in this case, but there's probably other techniques. So um, the other part here is auto mapping is, is, is only gonna get you so far. You need a human in the loop to verify, validate the accuracy of the findings, and you still have to go through all the event data because not everything in the intrusion necessarily is going to be detected by some of our pre-mapped capabilities. So you, there's still somewhat of a manual element to it, but automating gives us a jump start. It closes the gap. It gives us a, a head start in, in mapping the entire intrusion to attack. Cool. Carl gave us an overview of our journey since last year. So kind of to summarize that we take findings from different investigations, incident response, threat intelligence, threat hunting, uh, intrusions. Uh, we map that uh, based on the attack framework, and then we create observables, or what we call observables. So examples of how that specific technique was, was used by the adversaries. So it kind of begs the question, what do we do with that data next? So the first thing we do is we create a tactical threat profiles for the adversaries uh, that allows us to pivot based on, on the data that we mapped. As an example, I want to know every single credential access technique done by Wicked Panda, how that's stuck against every credential access technique done by Fancy Bear, and look for similarities, look for things that might be interesting. Another thing that we do is we take those threat actor profiles and we apply that knowledge across, the, across our customers, across different verticals, and try to track campaigns across our customer base, track and enrich campaigns across our customer base. So as an example, um, last this year, earlier this year, we had an intrusion, uh, we had a same threat actor, uh, Wicked Panda, that was, um, who targeted different customers across, across multiple verticals. And among many different techniques, we saw one behavioral technique that was very, very similar. Basically, they renamed Mimikatz and execute that renamed version of Mimikatz, but the name of the Mimikatz would be a free letter name of the customer they were after. And that would be you know, on, on different customers. Uh, 
it wasn't the only thing that was specific to the adversary. It was just one of those kind of behavioral tactical things that we looked at. I was like, okay, that's very similar to something else we've seen that was also associated with that actor based on implants, based on infrastructure, things like that. The bottom line is that we can use that, we can use those threat actor profiles based on the observables that we created to kind of track different campaigns across our customer base. And uh, what we do with that data um, is we create the final deliverables or we create our reporting that we share both with our customers and with the community uh, as part of our um, half year and uh, yearly uh, reports. And that is something too that uh, you're seeing an example of here is, uh, yeah, when we are completed with uh, all of our analysis that's done all the mapping, we can deliver that, and we do deliver that even publicly at times, so our, our annual and mid-year Overwatch threat hunting reports are something that's published publicly, and we've got it mapped with the detail that's been facilitated by our automated process, filled in still with some manual process, but you get an end result like what you see here. This is uh, just an example. This isn't necessarily from the same intrusion we were talking about before, but this is just a, a couple different examples of what that final uh, product looks like. And uh, speaking of our annual and mid-year reporting, we actually just released our mid-year report, which again covers our threat hunting findings for the first half of the year. So if you just Google 2019 CrowdStrike Overwatch mid-year report, you can pull down a copy of that. And it provides uh, not just specific examples like what was in the previous slide, but we even also provide uh, as best we can the overall uh, review of all the techniques that we've mapped over that given time period and all the targeted intrusion activity that we've seen. It's delivered in this heat map view. And so we encourage you to take a look at that if you, wanna, if you do wanna dive into some of those additional details. There are a few of these examples. Of course, sometimes we see some techniques a lot, but every now and then we see some techniques used in a particularly unique fashion. And so there's a few examples now as we continue with the presentation that we'll dive into of a few interesting technique implementations seen in targeted intrusions in the wild. The tactics highlighted in green here are the tactics we'll share a few examples from. We don't have time. For time's sake, we're limited. We can't share an example from each of the tactic families, but these are the ones we'll dive into now. Okay, so interesting TTPs in the wild. We will start with an intrusion that occurred against an academic institution where uh, the, the victim organization suspected that something was going on on their network. They called in our services team to go in and do incident response, and we as threat hunters and Overwatch then partnered with our on-ground incident responders to, uh, to work together to help uncover uh, potential evidence of an adversary there. And sure enough, it didn't take too long for us to find evidence of uh, targeted activity. It looked like Velvet Chalima was on the network. And, uh, and it turns out, sure enough, a further analysis confirmed that and verified this was actually part of that larger stolen pencil campaign that was reported uh, publicly and widely uh, earlier um, this past year. And uh, in, in this, this case, this is one of those institutions. The North Koreans were actively targeting a number of Western-based academic institutions. So that's what this intrusion was all about. And among the artifacts that we had uncovered pretty, uh, pretty early on in the course of the analysis was an implant that our intelligence team calls Gold Stamp. And the Gold Stamp implant has a number of different collection tactic capabilities. It, it is primarily a keylogger, but it can do some other things including an interesting twist on the clipboard data technique. So what this implant's able to do is identify when, uh, when an, a cryptocurrency wallet address is saved to the clipboard, it will replace that, um, that clipboard uh, saved wallet address with a wallet address that's owned by Velvet Chalima. Therefore, when crypto transfer activity happens, that, uh, that cryptocurrency will be transferred to a Velvet Chalima controlled account. Similarly, we'll, uh, we'll stay with the, the same intrusion here because there's a lot of interesting dynamics involved in this particular intrusion. A lot of it was reported publicly, but there's some other interesting aspects to it um, that we wanted to highlight that wasn't talked about as much in the public. Um, so something that happened early on in this intrusion, the adversary had, had, had gained access and had um, entrenched themselves pretty effectively throughout the network before we got there and before we had visibility. And, and during that time, they were able to uh, dump credentials and gather a number of valid accounts. And unfortunately for at least one particular user on this academic network, they had reused the same credentials for their academic network account as they did for some other personal services and accounts. 
uh, including PayPal and Gmail. So unfortunately, uh, the Velvet Chalima adversaries were able to commandeer his PayPal and Gmail accounts. And they used that to, uh, to, uh, to take their browser extensions techniques, technique to, to a whole new level, if you will. So essentially what they did is they used this individual's legitimate Gmail account to go into the, to the Google Chrome web store and they posted their browser extension, their malicious browser extension, to the Google Chrome web store and used this guy's Gmail account to comment about how great this, this Google Chrome extension is and how everybody should download it. It gives you these great custom font capabilities. And uh, it turns out, and, and actually they're just trying to further infect more potential victims and, uh, and it, obviously having a legitimate Gmail account that's commenting on the, the browser extension would pique interest and shows you just the, the level of creativity that our adversaries will go to. But, but there you have it, a, an interesting, crafty implementation of the browser extensions technique. Another one from one of our customers in uh, the telecom vertical. Um, this time it was on, um, actually the adversary targeted um, the Linux part of, the, of their estate. And uh, the adversary um, used the combination of um, valid, valid, uh, credential, valid accounts, um, SSH to log in to perform some basic hazard network reconnaissance, reviewed some uh, shell history, tried to identify systems and accounts, and um, systems that they could log in, accounts that they could use to log into those systems, things like that. Uh, but the, the, the key thing that I want to talk about in this case is the fact that they modified system binaries. Um, so instead of instead of um, trying to drop a rootkit that would hide the activity specific to the processes that, or the network traffic related to the threat actor, they actually replaced tools, administrative tools, on the system. So they recompiled, so, uh, they recompiled the tools on a box, things like PS, things like TOP, things like, uh, things like Netstat. Any, any tool that the administrator might use or my user might use would basically have its new version with, a, uh, with, a, with an extra code, and that code actually checked every time the command would be executed, um, the, command, the, the tool would first check the directory that was on the system, and in that directory, there will be an information about network, uh, about processes, and about files that will be redacted from the output from that tool. And that way, the adversary would, be, would basically be able to hide on the, on the system from, from anyone who was trying to investigate. Um, obviously, the, the, the functionality is similar, in a way to, 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 to rootkits, but they decided not to drop specific rootkit implant, but instead replace tools uh, with, with, additional, uh, with additional functionality. As you can see uh, on the slide, um, the snippet of that activity, the adversary basically removed the PS file and then recompiled their own version of PS and left it on the, on the system. Moving on to another um, another example, the same adversary, the same intrusion. This time, um, in addition to um, the, threat, uh, the threat actor modifying binaries um, that allow them to, to hide uh, from, from potential administrators and potential incident responders uh, trying to investigate that activity, they've also modified SSH in a way they could maintain access to the system as well as collect additional credentials. So that modified SSH uh, binary uh, would actually um, actually changed the um, of a password function within, within the SSH that is responsible for validating user logons. Um, and that modification basically allowed them to provide the same password, the same static password that will allow them to log into the system every single time, as well as collect any legitimate user logon, username and password, and save it into a file. That way they could then access those credentials and potentially reuse it somewhere else on the network. Another story. Another, uh, another intrusion, another story. Uh, this time, um, one of the adversaries uh, targeting a software company, um, basically the threat actor used interactive logon uh, to execute a batch script that automated a multi-stage execution process. Couple of droppers, couple of, of uh, downloaders. The end result of that multi-stage execution chain uh, were two files that were created on the system. One of them was um, .inf file, that is, that is that the, the, the profile for the, uh, for the connection manager. Uh, that, that INF file was an actual implant, um, and the, the threat actor executed the uh, connection manager service to install that, uh, that profile on the system, leading to the, to the installation of the malicious implant. We usually see um, the connection manager being used by the eCrime 
uh, teams. But in this particular case, we suspect that it was the uh, targeted adversary, most likely one of the pandas. And kind of getting back to when I talked about threat profiles and how we create those tactical threat profiles, unfortunately, our threat intelligence team didn't have enough information to attribute that activity based on the data that was available at that time. But based on that behavioral and tactical level of information that we're able to gather with, um, based on our observables, based on, based on the profiles that we created, we're able to look at similar activity of that specific panda and other behavioral te techniques. And uh, it's, it's very likely that in this case, it was, it was actually the, the targeted adversary just based on the back of that, that, that research and observables that we, that we did. So it kind of allows us to apply that, uh, that threat profile to identify the, the threat actor and then use that knowledge to find other activity specific to the actor um, within the network. All right, um, next one um, is also uh, specific to, um, to uh, an adversary who targeted this time uh, a um, industrial, uh, defense industrial um, based um, company. Uh, in this particular case, the threat actor, we were asked both the incident response team, the threat intelligence team, and our threat hunting team were asked to help out. Uh, it was a pre-existing intrusion, so we rolled in into the uh, environment where the threat actor was already uh, well established, and um, we've seen the threat actor using valid accounts with scheduled tasks with PSXEC to execute and move laterally uh, on the network. But uh, one of this, the, the, the most interesting uh, findings during that intrusion was a custom tool that they used to steal and manipulate tokens, excuse me, in memory, uh, that allowed them to uh, impersonate any user on a system. So that tool, and you can see example of, ex of the execution of that tool, basically works as run as on a Windows system. You provide a username you want to impersonate, the tool you want to execute, and that magically happens through the token impersonation, in-memory token impersonation on the system. Yeah, and it's awfully kind of the adversary too to, to name their tool after what technique they were actually yeah. using, their token EXE. Uh, even APT sometimes takes shortcuts. Cool. Okay, the last uh, example here that we'll share comes from a case of big game hunting. When we say big game hunting, what we're referring to are those targeted ransomware attacks where a criminal adversary will go after an organization of, of various sizes. Uh, this example here is from a, a large international conglomerate organization that was targeted, but it could be an organization of any size uh, with, with that targeted ransomware attack. And uh, this has gained a lot of popularity in recent months, of course, with small organizations like municipal governments or public school districts, things like that, being targeted with this ransomware where an adversary goes after a particular organization and tries to spread that, that ransomware as widely as possible to lock down that network and hold it for ransom. We, we do see this type of activity quite often, and the most common types of ransomware employed in the big game hunting operations that, that we uncover when we do our threat hunting are uh, typically Ryuk or Defray or Phobos or, or Dharma. And this one was one of the Dharma cases. Dharma is uh, somewhat interesting in that, according to our, our intelligence findings, our intelligence team, they assess that uh, Dharma uh, may have some, some level of control there, but, but it's widely deployed by a number of different uh, affiliates who use that, that Dharma ransomware. Um, so even, but even though a number of different affiliates may be using it to target various, uh, various different organizations, we still see quite a bit of overlap in TTPs uh, it utilized in the course of those big game hunting attacks that, that use Dharma. Uh, some of those common TTPs are RDP uh, brute forcing, RDP password spraying to gain initial access into the environment. Uh, then they, uh, they'll all, almost always deploy the same network share scanning tool to identify potential network shares where they could spread their ransomware tool. Uh, too. They also really like to use different open source of uh, openly available tools that allow them to disable security products on those endpoints. So things like Process Hacker, PC Hunter. So anyways, you see a lot of these common overlaps. And we did see a lot of those behaviors in this particular attack, but this attack added something that we hadn't seen from the other Dharma big game hunting campaigns. Uh, and that is some modifications to the registry that, that were unusual. Some, some of those system setting changes. So what they did is they, they ran the, a command that led to uh, that registry change that you see there where they essentially changed the RDP settings to dis disable timeout. And the reason we suspect they did this is because when they land on the network, uh, on their beachhead with that RDP access, it could take them some time to ultimately achieve their, their ultimate goals. 
uh, and they don't want to lose that, that exact session access in the middle of that. It could take them, as we've seen as many evidence of hours, even days, for them to move around, escalate privileges, move laterally to, to effectively spread the ransomware to lock down the network. So they want to make sure they have enough time to do that. So they modify the registry to make sure that their RDP, RDP session wouldn't time out. And that concludes our presentation. We uh, yeah, are grateful again for the chance and happy to take any questions. If we're out of time, I'm happy to take them offline during break as well. Thank yep, you. I think we're just at time. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Carl and Piotr, thank you so much. I'll have folks uh, talk to you during break um, since you hit your time exactly correctly, hey, which is pretty tough that. to do. Thank you so much. Precision. Yeah, a couple things I really appreciated about that talk. Um, first off, you included some juicy details on adversary behaviors at the procedure level. So we always say those procedures are key, um, so I appreciate you did that. I um, wanted to just read a couple tweets. Uh, folks, Red Canary said, uh, Carl and Piotr highlighting the perils of automatically mapping threat data to MITRE attack at ATTACKCON. Automation processes don't always pick up on important context, so human reviews are important. And that struck me because that's pretty much the same thing that Jackie and Sarah said, um, almost exactly. So that was an awesome one. Um, Russell Thomas commented online, uh, camera work at MITRE ATTACK ON live stream is fantastic. Panning, zooming, and crowd flyover. Tony and I were laughing. It's, it's like the Academy Awards, but for nerds. <laughs> so that was a wonderful one. Um, then the other one I wanted to call out, is Brian Neely here? I think I saw him in the audience. If not, we will uh, chat with him later. Um, he tweeted, extremely educational and refreshing sessions overall today at ATTACKCON 2.0. Speakers from Deloitte, MITRE, Google, including myself, Tony, Sarah, Jackie, Valentina, and Ruth. All experts, all women. Hashtag women in cyber. So I just wanted to read that one. Um, thank you, Brian, for acknowledging that because it's pretty sweet to be up here with a lot of other women in cyber nailing it and looking good while we do it. So um, let's give a round of applause to all the awesome women speakers today. So with that, I'm going to move on to our next speaker. This is a great uh, use case. One of the things that we love about ATTACKCON is bringing together all of your stories about how you've used ATTACK, um, what others can learn from how you've used those best practices. Um, so Chris Thayer works at MasterCard. He's going to talk about um, a story. And again, uh, you know, the last CrowdStrike folks talked about their stories on adversaries. Chris is also going to talk to you a story about building a detection a program around ATTACK. Um, how a team of one was able to start that for his company. So please join me in welcoming Chris Thayer. Thanks, Katie. Um, and uh, I just wanted everybody to bear with me. This is my first talk in front of at any conference. So there is a... There's a small chance I may run out the door and back to my car. So, <laughs> and thanks for laughing at that. That makes a, this chance a little bit smaller. So, <laughs> um, so I just wanted to start a little bit with my background. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say which which uh, I'm afraid to hit any of the other buttons that don't look like arrows. There we go. Okay, all right. Um, so I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. So I have uh, seven years um, background in information security. Um, almost all of it's in IR, working for Mastercard. So I've worked on their started in their security operations center. I've worked on their design and architecture team. I've worked on their threat intelligence team. Um, and currently, I'm the technical lead for their digital forensics lab. Um, so overall, I am a blue teamer at heart. I remember, has anyone played StarCraft at all? I, I remember as a kid, I, I played StarCraft. I loved playing it. Um, I always had more fun building up defenses than I did actually attacking people, which is anyone who's played the game knows that's not a good way to win. So <laughs> that's something I've actually taken into my career a little bit. I, I don't do pen testing professionally, but I, I have a lab where I try to keep my skills up because I think it's important 
when we're dealing from the defensive side. Um, so MasterCard, uh, our digital forensics lab, is an NAB accredited lab, um, which means we have lots of policies and procedures we have to follow along with uh, evidence handling and chain of custody and all that. Um, there are also certain roles built out where I said I was tech lead. There's a couple of roles that are built out with ANAB procedures. So we handle everything, um, all internal investigations from malware to um, app uh, web application compromise, possible compromises. Um, as tech lead, I'm also responsible for creating new investigation procedures, uh, evaluating new software or hardware, and kind of implementing that. Um, and then on top of that, um, we recently, as uh, Katie mentioned, um, I kind of started a one-man threat hunting program there. And the reason I wanted to mention this, I don't, I don't want you to feel sorry for me because I have lots to do. I think that's a real common problem in our industry. So anything I can do to save time, any kind of automation I can do, I try to do it. And I think that there's a lot of people in that same boat kind of in here, which is one of the reasons I think we're all here in like attack because they do a lot of hard work where that can save us a lot of time. All right. <laughs> Let's try this other one. There we go. The other one is probably a little more batteries. All right. So, uh, so I wanted to kind of go over the agenda real quick. Um, so. The first part is MITRE ATT&CK doesn't need to be complex. Um, the second part that we're going to go over is I kind of just wanted to throw a definition of what threat hunting is, mainly because I think that there are a lot of different definitions out there. It's kind of been one of those, one of those buzzwords, and I think that, uh, at least for this presentation, I wanted to define it so we all kind of were on the same page. Um, I wanted to talk about our first phase, which was, I call it just before attack, um, and then phase two after attack. And then uh, we'll just go through any, if we have time, some questions and answers. Um, so I wanted to talk about, we've, uh, we've seen a lot of presentations this morning where everyone talked about implementing attack in their own way. And one of the common trends is it's complex. There's a lot to do here. We saw one of the earlier presentations talked about, you know, if you're really going to do this right, it, it probably is going to take a year at your organization. And I know most of these big organizations, everything kind of moves slow because it's not just you. You got to get a lot of people's buy-ins. A lot of this process is manual where you have to score it and map it, um, report on it, and convince everyone this is worth doing. Um, and sometimes that involves a lot of teams getting them together and make sure they work. So I kind of wanted to uh, bring our story together because I think that it's a way where you can use attack and kind of pick and choose what you use. And you can do as little or as much as you want. And you're the ones that decide, decide where to go as you use attack. I did also want to mention that even though the, uh, when I talked about us implementing it, um, we, we actually are doing that. And if you're doing that, don't stop. It's great. <laughs> this is just kind of a compliment to that. So what is threat hunting? So I recently did um, about six or seven interviews for our team with an open position. And I think every single person had threat hunting on their resume. Um, and so I asked them about it because I was interested in it because of this program. So um, one, of the, one of the guys said um, he was just making SIM alerts. Another person said they're querying their SIM for IOCs they found. Another person said they were patching vulnerabilities. Another person said they went around and were fixing bad policies. Um, and then one guy even told me he was just looking for failed logins um, throughout the environment. And all these are good. We should be doing them. But I, I really wouldn't consider any of those threat hunting. So I threw up the definition um, I found online that I thought kind of fit it be best. And it's the, proactive, or the process of proactively and iteratively searching through systems to detect and isolate advanced threats that evade existing security solutions. So I kind of also, I threw up the threat hunting loop also. I think it's important to see there. You, you start with a hypothesis. Um, you kind of investigate it through tools and techniques. Or, and you uncover new patterns. We, we talked about TTPs earlier. Um, I, I think it's important if you don't uncover new patterns too. I think that both of those processes uh, can provide you with good information. But then you kind of do analytics, you make some detections and see how can I deploy this throughout my entire environment. So really to me, I feel like the hardest part of this 
um, isn't necessarily the investigate or the analytics. We kind of do that every day in our, in our job. Um, I think the hardest part was always creating that hypothesis, trying to figure out what really is bad, what, what, are, what indicates something's bad out there. Um, and it kind of goes back to that pyramid of pain where it's, it's always easier to implement the IOC that we find than actually look for that behavior that's bad. Um, and then uh, kind of uncovering the new, new tactics and uh, techniques and procedures as they come out. I th before attack, you used to have to go through and search through a whole bunch of tweets, a whole bunch of blog posts, white papers. You have to scour the internet to try to figure out what's going on here. So uh, I'll start at the beginning of the program. So like I said, I've, I've worked in IR at MasterCard for around seven years in different areas. Um, we, um, you know, we, we spend a fair, lot of, fair amount of money on information security. We have expensive perimeter defenses. We got a whole bunch of agents going around. Um, you know, all of that, all of our logging centralized. There's uh, well thought out architecture and policy. And I, we work real hard to keep up with patching and new vulnerabilities. I thought, we're in a pretty good spot. You know, going through, we work, we work hard, we do all this good stuff. And then I went to my first DEF CON. And <laughs> I remember the very first talk I saw was uh, by a guy named Mark Newland. And it was, it was an amazing talk. He had found vulnerabilities inside common wireless mice and keyboards where he could perform replay attacks. Um, he could do this from 200 meters away. Um, and he could essentially do anything he wanted to your computer if you're using one of those uh, Meister keyboards. So he did what any DEF CON presenter would do. He, wrote, he created a small Nintendo remote and he proceeded to mess with all the other presenters. <laughs> and then the next year he came and talked about it and showed everybody. Um, un unfortunately, even after he uh, reported a lot of these vulnerabilities uh, because of the nature of those uh, those mice and keyboards, they were unpatchable. Um, so these are probably, if you go watch that talk, you could probably still do this to a lot of people today. Um, it was really interesting. So I kind of thought about this and I'm going, well, I don't, I don't have a good defense against this with all the money we're spending and everything we're doing. Um, I, I can't detect this. I would hope one of our other layers would. Maybe the web proxy would block it or the antivirus might see it. Um, but if I have this much control, I mean, I could literally write the malware on your computer with the keystrokes, uh, with the script. So it kind of blew me away and changed a lot of my worldview. And then I saw about 20 more talks after that <laughs> of all the shit that, that scared me just as much. Um, so I came back and I just thought, we, we got to figure out how, how can I do more? How can, how can we figure out how to be more secure? So everybody's kind of heard the, uh, that old saying, we're dressed for the job you want, not for the job you have. So I love this cartoon. Um, you see the boss, he's putting up the sign, dressed for the job you want, not for the job you have. And everybody comes in wearing superhero outfits and Darth Vader and Gandalf shows up. Um, so I'm not as big a fan as dressed for the job you want and, uh, instead of the job you have, but I, but I am a big fan of, in my experience, doing the job you want. Um, that will eventually turn into that becoming your job. So I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was in college, I worked for a very small woodworking machinery dealership. And uh, I uh, was actually a chemistry major in college. And so all I was doing all day there was scanning in their literature. They were in the process of making it so the salesman didn't have to carry around a briefcase that was this big. Um, and so as I was doing that, I started realizing a lot of these other people are having problems on their computers. They're just little troubleshooting problems. And I started troubleshooting those. I started dealing with network problems. And it eventually turned into, um, I, I learned ASP.NET and was doing their entire website. Um, and this kind of, this turned into a, a job they essentially had, didn't realize they needed at that time. When, when I left, they had to replace me. <laughs> so it's kind of bad. It also changed the course of my career because I stopped being a chemistry major and started looking into computers. Um, so this is what I did here. Um, I came back from DEF CON and I thought we got to do more. Um, so I started uh, meeting with teams and started brainstorming. How, how can we do this? How can we um, actually provide more security for our, for our business and for our team? Um, so I noticed one of our big gaps is we, we had a lot of agents on our host, but, but our logging wasn't that great there. Um, and we didn't have what we wanted. Um, so 
Um, that was the first thing we did. I, I created a deployable, deployable package to pull data from hosts. Um, we were pulling um, mainly auto run data, execution data. Um, this was before we had a lot of process monitoring, um, which um, from the, those guys have seen the data source and attack covers a lot. Um, so it's, it's something really nice to have, especially if it's centralized. Um, we're also pulling running processes um, and just looking for things that, you know, possible windows, windows processes that weren't, weren't spawned by the right thing, you know, SCV host, not, or SVC host not spawned by services, things like that. Um, so um, then we would take it, we'd combine it all, and uh, had a few Python scripts that would kind of analyze it. Um, and this is, it was real slow. So <laughs> we were doing it from one server we had, we were dropping executables for tools. It was, it was real slow. Um, and it was real inefficient. But at the same time, we were still moderately successful. Um, I, we found a ton of adware, which I don't care about as much, but I don't necessarily want that on the workstations. Um, but we also found two rats. Um, and that was, that was pretty amazing that two, two pretty bad infections would have sat there with, without the program. So I thought, um, I thought we're doing, we're doing a pretty good job. I like this. Um, we've been, I felt like pretty successful. Um, so I met with a, a few, I met with a team member and we decided we should make a pitch to management. See, we should be doing this full time. If we're getting this much success with just something we're doing behind the scenes, um, we should take it, take it farther, see what they say. Um, and so we set up a meeting with um, our vice president. We created a roadmap, we created a mission statement, all of these things, and kind of like a, essentially a five-year plan. Um, sat down with him, and, and he really liked it. Um, and uh, he said, I'm gonna take this up to my management. So we took it up, and they also had good things to say, but then they came back and said, well, we don't have a lot of budget. There's a lot of people asking for um, extra headcount. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the way it goes. They said, uh, so they said, well, we'll do this for you. We won't, we won't give you any extra resources, but we'll give you some time. So they said, um, so I don't know, like I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm from Missouri. Does anyone know the Missouri uh, state motto? Show me. Yeah, show me state. And that's what they said. So they said, show me that this is uh, worth a full team's time or a full person's time. I said, we'll give you some time, but uh, I want to see more. Um, so that's, that's what we did. Um, unfortunately, it dawned on me that, oh no, now they know about this, what do we do now? Because <laughs> we actually have to perform, and they're watching and expecting things. So um, I came back and decided, first of all, that as everybody knows in this industry, nothing, nothing stays static for long. Doing these same things over and over is not gonna help you. So, I decided we have to make a new program. We, we have to start from scratch. What we're doing now isn't, isn't real efficient and it's not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna keep finding new things. Um, so, oh, and I have to do that with 20% of a person. So they give, essentially gave me about a day a week they said spend on this. Of course, my other job was still there so it wasn't even always a day a week. So I had to do that with just uh, the feet and ankles pretty much. <laughs> so the, the first thing I thought, the first thing I realized is that getting a thousand hosts a month is not sustainable. We have to make this more efficient. So um, we, were, we were in the process of actually rolling out uh, some more PowerShell remoting for our admin team. And that's, that was the, that was the uh, avenue I took to start looking at this. So, um, so we started, um, I don't know how many of people are familiar with Kanza, it's a PowerShell incident response framework. Um, I'm, I'm currently using a very heavily modified version of Kanza, but um, the Kanza isn't necessarily an important part. Um, the important part is to use, that we use the advantages of PowerShell remoting. So we could do parallel processing, we could reach out to multiple hosts at once, use their resources instead of ours, um, but also because we were using PowerShell. I went from uh, deploying some executables or deploying um, other people's tools to now I have the freedom to write my own. And I can pull just about anything I want, which is great, but it also goes back to that threatening loop. I start having to do research. How do I, 
how do I figure out what I want to pull? There's all kinds of stuff, and as soon as I pull too much data, I'm going to be in real trouble because there's only, only one person looking through it all right now. Um, so that's when I found Attack. Um, and uh, it, was, it was great to me because a lot of the other frameworks I've seen stopped at, uh, stopped at techniques or stopped at uh, tactics, and I needed techniques. I needed, to, I needed to figure out, I needed something deeper that was more specific. Um, we, we started using attack with this where, because I had built out the framework there, I could write three, four lines of code in a, in a PowerShell module and pull back information that I could, that I could use on a, on a technique. And I didn't have to do it all at once. I could do it piece by piece by piece. Um, I actually, um, mainly focused on our gaps because I knew I had worked in IR there so long I knew where our gaps were and I knew constantly where we couldn't see and this was, I knew also that we were, we were fixing them but in a large organization there's a lot of change control, there's a lot of process built around infrastructure and it takes time. So a lot of times you know about those gaps for, for months before you can get a fix on and this way we could take this, write a few, write a few lines in a PowerShell script and cover that attack pretty much enterprise, or cover that, uh, yeah, that technique pretty much enterprise-wide. Um, the greatest thing here is since, uh, since this is there and it was easy now, I could do this at scale. I could, I could push it all out to, to everyone and all of a sudden we're, we're covered as opposed to deploying hardware or deploying, an, even, even an agent could be, could be rough because you have to go through the testing, we have to go through everything else. And this was, this was great because I'm minimally invasive here. I just pull the data, I get out, and. Um, then I'll see you at the next time we come. Um, low re resource cost, which is really the most important thing for me because I still had to do my other job and we had to somehow accomplish this. And attack, pull, attack was the reason we were able to do this because of all of the, I essentially shifted the resource cost from us to all the rest of the community and everyone creating these here. So it was, it was a great, as far as I was concerned, it's a great uh, switch there. <laughs> um, the other, the other great thing is that it, it covers major OSs. So, so far I've been talking about Windows, but that wasn't our goal. We wanna, I wanted to expand this out to our whole environment, which means we need Macs and we need Linux in there. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, I, I'm fine dealing with Linux. I'm not a big Mac guy. So having these, uh, having these uh, actual techniques out there where I can read them and understand them and compare them to other techniques that I might be uh, more familiar with was great. So um, this was phase two after attack. Uh, um, let's see. So there's some things that we kept going strong. I still run month monthly stints, but instead of going to uh, 1,000 hosts, I'm now collecting data from 30,000 hosts, uh, both Windows and Macs, and we have our Linux side uh, kind of in production right now. Um, and that really is, is my goal for this whole thing, is to be able to hit the entire environment and then we can slowly continually add uh, more and more uh, techniques in there. So I'll, I'll tell you right, right now, I think we're at 31 techniques, but I've proved this out enough where I actually got some help. <laughs> so we have more people helping me and we're expanding those all the time. And like I said, we, we, uh, there's been a lot of talk of threat intel and adversaries here, uh, threat actors. Um, we, I, um, I'm gonna take that back and probably do some more research there um, to the point where maybe we start uh, looking at specific adversaries that are targeting us. But right now I've, I've been trying to fill our gaps, gaps that we know about that maybe we're gonna have a solution in place but we're months away. This way I can fill that and we can go back up and say, hey, we're, we got some mitigation here until, so we can buy some time until we get something permanent in there that may be maybe a little better, maybe hitting it more than once a month <laughs> on there. Um, What's, what's also nice about this is that I, I'm boning from one server right now. Our, our plan um, is to get this closer and closer to hitting the entire environment in a week or so. Um, so the other nice stat is that we've actually been responsible for finding 15% of our malware incidents this year. And it's no longer the low risk adware click fraud. Um, we've been finding real real things that are concerning, which is even a little more frustrating to me because then they come back to my team where I have to do more <laughs> investigation and I have less time to work on this stuff. Um, oh, the other, the other great thing about this is that um, this, is, this has helped our SOC a ton. Um, so 
I, I've been, as I've made these tools, I've been providing them to our SOC. And what's great about this is that um, not only can they go from maybe manually looking at, a, looking at a workstation or a server after an alert, they can pull back this information automatically, but it also gets um, our analysts that maybe don't have a, a more experience, that have a little less experience, they start asking, why are you looking at this? Why is this part important here? And so we've increased the, we've essentially cut down the time it takes to train our SOC analysts because they can use the tools we create here and it points out areas that they should be looking at in their investigation. And so it's, it's been great for them. They've all, they all love that they have these tools now where they can do this quickly. So um, I, I wish that I could come out and say that uh, I now have run a team with our threat hunting program, but we're not there yet. <laughs> One day we may be. I'm still, I'm still proving this out. Um, we, we were a little late to the game. We started using attack. Um, I, I started the phase two probably around January of this year. Um, so um, we've had some time to get stats, but we're still, we're still working at this, still trying to get it going. Um, but I can also say that um, I wouldn't have been able to do this with the time that I had, and I wouldn't have been successful. It's without attack, without the information provided there um, that saved me so much time researching and so much time looking and proving out uh, what was going on. So, um, and, and the last thing I just wanted to hit on again is that with us using this, we can, we can implement it slowly. Um, we, can, we can pick pieces, pick and choose what we are most worried about and kind of go through there. Um, so, all right, I think, oops, I think that's all I got. Does anyone have any questions? Yep, looks like we got one here. Um, yeah, you mentioned that um, one of your f future steps is going to be looking at um, industry specific for your techniques that you cover. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know um, when you first started, just because you know some of us are in that same spot now, where did you start then and, and what was the process? Because that's one of the stumbling points I know I find myself. And like you, I stay up at night when I read everyone's GitHubs on yeah. exploits. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so I'll say I, I started because um, I started where I, where I saw gaps. So every, everybody that works over there in, in security knows where the gaps are, and they're trying to fill them. Um, but I, I, I felt like I was going into the area where um, I, I felt like our worst gaps were, our biggest gaps in coverage. Um, and a lot of those, um, I kind of mentioned earlier, we had solutions starting to come in place, but they're not, it's not quick. You know, it goes slow adding infrastructure. So I, I, um, I've kind of looked at my program where uh, my real advantage is going to be adapting quicker than the business can, and then I'll move on to the next thing um, as we provide coverage for those areas on there. Take a pause in tweeting for a moment. Um, so as, as much as from the attack team, we really appreciate seeing you know um, attack being kind of the, the Superman in a cape up there. Um, wondering what, you know, sort of um, seemed to have gone from sort of zero to success kind of really, really quickly in there. So what, what was your biggest challenge in actually implementing attack? Um, so this was a, a little easier because uh, I feel like a lot of my challenge, a lot of the challenge that other people have been talking about is convincing everyone else. Since I was kind of on my own on this, it actually made it a little bit easier to just implement it. Um, but, I, but I think some of the challenge is really that it's, it's so vast. Um, and it kind of goes back to what our previous question was about. It's just picking a place to start. Um, and for me, it was, I, I decided it was known gaps and low hanging fruit. Um, again, because of the resource issue, it was these are easy for me to detect and slowly move out farther to ones that may be a little bit harder to, to look at on there. Um, and, and I think that's really it. It's, it's, it's great because it's so detailed, but it's also really scary when you first take that look at it and you're going, what do I do? <laughs> so. You probably you. aren't alone in uh, yeah. that feeling. Yeah. We've heard that for many, many others. So if we have time for one more. Okay. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm just glad the, the other part's over. So. <laughs> first off, great first talk. Well oh, done. Thank you. Um, second of all, the, you mentioned you have the 
uh, ability for the SAC analyst to go into your, your tool, what you're calling it, to, to see what to look for and what. How, how is that all documented for them and how, can, how are they best able to go in and find out um, <laughs> what, what the uh, detection's for, why it's important to them? How, where did you keep all of that data? Um, so um, we actually just use, um, I just use an internal repository that works a lot like Git, um, GitHub. Um, so we use an internal repository. I put documentation on there. Um, I have two sets of scripts. One does the kind of the data collection and another does more analysis. And it's, I use analysis loosely because it's mainly, um, it's mainly looks for weird stuff. Because since I'm, since I have 30,000 hosts to pull from, it's real easy to go. This isn't on the others. What's, what's weird about it? And so um, that's a lot of what it does. But yeah, I, I just kind of write up. It's, it's mainly in a text file. I meet with them, talk to them about it also. But it, yeah, it's mainly in a text file on the repository. I make changes to the repository and they, they pull it down, so. Any others? If not, please join me in thanking Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure my mic is unmuted. That probably helps you all hear me a little better, huh? So thanks again to Chris. Uh, folks on Twitter are uh, loving it. Uh, Don M says, ultra mega kudos to Chris Thayer for having the raw intestinal fortitude for his per first public attack at attack. Nothing quite like jumping into public speaking uh, fire at one of the best conferences so far this year. So thanks to Don for that. Um, uh, Nicole, threat hunter girl, is joining us online watching remotely. Um, she pulled out the quote that a lot of folks did, don't dress for the job you want, do the job you want. That was such a good line, Chris, and a lot of people appreciated that. And Neil Jenkins, uh, you know, echoing the same thing, saying Chris from MasterCard lays it out, attack doesn't need to be complex. Also, do the work you want to do, and it will become your job. And Neil says, uh, great job in your first talk from one recovering chemist to another. <laughs> so thanks to those of you who are tweeting at us. Um, now that brings us to our afternoon break, which is sponsored by Trend Micro. Thanks so much to them. We encourage you to keep connecting with each other here and online. Visit our exhibitors out there. And for folks online, it's Jamie time. <laughs> Stick around for interviews with Jamie on the Attack Con couch, and I'll see you back in a few minutes. Over to you, Jamie. Welcome back to the Attack Con Couch. I'm here with uh, Valentina Pallison and Ruth Barbasil, who just delivered an excellent talk about building their own threat library. Uh, just wanted to note, uh, we really appreciate you coming all the way out here. I know Katie noted it uh, all the way from Argentina. Hopefully your travel was safe and comfortable. Okay, yeah, it was yeah. Safe. <laughs> safe and comfortable. Great. <laughs> and uh, Twitterverse, absolutely loving the feedback. I know all of you love their slide deck, the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark reference. Uh, cool points, everyone loved that. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Some really good takeaways from your part, uh, talk. Uh, I wanted to start with, um, you guys took attack and made it your own, and we really all appreciate that. And not only did you make it your own, but you also added to it. So it was really creative to see like you made it truly something to use in your environment. And one factor of that was the formula for data sources, or uh, intelligence sources. Uh, you actually, I think you pushed a challenge to the community to say, you know, this is what we're doing, what do you guys think? Um, you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, Ruth was the one with the idea, so she, I think she should explain. No, in fact, we are using a lot of sources. Uh, we have some challenges with, of, of mainly with China. We yeah. started having some challenges with that. 
uh, people usually overlap those redactors because they are using the same tool. So we started uh, knowing that we have to start uh, scoring our confidence level for our reports. So using uh, multiple sources, um, no, not knowing everyone that is writing those reports uh, have pushed us to make this kind of a formula to, to <laughs> score them. And speaking of China, um, you know, you guys are from almost a different hemisphere, basically, yeah. Yes. Uh, are there any specific challenges that you uh, deal with in the CTI field, oh, and yeah. especially Latin America? Yes, actually, uh, there's not much of a maturity level on security. I mean, we have a really good red teamings, and we have uh, red teamers and also good researchers in a more than attack phase, yeah. but there's not much about blue teaming. Even uh, we have some really great conference, but they are focused on almost, almost every, everything in the attack part. Yeah. So yeah, it's difficult to sell the idea that threat intel is important and that it's it's something that you may need to defend yourself. Yeah, yeah and it's also a challenge because uh, in at least in Argentina, uh, maybe there, there are organizations that they don't have the maturity level enough to understand yeah. what are the value of cyber threat intelligence. Yeah. So yeah. maybe that's one of the main challenges that we see. So any, uh, any recommendations or ideas you want to pitch to the community watching that like, you know, let's make some change happen. You know, we're all, we're all about attack, make the world better. Anything we can do to address these like immaturities and blue teaming and CTI in that field? Oh, well, I, I don't know, actually. I think I'm hoping that uh, if there's Latin people watching us, they start <laughs> realizing how threat intel is important, how we can apply it to a lot of defensive methods and also to practice in, attack, in an attack way uh, to improve our own def defenses of the company. But um, I think in here in the States, people is more aware about the importance of the threat intel. So yeah. it's really hard. I think that the market needs to evolve and yeah. start realizing by its own that's something that that's needs to get done. Yeah, but I think that what the attack framework provides is really important so people can understand how they can work yeah. together and talk about the same things. Yeah. And I think one of the themes we've heard is, like you said, like once you guys, especially with the product you guys built, build something and they'll come. Like they'll they'll love it, they'll see it, and they'll learn. And you kind of build that community. So hopefully that actually takes traction. And you guys have a little bit more success. Uh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. yeah, we hope to. Yeah, we hope to definitely. <laughs> so uh, just a um, personal question. Um, you guys, I mean, you CTI experts, uh, obviously, and I think a lot of the theme of the talks this afternoon have been CTI focused. What do you think about all the trends with, uh, you know, automation and data sharing? Uh, any thoughts you want to deliver as a community on those? Oh uh, well, we have seen some great projects that automate, uh, automate the adversary emulation process yeah. using attack, and I think those are great. I, I really like those. Yeah. I think. Uh, they give the frame, go make the framework uh, go one step further because it's not only about analyzing anymore; it's more than uh, doing something practical with it. So yeah, I think uh, I really like this. Yeah, but I think that anyway, it's really important to not automate everything. Not yeah. everything yeah. can be automated, and it shouldn't be like that way. Yeah. Uh, so you need people to check the information that you are using, check the assertions that the yeah. automated automated things are doing. So you can't uh, lose the spot of what yes, you are trying absolutely. to get. Yeah, yeah the, the human eye is something that's not going to be completely repair, re, um, replace it. Yeah, I think that's we're two for two on hearing the automation talks mention that. So like yeah. I said, I, hopefully like we'll never like lose sight of those like true craft and the skill that you have that we just can't like replicate. There's no way to just like put that in a computer and yeah. trust it uh, yeah. fully. Some um, part of Intel is also your gut. Yeah. yeah. So and also, threat actors are still evolving, and they know that we are yeah. trying to use this kind of tools, so they are w willing to break those uh, those uh, automation stuff. So we should keep on yeah. working on those. I know you mentioned the false flag ops. Like, um, just out of curiosity, how do you recognize one of those? Like, That's really hard. That's yeah. a lot of <laughs> lot of research. We, uh, well, actually, you find one. Uh, um, yeah, it, it also it depends on the context. Uh, I was working on a um, report about the Pakistan uh, beat, uh, hitting India, mm. uh, and they are doing the same. So they kind of trying to use the same code mm. uh, that they were hit with okay. to hit them. But yeah. So <laughs> it's really interesting because if you you have to understand that what are the the political reasons why they are doing those, and then you can spot that there is not the same threat actor, but they are using the same code. So. Yeah. It's pretty yeah, fun. It's, hard, yeah. it's kind of hard when hard the, the fun. adversary understands your attribution, like trade craft. It's a yeah, little, a little yeah. bit challenging. Exactly. Um, speaking of all the skill, though, one of the things I really wanted to uh, circle back to is 
uh, we talked about before is um, new people wanted entering the field. You're talking about you're, you're pushing the Latin community to say, we need more help here, we need more talent, we need more skill, you guys are smart, let's get a hold of this. Any advice for people wanting to enter the field? Like someone watching right now who says, hey, this sounds really exciting, I love what these two are doing, I'd really want to work in that. I think we have some advice for people, but also for companies. Mm. Uh, um, we struggle a little bit with the, the idea that everyone in a CTI team has to be an engineer. Mm. Uh, that's not true. Actually, it could be problematic. Yeah. We need people from different backgrounds because yes. uh, some of the tasks are uh, dealing with text and you need also a political background in them. So that's kind of a one thing. Yeah. And I think for uh, candidates, we will look for curiosity, own interest, people that read the news, that not only the political news, but also the cyber news, uh, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, not just they are looking for a job. We search for people that really want to, to do that kind of work because they like it. Yeah, so I think that's really important. It's not only a job. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And one of the things I really took away from your, um, your talk was like the you set the level setting saying, you know, this isn't going to be perfect. And this is what it is, and we're going to work with it, and we're going to improve later on. But I think we're running out of time, but I really appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank you. I hope this is a great experience for you both. Thank you. Um, like I said, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, before our next, com next guest comes in, it will be Carl and Piotr from uh, CrowdStrike. So AttackCon will be back in one second. Welcome back, and now I'm here with the uh, second presenters of the afternoon, uh, Carl Sharman and Piotr Voitewa. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Awesome presentation, guys. And like I said, I hope you're enjoying the conference and everything's going well. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been great. Definitely nice to sit down, take a load off. I know, <laughs> oh, yeah. I know it's a really comfortable couch. I've been here all day and I'm having a great experience. Uh, before I kick into the technicals, I had a really uh, interesting question for you guys. How much fun is it naming these actors? I know you guys like are pretty creative, and we always I love the cartoons. Yeah, I... Uh, our intelligence team is our, is the team that gets to run with naming the okay. adversaries, and sometimes we get to contribute to that a little bit. Uh, but they're the ones that that have the joy in, in getting to do that. So I personally can't take credit for any of the names <laughs> yeah. yet. I'm still hoping I'm holding out someday. I'll have enough uh, enough uh, yeah. sway with them to, to get to, to convince them to let me give a name to an Ooh, adversary. Good luck. But not yet. Have you yeah. have you done any? No, no. You have to discover your you, you have to discover the yeah. unique malware that wasn't attributed before, uh, and that's how you get to choose. Yeah, Apparently, that's, that's the rule. I'm just going to plant this seed. Jamie's a great name for an adversary. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I have no complaints there. But uh, getting into your talk, uh, one of the themes this afternoon has been CTI and automation, which you guys really um, like foot stomped and really had a really interesting perspective on. But I think what really was unique in your sense is you're not, uh, rather than the tram presentation we saw from Sarah and Jackie, you're not uh, parsing you know, finished reporting. You're parsing like 
telemetry, and like Katie said, you're actually hitting those procedures. Um, do you want to speak a little bit towards the opportunities and challenge with like parsing raw data and actually trying to automate that mapping process? Yeah, uh, it's not easy by any means because there's so much variance that can happen there. Yeah. Um, uh, there's so much data to come yeah. in, and uh, in some sense, you, you, you just we, we haven't been able to find a way that, that it can automate all of the mapping. Yeah. It just uh, it doesn't exist. But the ways we've gone about just using the detections or patterns, things that we're looking for, has really so, so far been the most effective solution we've been able to find. Um, but we, I, I view it as like uh, we are in an extremely privileged position because we do have a lot of telemetry from targeted intrusions yeah. to analyze, whereas a lot of people in the industry, you know, they're looking at their own organization and whatnot. We just, we have a very privileged view of being able to see a pretty wide yeah. scope uh, across the globe of all this uh, intrusion activity. So just that in and of itself makes me really grateful to get to do what we do and, and trying to map it all and, and automating as much as possible. There's just <laughs> still, there's, there's going to be some of that manual yeah. process nonetheless. Yeah. It seems like there's a pendulum of like, you know, we want more data and then now we have too much, we want too much, and then we just kind of like that learning curve as we explain Back and forth. Well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And like one of the points, like you said, you're in a very interesting position you guys are in is uh, I think one of the things we've, uh, key foundational points we've seen throughout the day is sharing. And you guys have like that perspective where you can go out and like you learn lessons and you scale it and you actually an iterative process, you learn from the scaling of the data. Um, so for those out there like in the sharing realm, like how, do, how would you pitch people on like, you know, building more of a community so that we can like actually take advantage of what you guys are already seeing? I think the biggest challenge with, with data sharing in general is the reduction of, of the information that is specific to a customer, uh, right? Yeah. So that's, that's the biggest challenge and the biggest issue because when you think about it, if, you know, if a company got breached and that company you know, will release information about yeah. that to the public, it might affect stock, it might affect so many different things that, you, that is out of control. Absolutely. So making sure that you can redact the information and have a common framework to share that information in between yeah. the involved parties is something crucial. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges why some companies hold back or some, some people yeah. hold back because they don't want to put their customers, you know, who trusted them as a trusted partners yeah. to release that information to, to the public or to other entities, right? So that, that kind of, you know, is a challenge by itself. And that's a hard challenge because, like you said, one of the themes for the afternoon has been context. So yeah. it's like balancing, like kind of a double-edged sword. It's like redaction and sensitivity and obviously respecting your um, whoever the data owner is versus like providing that context and being able to like, you know, paint that full picture. So that's really definitely something like I think uh, we're always interested in feedback or anything, any insights you can provide on, you know, actually finding that like perfect balance. Yeah. yeah. And even even we've considered, you know, how can we automate some of that redaction too? Mm. Because if we do want to share, it's got to be redacted. But that, you know, that's something that's so essential. We are the custodians of this data for yeah. on the behalf of our customers and we just cannot take the risk of exposing some of that more detailed telemetry yes. that maps to these techniques that's worth sharing. Just that is a huge risk um, to to share that level of detail. Yeah. And so that's why we've we've had to um, to, to limit that, we just we can't share everything. Yeah. There's just no way to to sanitize uh, enough effectively to, to share that widely. So what we do is we select uh, what's potentially the most impactful or the most useful uh, content we think from our threat hunting findings to share, and that's what goes into our public recordings, yeah, which we shared today, and uh, and that goes through a very heavy redaction. Yeah. Uh, verification review process, but there's just no way we could do that for everything that we see. Yeah. That's just a, a, That's a, a management, yeah. uh, 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 managing resources. Uh, so, so speaking of the mid-year report, um, I think one interesting thing I saw from your like examples was there's some new techniques. There's like some new like you know like the clipboard data something like you don't mm -hmm. see too often. But there's also those like oldies and goodies like those command line interface, PowerShell, all that stuff. How do you guys balance like you know you know like not jumping on like the new hotness versus like you know getting really good at those like old uh, techniques that every adversary uses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so identifying, I think that's that's the biggest challenge. And I think what was the the, the, the the cool thing about our team is really the fact that like there's so many different people with so many different backgrounds. They yeah. bring different perspectives uh -huh. and they also think about intrusions. Like, oh, this is interesting. But that, I don't really care about this. Yeah. So we bring so many different perspectives to the table. So when we actually discuss and brainstorm about, you know, what we want to include, what is unique, what is novel, what is, you know, what is different than, than something else, yeah. it allows us to have so many different perspectives and actually put that together and then yeah it actually like, you know, becomes what we, okay, so for this reporting or for this particular threat, you know, we've never seen this before. We've never seen threat actor yeah. X doing 
um, or this might be a change to the implant, there might yeah. be a change to the behavior, and we kind of try to look for those novel techniques or something yeah. that wasn't discussed in the in the open source, wasn't discussed in, in the public before. Uh, but like I said, I think everyone has a bias, yeah. uh, you know, into what they find interesting, and we try to just, you know, yeah. somehow uh, weigh that weigh that in and, and make sure that everyone has a can raise something interesting, and then we decide between ourselves uh, as a team what, what's going to be you know, put forward. Absolutely. We were just talking about that back here. It's like, unless you have perfect data, you're always going to be biased. So like we're in a constant battle of overcoming these biases. But um, final question I wanted to deliver to you guys is, I don't know if you saw Blake's come, uh, talk earlier this morning, but mm -hmm. attack is growing. Like we yeah. see sub techniques. We have all yeah. these different platforms coming out. Uh, what challenges and opportunities do you guys see in the automated mapping space uh, as we approach these new you know, domains that we've never uncovered before? especially with your uh, scale and visibility? Well, the, the, the aspect of it, of all the changes forthcoming that we, well, maybe I could probably only speak for myself, but I'm most looking forward to is the introduction of the sub-techniques. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, such a, an important um, angle that needs to be built in to give that additional layer of fidelity yeah. to understanding what the adversaries are doing. Um, categorically, it just makes more sense. You needed that additional layer of hierarchy to, uh, for things. And that's going to help us, I think, communicate things more effectively. But also, you know, for all of its pros and cons, uh, inevitably, it, the reality is that, that uh, a number of vendors use the attack framework to help showcase or validate uh, their visibility into, into threat detection yep. capabilities. Um, so I think that additional layer is, is, a, is a great um, Addition for um, for uh, you know vendors for for, for even uh, all security defenders to to recognize that hey when this product is capable of say it's capable of, of identifying this technique well now you can go that additional way. well there's a lot of implementations of that technique is it yeah. able to see all of those well now with sub techniques we're going to be able to make more informed decisions on defensive capabilities essentially I guess is what I'm trying to say so that's that's a great improvement I think that, that is going to be showcased absolutely I think one of the the main takeaways or my visually I remember from your slide deck was the uh, navigator layer with the most common techniques you've seen and mm -hmm. it was how dark CLI was and like once we can break that out maybe turn them into some light yeah. pinks and some yeah. white to yeah. so actually get a little more granularity on yep. what do you mean by that technique yeah, yeah. exactly uh, but uh yeah. carl Piotr, thank you for your time yeah, thank you jamie uh, we got to close great up talking with you yeah attack on uh we are going to take a quick break again as we transition to our next guest this will be chris thayer uh first time attack speaker um but we'll be back momentarily Welcome back. I'm now here with uh, Chris Thayer, who just delivered his uh, Attack Con talk. Actually, first time presenter. How'd that go? How'd yep. it feel? Um, it's, it's better that it's over. I was, I was super nervous. It actually wasn't <laughs> bad once I got up there, but I was really nervous this whole day, the first part of the day. So yeah. it, it's a load off my, off my chest. Well, about <laughs> three to four more minutes, and I think you're yep. good for the day. You can yep. go get some wine and uh, take it easy. You can relax. So. so I'm glad to see you didn't run to your car. We were yep. a little concerned when you uh, brought that in display. but. Um, one, actually, I just wanted to give you a little feedback. Twitter loved your quote on 
don't dress for the job you want, do the job you want. So definitely, like, you've already become, like, Twitter, like, oh, famous cool. in that sense. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, so getting into your talk, it was really, I really appreciate mm -hmm. the talk. I think you went through that threat hunting story. Um, and one thing I really wanted to touch on was uh, you mentioned you are the lead for your forensics lab. Yep. And I wonder, if was interested, um, from a forensics perspective, how does attack look? It's, like, a very different, like, we kind of focus on mitigation detections and maybe that real-time feel, but, like, from, like, retroactive perspective, how do you see attack? Um, I, I actually feel like it, it helps even in that area okay. um, because especially, so our forensics team handles, uh, like, disk forensics, but we also do some internal investigations. Yeah. So, so we have that little SOC investigation piece on yeah. there as well. Um, so there, there's been times where... I'm sitting there, I, I see some behavior I know is bad, but I can't figure out what happened. Um, and I, I can't always pull the disc. Yeah. Um, and I've actually went through attack and started going down the list. <laughs> and and it's it's helped uh, because there are, you know, it, like I mentioned in our talk there, before attack was around, this was in hundreds, thousands of places around the internet. And yeah. it was really hard unless you had 30 years experience to, to know a lot about that stuff. And now that it's all in one spot, I just kind of would, I could just kind of go through and, and make sure I was covering all my bases when I was doing the investigation there. So it's, I, I feel like it fits right in with yeah. almost everything there. So That's perfect feedback for us as the attack team because like mm -hmm. one of the things we strive to do is like make sure this is a community. And it's not just mm -hmm. a community, but a very inc like, uh, inclusive inclusive Like we'll, like anyone willing to you know, put in the effort, we're willing to bring you on and like make you part of it. And I'm sure, like you said, different perspectives add different uh, values. So we're definitely appreciative of that. Yeah, and it totally cuts down on the experience. You, need. <laughs> you know, like I said, yeah. you know, years, a couple of years ago before attack, uh, getting this knowledge would yeah. be 30 years experience or something. So it's, it's really nice for, for everyone that's coming up and learning this stuff. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know how long you've been um, working with attack, but uh, do you have a favorite tactic or technique yet? Or um, I kind of like, persistence okay. because I feel like that's one of the areas where I can get hard evidence. Some of the other stuff may be a little harder to, <laughs> to go through, but you know, you, you need persistence somehow. And, yeah. and it's nice to, it's nice because a lot of times with the persistence, you usually leave some tracks. So yeah. I, I like, I kind of, I kind of go, uh, you know, kind of gravitate over there um, when I'm doing some investigations okay. a lot of times. Makes so. sense. And speaking of evidence, uh, that one of the questions I had for you personally was, mm -hmm. uh, with threat hunting, you mentioned like developing a hypothesis, new hypothesis-based mm -hmm. testing or hunting. Uh, but how do you deal with uncertainty? Like you just said, you, you're not really sure if you're dealing with an adversary or just an admin or nothing. Like how do you really um, um, overcome that? I mean, I think it, it depends on the situation. So right. um, sometimes I just... I'll go ask the person, um, yeah. you know, give them, give them a call and say, were you doing this? Is this something part of your yeah. project? Um, but a lot of times it's, it's piecing together maybe more than, than one uh, technique. Okay. So, so if I know if, if I only see one there, I'm a little skeptical. Is this really what's going on? This, yeah. this looks different, but maybe it's not bad. But if, I'm, if I can piece together different, uh, different techniques on different tactics, yeah. I, I usually know that there's something there that I need to look uh, closer at, or it's it's kind of uh, marrying in uh, threat intel. Yeah. Um, you know, we're using attack or using another source there, uh, marrying in that threat intel. Where yeah. I know if this is to a specific group, especially, I know where to look for other pieces where I can kind of bring those together and say this is definitely what's going on. So. Absolutely, it's all about mm -hmm. painting that full picture. And like you said, yep. I, I think you mentioned three or four different skill sets. So building that community is really key. It is. It is. Yeah, and the communication between them, yeah. um, which which is one of the things I love about Attack is that it sits in the middle of all those. So you, yeah. you create that standard kind of language that you can use there. So. Absolutely. Um, one of the big things I really appreciate about your talk, and I think a lot of people, especially the attack team, are you just perked up, was you took us through the timeline of pre, before attack, mm -hmm. and adopting attack. And I think it was like a really monumental change in the way you operate, and I think you saw the results. Yep. Um, so how do you have any advice for anyone out there who wants to replicate that? Like, and how do you drive like, like your organizational change? Um, so my big advice would be take it slow and take, you know, take it chunk by chunk. Yeah. Uh, if you, <laughs> if you try to implement everything at once, it's, uh, you're either going to be working 90 hours a week or it's, it's going to fail. And I think that if you take it piece by piece, you can show the worth, uh, to management and to the rest of the teams. And once you do that, they're going to hop on board and go, this is great. And then you have everybody else, um, that wants to help you instead of everyone telling you, I want to do it my <laughs> old way. So. Missouri truly is a show me state. Love <laughs> yep, that. Yep. That was fantastic. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you for your time. Thanks. And uh, I'm actually signing off for the day, but please enjoy the rest. The, enjoy the rest of the presentations this afternoon. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow morning with the, the AttackCon couch. But don't forget to keep tweeting uh, hashtag AttackCon. We love the memes. We're documenting them all. We may actually put them on the screen tomorrow morning. So uh, thank you for your um, thanks for tuning in, and see you tomorrow.
We now return to Attack Con 2.0. Please take your seats. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I know everyone's kind of pumped about the cookies at break. Fresh baked cookies. Thanks to Trend Micro for sponsoring that. Uh, you can come in, find your seats as we're wrapping up our day one here at AttackCon 2.0. We have a series of quick talks for you. 15, 20 minutes, keep things interesting, make the speakers be brief and uh, get right to their points. So it'll be great to uh, wrap things up today with lots of different talks, some great speakers coming. So make sure you want to stick around as you come back into the auditorium here. So it's now my pleasure to um, introduce one of my teammates. I love this part. Uh, we're again bringing you these attack updates. We heard from last year that you wanted to hear a little more from the attack team. What are some of the cool things we've done in the past? What are we doing in the future? And this is a really exciting effort um, that John's been working on. Um, so John's been at MITRE. We were just chatting for 10 years now. I'm sure it doesn't feel like that long. Time flies. And in that time, he's done quite a few things from Six and Taxi, now helping on the core attack team. Uh, working on the cyber analytics repository, writing analytics, helping different government agencies use attack, as well as this effort that he's talking about, attack sightings. And I think this is going to be really interesting to a lot of you. So please join me in welcoming John Wonder. All right, thanks for that introduction, Katie. Uh, I'm really excited to be talking about attack sightings here at AttackCon especially because it was at AttackCon last year where I actually had some of the first conversations about sightings with some of you that are here today. And a lot of that conversation inspired what you're seeing up here. We, we kind of took those notes. And so when I talk about sightings today, just keep in mind that that's, that's kind of as a result of you talking about it. Um, I think it also addresses a lot of the things that we heard today, a lot of the needs that we heard today, the need to be able to prioritize defenses and the need to be able to really make our threat intelligence actionable. And so out of all of that, we've kind of collected together that, this idea for attack sightings. But before I talk about sightings, I really want to talk about threat intelligence reports. Um, threat intelligence reports are great. Um, they can tell you about new and interesting techniques. They can tell you about tools. They can tell you about what different threat actors are up to. Threat intelligence reports are really great at writing up, you know, kind of finalized, um, really detailed information about what actors are doing and what um, tools are doing and what te new techniques are out there. That said, threat intelligence reports maybe are not the best way to answer every single question we have, right? Threat intelligence reports are one form of threat intelligence, but there's other forms of threat intelligence as well. So threat intelligence reports are, you know, for example, they're, they take a long time to write. Um, you have to have an analyst write them. Um, you have to have them usually go through like legal or your marketing teams. You have to have them go through publications and be produced and then they have to get out there and then people have to read them. Um, so we see like a number of threat intelligence reports obviously, there's a lot of them, but scale wise there's not as many threat intelligence reports as there are incidents out there or as there are events out there. And so just the scale and scope of things that are covered by finished intelligence reporting is not as broad as what we see out there. And second, threat intelligence reports are really focused on that in-depth analysis of things that are new and novel, right? We're not going to be writing intelligence reports about you know, the ways, you know, adversary A used PowerShell for the zillionth time. Uh, and what that means is threat intelligence reports are great. They help us inform attack. Like, attack wouldn't be what it is without threat intelligence reports. But there is also a need for other types of threat intelligence, and that's where sightings come in. Uh, as we think about how to answer these types of questions, that's where we see these more um, sightings type of use cases. And I'll talk about what those, that means in a minute. But just think about how you would answer these types of questions today. Which techniques are more or less common? That can be tough to answer with threat intelligence reporting because are your threat intelligence reports talking about this technique because it happens more often or because it's you know, more novel and more interesting and more unique? Um, second, how do techniques tend to be used together or in conjunction with each other? This is something that have a great set of raw data would really help us answer. How do we actually see things when they happen on a box? Third, how has usage changed over time? Threat intelligence reports are often, you know, encompass data from many, many years or many months. And so it's hard to tell sometimes at more of an atomic level, what does it look like this year versus last year versus the year before? That, that needs a more atomic type of information as well. And lastly, how does prevalence differ by sector or, or things like geographic area? How do we more see 
look kind of at an in-depth level of, at exactly what we're seeing here. Again, threat, threat intelligence reports talk about this. They talk about geographic area and sector a lot. But just the breadth and depth of that report, the breadth of that reporting is not as big as it could be if you look at the scope of incidents and events that happen out in the world. So this is where we see attack sightings fitting in. Uh, I've used that word a bunch of times now. What do I actually mean by that? So when I think about attack sightings, I think about observations that provide evidence that an attack technique is in use. Wouldn't that be great to know, to have evidence when an attack technique is, is in use without having to go read all of these threat intelligence reports necessarily? Um, we can think of a couple different types of threat intelligence reports as well, or sorry, of sightings as well, so a direct technique sighting. So if you think about the different ways you might have evidence of a attack technique in use, one way is you're looking at your logs uh, and you're digging in there and you're seeing actions happen on your systems and networks that directly correspond to an attack technique. So for example, if I'm looking at credential dumping and I see, for example, a memory read of LSAS.exe, that is direct evidence that credential dumping has occurred on that machine. That's really great evidence that that technique happened. But there's other types of evidence as well, right? We might not have something quite that conclusive, for example. So Mimikatz is a tool that's capable of doing credential dumping. What if Mimikatz is blocked at the firewall? Uh, we blocked it by download because we have a known hash for it or something like that. That's not quite as good as the evidence um, as seeing the actual memory dump, but it's a pretty good indication that our adversaries are trying to do credential dumping, right? If you see Mimikatz being blocked at your firewall. So direct software sightings are kind of this idea that we've seen a piece of software that enables us to do a technique. Indirect software sightings are really getting at this concept of um, tips and threat intelligence reporting that goes through kind of more automated sticks taxi mechanisms. So maybe I see an indicator shared for Mimikatz.exe. I didn't see it myself. Um, I don't know that it actually, whether it was a successful attack, whether it was not successful, I don't know exactly where it happened. But the fact that somebody is sharing a hash for Mimikatz tells me that that is probably in use and therefore that the adversaries are looking to do credential dumping. So hopefully you can see that while these are different levels of evidence, some of them are really great direct evidence of a technique occurring, others are more indirect evidence. Uh, it's still evidence that a technique is in use in the real world. And that's really what we want to get at with attack sightings. We at the kind of the attack team feel like something that will be really useful is more direct evidence of attack techniques in use in the real world. And that's what, that's what this idea is about. So in order to help enable that, in order to make that happen, um, we kind of proposed this idea of attack sightings. And I've talked to some of you about this, and I'm happy to talk to more of you about it today if you come find me after. Um, but what we're, what we're proposing now is MITRE collects sightings from multiple organizations. So we take in some of these sightings. When you think about a sighting, so I talked about those three types. Think about you know, that type of sighting, technique ID, maybe tactic ID, timestamp maybe, and maybe some other metadata. And so that's what really what we're talking about when we talk about a sighting. What if MITRE collected a bunch of those? Um, they were anonymized at some level either before or after they get to MITRE. And then we can kind of aggregate them and, and make intelligent kind of decisions and reports based off of those things. We could publish insights. And ideally, if we get a good amount of data and we feel like it makes sense, we could also publish um, data sets that help researchers like yourselves figure out insights that we at MITRE maybe couldn't ever figure out. So the idea here is to kind of collect this sighting, create the sightings ecosystem where we're constantly collecting telemetry about what attack techniques are in usage in the wild and republishing back, that back out, both in terms of insights as well as more in terms of raw data. You can imagine it looking like this. So along the left side, um, you can see the kind of the systems that are under attack, basically. So all of our individual laptops, all of our servers, all of our infrastructure, and we're doing security monitoring on those things. And that security monitoring is hopefully, when we have an attack, going to lead to detections. At some level, those detections will create reporting, right? So we can do reporting of those detections. That might happen through your ISACs or your ISOs. Maybe you have an MSSP or a security vendor or something that you're working with. And that, that point right there I really want to highlight because if you're working with those ISOs, your MSSPs, that's a great way to anonymize the data before it gets to MITRE. Uh, one thing MITRE doesn't necessarily want to do is be responsible for collecting a lot of really sensitive data about where techniques are seen in the wild at specific organizations. We're happy to work with you if you are one of those end user organizations and you, are, and you do want to contribute what you find, but we think it makes a lot of sense really to look at the ISACs and the ISOs and the people that are collecting data from multiple organizations at the same time 
so that they can do the anonymization for us. We'll continue to look at it in an anonymized way. We'll try to aggregate it. We have some people that are privacy experts and can also look at how to keep it from being um, de-anonymized. Uh, and then the idea is that we can publish those insights. So that's kind of the operating model that we're hoping for here. Uh, in this, we have three communities of interest that we really want to help uh, enable and protect. So one is contributors are probably the most important part of this ecosystem. They are the people that are providing information of value. MITRE is not providing information of value here. So the contributors are really the most important part of this community. And so we want to make sure that, A, they're able to really easily contribute, B, they're protected from disclosing too much information, and C, that they're acknowledged for providing something of value. We want to give people credit when they give information that helps the community, even if we do anonymize it. Second, we want to be able to uh, help defenders. So that's most of us here are defenders, whether we're threat intel analysts or whether we're operators or whether we're hunters. Uh, we want to help us prior, we want to be able to help uh, defenders kind of prioritize actions, prioritize what threat intelligence they do look at to see more information. We want to help them understand and communicate the value of their work. It's really easy to communicate value if you can say, well, I now have a detection for this thing that happened 10,000 times last year or X number of times last year, more so than here's this thing that I saw in a couple of reports. And lastly, we want to help them change based on, uh, change their defenses based on what we're seeing changed in the adversary behavior. Lastly, we want to help researchers. So there's a lot of great research that's happening in the cyber defense space. And a lot of that research needs good data. And I think by publishing some of these data sets out, we can enable that research by anonymizing it and making sure that the contributors are safe, but also giving researchers what they need to do their jobs. Uh, you know, helping them develop new defensive approaches, um, understand how adversary usage may differ by sector. I think we all kind of internally think that and know that probably a finance sector is attacked differently than defense industrial base. But it would be great to have data that kind of proves that, right? Uh, so we're not just relying on our own intuition. Uh, and lastly, to do things that I can't even think of. I needed three bullets on each of these columns, so I need some researchers to come up with a third item here. <laughs> So how can you contribute? Uh, we wanted to make it as easy as possible. First is email us at attackatmitre.org or find me after the break or find any MITRE team member. We're happy to hook you up. We want to make this as easy as possible to contribute. Um, you'll need to generate some data. We have a data format that we defined. It's kind of a pretty straightforward JSON format. You can create that yourself. Um, MISP uh, was great enough. If you know the MISP developers, you tell them an idea and they have it developed within the next day or two. Uh, and that was the case here. We talked to them about sightings. And as of now, you can use MISP to export sightings out and then contribute that back to MITRE. Or if you have something else you're using, if you're using sticks or if you're using CSV files, send us whatever you have um, and we'll take it. We're basically willing to, we care about the data. We don't care necessarily what format you get us the data in. Um, and then send it to us. I did want to call out some related work here. Um, first of all, Red Canary released a threat detection report last year. Uh, and if Twitter can be um, trusted. I guess they're releasing another one soon. Uh, that talked about the top 10 techniques that they found in the wild. Uh, and they also gave great tips on how to find those techniques when you see them. Second, uh, Carl mentioned the CrowdStrike Overwatch reporting before. They've released two reports with two different heat maps. One thing I thought they really did that made a lot of sense in their second report, the mid-year report that they just released recently, was they talked about changes from the 2018 report to the 2019 mid-year report. And also, where you maybe should not take some of those changes as seriously, because there might be issues in some of the data. So they thought, we're pretty thoughtful about what changes actually mean. And maybe some of the changes aren't as significant as they seem. Uh, and lastly, Veris. So Veris does a lot of like incident metadata type of work. Um, the demographics of incidents, we think this is complementary to that. So current status is we're collecting sightings under NDA. Um, you don't necessarily have to sign an NDA to contribute sightings. We find that many organizations want to just to help protect themselves with the goal of having more contributions over this year um, and eventually move towards having those insights being able to be published. All right, that's what I got. Thank you. Here's a URL you can go to get involved. Email us. Come find me after. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. So what we might do is we are right on time, actually. You finished uh, right on the dot. Thank you for that, John. So sure. John will be hanging out at the reception, I believe, tonight as well uh, and tomorrow. So uh, please come talk to him. Uh, we want your data, and we'll anonymize it. So <laughs> thank you so much, John. Yeah. A question I always get as the threat intel lead is, well, like, can you track industry? It was to the question Ivan asked earlier. We want to sort these groups and these techniques by industry. So with something like sightings, we could actually do that kind of exciting.
I wanted to call out a tweet, um, Avkash K, who I think is still watching from Mumbai, and I think it's like 1.30 in the morning there or something, so um, you said citing something really cool project coming up. Collaboration is key, and this will definitely encourage that. So all the way in India, they hear you, John, that theme of collaboration. We now move on to our next speaker, Alan Thompson, who's the Chief Te Technology Officer at Looking Glass. Um, this talk caught our eye as the program committee because it focuses a little more on the network side. Um, so often folks think about just the endpoint when they're mapping to attack or looking for these different behaviors, which, yeah, there's a lot there, but you can also get some bang for your buck in terms of network devices, things like Zeek. Um, Alan uh, leads technical strategy, architecture, and product technology across all of uh, Looking Glass Threat Intel. He's also heavily involved, a key contributor to uh, the STIX version 2 standards and co-chair of the STIX Taxi version 2 interoperability subcommittee. So does a lot of work there as well. Um, please join me in welcoming Alan Thompson. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So uh, whoever organized this calendar for this uh, session did an awesome job because John Wonder did uh, a great setup for my uh, presentation. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, Zeek and how we, uh, at Looking Glass, we, we started a research project to really understand how can we do uh, threat detection and potentially mitigation uh, in new innovative ways, particularly as uh, attack talks about how behaviors is really important, uh, technical indicators is really um, important but n insufficient. And so we were looking for a way to be able to up-level the ability to create um, detection. And as I was preparing this presentation, the presentation actually morphed from showing you some metrics to more to what we learned as we went through it. And hopefully uh, these lessons that we learned as we went through it uh, translate to uh, you know, some, some uh, lessons that you can maybe apply to your environments. I want to cover three things. The first is give you a little bit of background on Zeek. How many people in the room uh, know Zeek? Oh, wow, awesome. Uh, I've, I've, I've uh, asked that question in other rooms and it was like, uh, um, The next one is talking about how we prepared our data to actually interact with both sticks and intelligence and attack, and then how do we use it to correlate in a real world environment. From a background perspective, Zeek's been around for a long time. I think given the, the number of people in the room, I, I think I'm repeating things that people already know. I want to highlight something that Zeek uh, really was attractive to us. It was really uh, open source, a lot of contributions. That it was incredibly interesting to us uh, because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to build upon that excellence that's already in this open source community. And we also wanted to look at how we can scale it out to uh, any software environment and uh, any number of different uh, capabilities. These are some of the things that we get from Zeek uh, as part of both detection as well as potential mitigation. So you can see basic network uh, protocol stuff, but uh, hopefully you can see some of the important things that you can start to do with uh, integration with sandbox, integration with intelligence, and some of these higher level behaviors such as brute forcing, fast flux, et cetera. These are some of the things that the open source community in Zeek have contributed. Uh, they may or may not be applicable to your environment, but the key thing is that uh, they're available as a reference if nothing else. From a basic perspective, this I'm just gonna expand right out because everybody knows how Zeek, or most people know Zeek. The key point here is that Zeek is uh, not just an analysis tool, it's also embracing an SDN approach to deployment. So you're able to deploy a controller which advises or uh, pushes policy and control out to the individual network uh, nodes. That this is a very simplistic example, but the key point here is that Zeek is receiving a copy of all traffic and then is running analyzers on that traffic. From a more advanced perspective, and this is where it starts to get really interesting, is that Zeek actually embodies a, a distributed system. It's built upon the actor framework and the ability to start to have multiple nodes starting to act on events and then collaborate to understand behavior and potentially correlate information becomes really interesting when you want to scale this capability out. In reality, a production environment is not as simple as the, that diagram I showed earlier. It's typically much more complicated and if I can point, the key point here is I want to be able to deploy Zeek detection in all these environments, not just on the perimeter, not just in the DMZ, 
not in the cloud, but everywhere. And so if I'm designing a capability to detect these sightings that John was just talking about, I don't want just the sightings on the perimeter. Most of my firewall is probably blocking that anyway. What I want to understand is what sightings am I seeing inside my network, inside the cloud. And so I need to be able to do that uh, using a capability. And Zeek is actually very well uh, designed for that. So some of the things that we did when we started doing this project to employ Zeek to be able to detect things was the first thing is we had a lot of intelligence. Uh, and I don't just mean a data lake. I mean continuously monitoring lots of different data. And what we wanted to do was how do we correlate that intelligence with attack and then use it in Zeek. So we started with the assumption that we're going to use STIX2. As uh, you know, pre my intro said, I worked a lot in STIX2. And STIX2 is fundamentally a really important standard to embrace in your intelligence. Most intelligence providers out there do not support STIX2 natively today, sadly. Most of them will have their proprietary formats and are slowly adopting STIX2, but we, we wanted to start with STIX2. Next one is how did we relate it to attack? We use STIX2, and I'll show you an example in a second. How did we correlate the activities that we're seeing in Zeek back to the intelligence and back to um, the environment? And that was Zeek. We used that, and I'll explain how we did that. And then finally, which John mentioned or touched on, is how do you then, when you detect something, how do you then act on it? This project was much more than just detection. It was actually about how do we then enforce mitigation. Uh, but I'm not presenting on that today. I'm just highlighting that we also did uh, use Zeek for that aspect. We have over 90 different individual data feeds, commercial, proprietary, open source, uh, lots of different uh, formats. We built that over many years to ingest all that data. Uh, the key thing here is there was about 1,800 unique intelligence attack patterns, intrusion sets, actors. Though that's not like instances. That's unique individual pieces of data that describe those attack patterns. The challenge that we first met was, well, how do we map that to MITRE attack? And so what we did was we came up with this very simple JSON uh, technique where we say for a particular attack pattern, it maps to this tactic and these techniques. And the reason why we did that is because when we ingest the data, we want to be able to correlate all of the different intelligence that we're receiving in STIX2 back to MITRE so that when we report or create metrics, we know exactly which tactic and which technique this particular piece of intelligence when we detect in the network is being seen. An example, this is an attack pattern, an actual attack pattern. It sticks to format. Uh, this should not be unfamiliar. Uh, we map the tactic using the kill chain. MITRE attack does the exact same thing in their uh, definition of attack. And so we just copied it. And what we did was we applied it to our STIX2 intelligence object. So we have an exact mapping to the tactic in our intelligence. So in this case, core flood. We did that across the 1,800 different things that we did using that data mapping technique. The second thing is that we found that we wanted to map it uh, through relationships to the MITRE attack UUID. So they publish all of their data using uh, global IDs. Uh, one criticism, by the way, if you're looking for input is uh, we used names, uh, but the challenge was finding out what name matched that UUID is actually a real pain in the ass. <laughs> so so to, doing that for every single technique uh, is really hard. And if you had a dictionary that said took a common name and mapped it to the UUID, it would be so much easier. But that's what we did. So we, what we did was we map all of our intelligence back to the MITRE attack. So when we saw an instance of a particular piece of intelligence, we knew exactly which UUID and attack pattern in attack, as well as our own intelligence, was matching. And therefore, we could generate metrics from that. So that's kind of some of the data prep stuff. And I got six minutes left, so hopefully I'm going to make it. Uh, the, the next part is around, I'll expand the question. An intelligence question, which uh, might seem a, a little esoteric, but the key point here is this is a typical intelligence question that you want to ask and get an answer to. You're not just asking about IP. You're also, you're also asking about you know, sector. You're also acting about active versus inactive. You're also asking about which IPs map to FQDNs, which, which uh, have active threats, not just historical threats. And then you want to know which attack patterns map to those things. 
This is a simple query, but if you're doing it on a big data lake and you're sitting drinking coffee and you, you don't have to respond in real time, you got forever to answer it. We don't. We have to answer these questions really, really quickly at very high scale. The problem is that many sources uh, represent essentially the same data. Many have the same data across temporal series, which mean, makes it more complicated to be able to answer questions at scale. And then ultimately, all of these differences in how the data represented, just because they use sticks doesn't mean to say they've actually normalized everything. And so one of the things that we found is even although we mapped everything to sticks too, we still didn't really have a normalized data set. So what we ended up doing is coming up with a data model that asserts facts about entities. And by normaling, normalizing sticks to MITRE ATT&CK and all of this information in this fairly simplistic model, it allowed us to uh, answer questions that, like that intelligence question really quickly. And that became or is really important when you start to do metrics at line rate in the network, uh, as I showed earlier. So a little bit of example. By modeling that all of the data that we ingest, we went from, you know, this is typical, 150 million records a day. That's probably small for some people. Uh, we reduced it to 19 million records a day just by remodeling the data in the entity fact uh, assertion capability. We went from 150 gigabits a day to 25 to 36. 30 uh, gigabits a day. That makes that might be small in a, a single day. Multiply that by 30, by 60, et cetera. Uh, you, you, you can hopefully see the problem there. So uh, back to uh, Zeek. So model it and entity fact really helped both correlation and, and performance. But Zeek actually comes with at least a basic intelligence framework to be able to identify intelligence. This is this part up here. And they have an int a Zeek in-memory Intel store that uh, you know, records what intelligence is being seen. All of that correlation, all of that sticks ingest and mapping to attack, uh, we built that uh, correlation over here. And then whenever we see a correlation from a particular event, we map it back into this database. So what we were able to do is take the advantages of all the intelligence and all of attack and put it back into the intelligence store. So let me, I got about three minutes left, so I just want to give you a basic example of an, a simple uh, attack event. I'll expand it out so I can explain it. So this is a typical event. Uh, it's got a lot of information here, but you can see which network it was in, what aspect of traffic was detected, what Intel feed produced the information, what labels are associated, what destination network, what attack pattern. Why does all this matter? First thing is, you can understand gap analysis. So you can start to see where in the network you're, you have coverage or you don't. Uh, that's important if you're trying to provide complete coverage across your entire enterprise network. What applications are you seeing? Uh, are you seeing specific ones or only a subset? Again, that's important for coverage and metrics of uh, analysis. What intelligence, you know, what data are getting the most hits? What intelligence is most relevant to your environment? What attack phase, and so this is where we, that data modeling, data prep aspect really kicks in here. We're able to tie it back to the MITRE attack framework to say which attacks are we actually seeing back to John's, you know, citing aspect. Uh, what classification information that uh, uh, speaks to the relevance and the prioritization that John also mentioned. And also, uh, how do we correlate uh, against other things? You know, for example, which patterns, et cetera. And finally, I just want to summarize. Our experience was that Zeek was incredibly flexible and useful for doing this cross-correlation across intelligence, detection in the enterprise environment. Uh, it really was useful to prepare and model the data up front and then make sure that the correlation could be optimized for very large scale and high speed. And with that, uh, I just want to call out to whoever put an ampersand in attack. Little inside joke, but anyway, uh, I, with that, I will take questions. I think we are just at time, actually, so please join me in thanking Alan. Thank you. 
And a great tweet that came in that kind of made me giggle, do you even Zeke bro from uh, Crash and Burn 23? So we like those There's nerd, nerd jokes there. Thanks to Alan for that. Um, now moving on, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Bob Rudis, who is chief, a chief data scientist at Rapid7. Um, his talk uh, immediately caught our eye because visualization is tough and doing good visualizations is very tough. But um, he's released an open source tool, which we always love as well, sharing with the community our theme of community and open, um, open tools that everyone can use, uh, continuing that theme today. So on that note, please join me in welcoming Bob Rudis. Uh, so this is a talk for, mo I, I think it works for everyone, but it's kind of geared towards service providers and large organizations. So if you're in one of those two categories, could you raise your hand? Cool. Hopefully, the, as this package evolves, and maybe you might use R. Actually, how many people use R, too? Because this is going to be an R-focused talk. Good. There's nice. There's a nice tiny focus in there. Um, so uh, this is what I'm trying to do is like take some of the practices we're doing internally open source them and give tools to folks out there so we can all make security better at organizations, like help organizations have better security outcomes. And uh, so just quickly about me, um, for about 20 years I had a real job like most of you, and then I did this thing called the, the Data Breach Investigations Report for a couple of years, and now I'm uh, Chief Data Scientist at Rapid7, and I don't have a real job because I'm not actually out there in the trenches having to do hunts, having to actually keep organizations safe every single day. Um, I work at Rapid7 Labs where we do lots of research and we do lots of reports and I do lots of work work, but you guys are kind of the unsung heroes um, of security. There's a really old book out about this stuff called Data Driven Security. It's really, it is like five years old. I, I feel real old because of that. Um, and um, if you also would like to play with some data, opendata.rapid7.com, we basically give away all of our scan data. So if you want to have at that, it's all yours. Just sign up and go to there and we'll do that. And for folks that use R and don't know my R stuff, there's about 90 packages out there that are related to cybersecurity stuff. So have at that as well and, and keep out there. And there's another one now. Um, so this is like my obligatory MITRE attack slide. I, I've been talking about attack publicly for about a year now. Um, actually, attack kind of kept me in cybersecurity. I was getting really down about cyber um, for a while. And then when attack came out, I got like really invigorated again because it was filling a really missing gap everywhere. And we've really embraced attack at Rapid7, um, especially within Rapid7 Labs and our managed detection and response practice where we kind of deal with a whole bunch of organizations and dealing with response for those folks. And for a while we were hand coding, I think everyone's probably felt this pain, hand coding our incidents and the detections uh, from the environments and from the hunts people did to attack. Starting um, in January of this year, that is an automated process very similar to the couple other automated processes that you've heard up here. So. I love that theme that I've heard today. Whoever organized this, again, did an amazing job because like, it cascades down really well. You can do the automation. It actually will work, um, and it's actually pretty cool. Um, and I'm gonna, kinda get, I will show you some of the results from that here. Um, if you want to see attack-based reports, our quarterly threat reports, starting with, especially with this quarter, are all basically doing attack-based metrics and no other type of metrics that are out there except for the stuff that we see in, in, in our global uh, honeypot network. Um, so, Attack is kind of used mostly on red and blue teams right now. At least that's the way I've been seeing it used as I talk to folks. There's, you get, you're out there in the trenches, you're doing the work, you're either defending, or you're like in the pen test team or the red team, and you're actually trying to go out there and do things. Um, but you know, those are two ways of actually using it. But it actually, you know, I don't see attack being used at the layer eight team a whole lot. Um, it, they're also not very colorful at the layer eight team. And so my goal with this one, and we do this on a regular basis, is to try to use attack at a macro level to convey what's going on across all of our customers and then to each of our individual customers and then at an industry level so that we have the ability to kind of give an idea of what's happening, what's missing, and I'll kind of go through some of that right now. Uh, so if th this is all the slides are online. Um, I'm, I'm not a big GitHub fan, but I think everybody else is. So I stick my stuff everywhere so that you're not locked into a closed platform. Um, sorry, one of those guys, yeah. Uh, so it's all out there and all this stuff is out there and you can grab it from there. We'll, we'll give you a high level view of it now since we don't have a whole lot of time to go into detail. So why R, first of all? Um, we, it's why R because I like R, so I program in R. I program in everything, but I kind of program in R. So but why am I doing this in R? Why am I trying to get you to use R to do this stuff? So this is R. It's, it's open source just like all the other things that you probably use R. Um, it's mission built for doing data science type tasks which include visualization and other types of analysis. In this particular case, it's got a very rich ecosystem for doing data, uh, data visualization, and that's one of the things I like to actually try to do with it. 
And R isn't just R. Um, much like Python and other tools, R can do lot, interface with lots of everything. So it, every one of those lists up there, plus the ellipses, R can interface with pretty much any other language out there. And you can use it really effectively and a lot more effectively than you can those languages from other languages. So if you haven't tried R, I encourage you to give it a shot. But if you're going to use R, you really need to use our studio. Um, and I'm doing this, like, so I'm not even pimping our studio. It's a, it's a free product as well, too. And the reason why I'm saying to use this one, it really makes R kind of like, and, I, and this is the way I kind of use it, and there's other folks that use it this way. It's kind of the best DFIR investigations console ever made, and even though you don't know about it. Um, so you can do all sorts of stuff within it. It's a source code editor. You can execute things line by line. Uh, I'm going to talk about notebooks in a second. So if you're a notebook fan, you can do stuff in a notebook format. Um, and if you want to use your favorite language instead of R in it, you can, even in, in like kind of REPL format as well, too. So R Studio is a great environment for doing all sorts of things. It kind of wraps R up and kind of gives it more, even more superpowers than it already has. So more reasons for why I use R, so I'm going to calm down a little bit now. Um, R Markdown is one of the main reasons why I think R and doing things within an R context work really well. Um, R Markdown, there's two flavors of it, a notebook format. So if you're one of those weird Jupyter Notebook fans, this is kind of like that. Um, I'm not a big notebook fan. I think browsers are for browsing and you know, real things are for real things. So uh, <laughs> just a little opinionated, that's all. Um, but you can also like, write code up reports that you can actually write in here too. So one of the things you actually get with this, which I'm going to show you, is like an already pre-built canned report for actually generating some initial high-level visualizations that will get expanded over time as the package increases. Um, so R Markdown is really cool, and it isn't limited to just the R language. You can do Python stuff in it. You can do Scala stuff in it. You can do anything you want to in it. It's very expandable, um, and it, it kind of does a whole lot of things. Uh, it can also do application building. It's a really, really simple application building interface that ties code and code logic and presentation together in a very straightforward way so that you have the ability to create interactive presentations. And one of the goals of this, as you'll see towards the end, is I'm going to help build an app so that you can actually have the ability to do this without coding. Um, so I, I, why, so what, what's the purpose of attacker? So some of the initial purposes of it are to answer questions like, what does the distribution of tactics and techniques look like across my customer base, within a customer, in a particular industry, however you want to slice up the categories? Where do we have technology gaps, either as us a provider or as organizations? Um, where do we have workforce gaps? And I'll talk about that a little bit down. Um, where should we invest our limited budget in, de in certain defense technologies or certain defense processes? How does this thing compare with that thing? And that could be anything, like these tactics usage against these tactics usage, or this, uh, this um, uh, attacker, use, attacker uses of tactics versus this attacker. You can do all this because we have the ability to now kind of put things into a, into a particular format. Um, I end with what's the dwell time trend as well, too. I'm a really big fan of dwell time. And in the, in the DBIR, we, we call that the detection deficit. Um, I have to call it dwell time because we call it dwell time at work. So that's what I'm going to do there. Uh, so one of the things you get with this um, is a kind of pre-built set of things that make it easier to use um, the CTI format. Um, I think as the previous speaker just said, you can stare at the CTI JSON. It's like looking into the heart of the TARDIS. It's beautiful, but it will drive you mad. Um, and it's not very suited for data science tasks at all. Um, as I was telling Katie before, I'm really not a big fan of Excel, but I'm a big fan of rectangular data. So I've rectangularized a lot of the CTI data stuck it into here so you can use it. Plus, I provided other tools and mechanisms for you to take that data and enable it to do other kind of data science tasks with that or visualization tasks on there. So I'm not going to go through those all in here. I wanted to put it here as like a teaser for what you can do with it um, to have it out there. Uh, prim but the thing about this is, is every time MITRE updates um, the CTI format, this goes out, grabs it, rebuilds the package, re retidies all the data, and puts it back out there so you have no work on your end to kind of go do this. Uh, so what I did for the stuff I'm going to show you today is we use, like, we actually use MITRE, uh, the MITRE attack uh, our framework, and we code all of our incidents in it, like I said. Some of it's through automation. Some of it's through the hunt data that the folks actually do themselves for things. Uh, this is a sample of JSON that I'm using that's kind of the foundation of the data that I've got all the visualizations based on here. Don't get hung up on this JSON. I'm going to support using whatever you guys want. So whether it's the sticks uh, format or whether it's the new MITRE attack format for doing like the, sh the sharing of these uh, things that's going to be out there. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that like Veris and attack have some kind of love child that gives us the, the ability to have a really cool data set that gives us the, this macro view of these things as well. Um, so V2 of attacker or V0.2 of attacker is like, what, what do you get out of the box with this one now? And you're going to get the ability to analyze dwell time metrics uh, produce attack heat maps in a way that I like to produce them, and I'm hoping to convince you of this. 
Um, and also a way to look at what I call cumulative attack tactics distributions. It's a fancy sounding thing that hopefully won't be too complex. The thing on the left is one giant HTML page that got generated through an R Markdown report. The, what you see copied and pasted across all over there are some of the expanded sections, so let's just go through some of them instead of actually trying to stare at that screen. Um, so this is all, you basically load up, you create, this is all done by actually just going into the package, starting a new R Markdown file that's based on this template, giving it your data, and then it magically makes all these charts for you. So you don't have to do like, literally any work except get your data into the format. Um, so I took a sample of all of our incidents I created a so actually I took all of our incidents. I created a distribution based upon all those incidents, and then I created a, a like a selected sample of that distribution for putting into the package. So you get real life incidents, or at least a, a picture of real life incidents based on the distribution of incidents that that we've actually seen. With me removing some things so I could have some talking points today. Um, so one of them, one of the here is you get to see dwell time uh, based upon this incident data set. And the cool thing about this is, is like the whole idea is you want to actually reduce dwell time, right? So like you get the ability to show these reports, have them available, and also look at them over time. So this is looking at, that was for the overall one, this is looking at it by quarter, um, and then it's looking at the overall, and it's a little harder to see with the, the colors, but it's, you basically get um, the over time view of how you're doing with the dwell time, so you can communicate that back to show how well your technology is doing or how well your folks are doing, uh, kind of working at these things. Um, you can generate that in a bunch of different ways. So there's a heat map view of doing the dwell time as well. Um, and then you can actually look at it uh, more specifically, and this is a better view of the other one, kind of look at dwell time specifically by month instead of by quarter. So lots of slicing it different ways. If you want more views, submit an issue. I don't care where in those repos you do one, just submit an issue. I'll be glad to put it out there. It's actually not that much work. It's also not that hard to copy and paste the template code to do it yourself. So I love this, this heat map versus the ones that I've seen generally produced, which shows the entire framework, and then you've got like little things colored here and there. So what I've done is created a way to, with one call to one R function, generate a heat map that's sorted by the most, you, the, the, the most occurred uh, technique within um, that particular tactic, um, and then put it out there. You can do it proportion like this way, or you can do it proportionally. You can do it over time. I'm going to go back to this one real quick. Um, so what I've also done on here is I've deliberately left out some things that we had because you get to immediately see gaps, right? So you know that this is nowhere near as big as the, the entire MITRE attack framework. You also see that privilege escalation, discovery, and exfil are missing from this particular one, and I did that on purpose. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about why that's important in a minute, but being able to see where things aren't there is almost as important as seeing where things are uh, or wh what things are where because you might have to deal with what those gaps actually are out there. Uh, so you can see it over time as well, too, to see what's changed over quarter. Um, and so I wanted to kind of go to this one and almost land on this one. So this is a cumulative attack distribution, and the, the, the numbers are a little harder to see. It's probably easier online. Um, you can grab the slides and look at it. So what I've done is it accumulates all of the tactics that have occurred, all the techniques within a tactic that have occurred, and we basically sum all those up. We get the percentage of those, and we just add, add, it, add those over since we actually have a really nice open source um, uh, I can do this really nice open source kill chain that we can use to see the things progress over to each individual category. Uh, so what you're seeing, and I think there's a, there's a button, actually there we go. So you can see there's, there's gaps in privilege escalation and lateral movement, and what we can do at work, which will eventually be in the package, is drill down into both what's in each individual category, so what are you finding versus what aren't you finding, but then you also get to see like what isn't there. So why isn't that stuff there? And it's a great conversation to have about maybe your the folks that your customers might have technology gaps, like they might not have detect things that detect things that are feeding into your environment to be able to find these things. You may have gaps in your log parsing for those things, or you may have incident responders that don't like to deal with those types of events and just kind of ignore them. Uh, so this gives you a, re a way to identify those areas and, and see where they are and kind of maybe have some like more, more tools at your disposal to investigate and dig into things a little bit better. Um, then you can also do really cool things like for us, do it by industry. Um, so again, it's a little harder to see, but this is basically a combined uh, cumulative graph that shows how each individual's industry tactics and techniques distribution looks compared to each other. It's pretty much like, you know, there's a similar pattern, but some of them look a little bit differently. I did sort of jury rig this one to make it look differently. Um, but this way you can see what's happening across all of those um, and have the ability to, to do more stuff. So what are we gonna do? We're going to add more charts. We're going to add more um, discrete timestamp support, more functions, hopefully get you to a point where the zero coding skill is required, um, and give you some event stream analysis. So basically, think MITRE attacks with incidents, and then do click stream analysis on that to be able to do really interesting distribution checks against what might be the most prevalent thing in your environment and why. And I got 30 seconds.
Nailed it. Well, please join me in thanking Bob. Thank you. We'll be continuing on this theme of open source tools, data assessment, data visualization, as we continue with our next speaker, Olaf Hartong. I feel like I see Olaf like all the time, even though he doesn't live in this country. It's kind of weird. He's just one of those people who's always out there in the community, sharing open source tools, ideas. He's one of those people who's really driven, I think, I hate to say it, thought leadership in terms of using attack. I think partially because of him, we realized that stoplight red, yellow, and green might not be the best. And we've moved to the Olaf shades of blue. So with that, please join me in welcoming Olaf Hartong. Thanks, Katie. That's way too humbling. Um, thank you for attending. Um, I want to talk about data, and this is kind of important to me. Um, most of the people have been covering, talking about coverage. Super important, but there's, there's multiple ways to achieve that, I, I believe. So first, a sh very short intro, because I probably don't have that much time. Um, I've been in InfoSec for quite a long time, mostly working on the defensive side. I work together with the red team just to learn more, but um, the, the, the most important for me is basically data. I love data. Any way you can get it, I'll play with it. Um, I didn't always be in InfoSec. I used to be a documentary photographer. I went to art school. Um, which actually helps me get a different perspective on things, right? I don't, I, I, I tend to sheer away from tunnel vision and kind of get a helicopter perspective. And I have two boys, which I truly love, but onwards. So this is also a very important quote. It's, it's actually cool that I'm not the first uh, Sun Tzu uh, uh, quoter here. But if you don't really know yourself, and not your data and your enemy, you, you, you'll be clueless, right? So you're just chasing, chasing whatever you want to do and not really have a focus on where you want to go. So again, data, data is very important for me. So everybody knows this thing and it's being flashed a lot. You don't have to read it. It, it fits on a slide, but <laughs> you can't do anything with it anymore. But the important thing is now we talked a little bit about coverage. So most, what most people do is they, they map their current coverage to it, which it's totally useful for. And in this example, everything has the same value, just because otherwise it won't be readable, but some of them you'll have more confidence in than others. So the next thing you might do is map some bears and some criminals and some pandas to it, just to have some focus into where you want to go. And I use them because I like the pictures. Um, but then, again, so how do you achieve that coverage, right? So there, there's a lot, of, a lot of techniques there. You want to you wanna go ahead and cover those in probably multiple ways because there's multiple ways to ex execute them. So how do you achieve this? So there's multiple ways. Probably you can start playing with the tools and then see what, it, what it's generating and then start building your detection rules for that. But then you also need a lot of this stuff. So there's a lot of data. Eh? You probably already gather a lot of data. You have all these tools, maybe even more. Um, so why not focus on that first then? So that was my idea and what I also get from clients a lot is so where to be begin. So usually you start with, so like was said before, with the low hanging fruit or the stuff you're really scared about or maybe combine it and see, okay, where do I have a correlation and start from there. So it's just an easier way of starting. So I wanted to create a simple toolkit. Sorry, it is based on Excel, but I figured it should be portable, it should be used by, usable by everybody. And sadly, everybody uses Excel, even though it's not always the best tool. Some love it, some hate it. It's not, it's not that important, but it's at least on most of the systems. And then again, also PowerShell, which is available at least on Windows and on Mac and Linux. You can install it. It will work, mostly. Um, <laughs> but that's mostly due to my scripting skills. So not, not, nothing, uh, nothing to, to fire against PowerShell, because I kind of like it, actually. And then. If you use my Excel sheet and the PowerShell script that I provide, you'll get a nice JSON file. You can load that up to the attack navigator and I'll show you how that works now. So essentially, uh, that Excel sheet contains the attack framework. So I ingest the whole thing, the, the nice JSON that they provide, and I quickly uh, put it into the right columns for you so that at least you can reference it in all the other workbooks. So there's a weights workbook. So basically what I did is I rated every technique and I went to all the data sources and looked which data source was the most important for that technique. So this is super biased uh, as the buzzword of the day. I mean, this is my, my interpretation of every technique. So if you don't trust me, please go through them and adjust them accordingly. 
Um, and then there's the important part, the rating workbook. So this is basically the one that you use as a user, um, which I'll dig in a little bit later, uh, um, just to show you uh, an overview. So this is the data source one. I wasn't sure whether that was read, uh, you could read this, so I actually zoomed it in a little bit. And basically what I did is I explained, so these are all the techniques with the adjoining data sources, and I gave them a rating uh, which adds up to 100 as a total, total rating score. And that's important later when I calculate your uh, data coverage for every technique. Uh, so, so in an example, if there's, there's like five and then there's uh, the, the process monitoring, it might be the most important one for that technique. It usually gets a slightly higher score than some of the ones that I deem less important to be able to properly detect that technique. Um, so to the rating workbook, basically what I did is I, I went through all the data sources and put them under each other and I tied them to the adjoining event codes that are being logged. So if, if I lost Sysmon, there, so there's a lot of Sysmon in there. Um, and it's definitely not complete, it's just what I usually encounter. Um, so you can add your own event IDs if you, or if you have some specific application logs that you have and so on. And what you do then is you rate them on completeness, timeliness and availability. So how, how well are you covering it throughout your network? How quickly do you get it into your central logging environment, which might be important as well because you have to adjust your detection rule against that. And where do you store it? So do you, do you even ship it to your local uh, or do you central environment or do you keep it locally, which is also kind of impacting your detection capabilities. So that will be calculated into a, a not really mathematical score, but I look at completeness and availability most and the timeliness you can usually accommodate by looking at the index time instead of the generated time and so on. So this is a, a slightly easier one. And what, that did, what I do then is basically um, I factor that, that total score, which is at the right, and I calculate that against the, the weight of that data source for that technique. And that will give you a coverage score for basically that technique in the end. Um, so I do that through PowerShell because I'm not really good at Excel. Um, nor am I at PowerShell, but it, this works. Uh, so basically what I did, I, I created a module for you that you can install or load. Um, if, and, and basically uh, there are a couple of functions. So you can download the latest uh, um, uh, attack JSON file, which was updated a couple of days ago, which added a lot of cool stuff. Um, thank you. Um, you can update it then. So you can update your Excel sheet with the same PowerShell module. Uh, you can request the JSON file that I'll show you later. Um, and I also added some new features now where I, I have some issues with the way people sometimes use attack. Uh, so you can also see where you could apply it best. Um, and now they are starting to implement them in the mitigation and detecting capabilities more. So I'm also working towards implementing this into my, uh, into my uh, toolbox. So this is a short demo basically of showing you whenever you uh, generated the JSON file, which I won't bother you with. It's just a simple uh, PowerShell command. When you load it up, you get a coverage map like this. And then in the comments field, you'll see your total coverage for that, um, for that technique, but also the stuff you're missing. So if there's a zero there, then you don't ingest the logs. Maybe it's not important, but at least you know you're missing it. So you might be working towards onboarding that. Or you have a proper coverage and you're actually fine. Um, and the cool part about this is also that uh, I saw uh, uh, in the change log this morning for the, for the navigator that they actually now are able to export the comments as well. So you can look it up in Excel again instead of having to hover all these boxes, which is cumbersome at the, at the least. Um, so, so I was already ranting a little bit about that, right? So th there's a couple of ways that I perceive attack to be used, not only for creating, creating an alert, but also for hunting an incident response. And if you visualize that, then basically, if the way I look at it, to properly uh, um, uh, cover everything in alert is super hard. So usually I deem techniques a little bit lower than, than for instance, hunting, where you can do a lot more and take some more time, dig into it. There's less uh, pressure on false positive rates and so on. And actually the same for forensics, because then usually you take more time. And the likelihood of covering that technique fully is higher than when you start doing this from, a, from an alert perspective. So it's not exact science, it's my opinion again, so please uh, bear with me there. I did the same thing basically, so I, I added them all up, I looked at the data sources, I knew, uh, know what the name is, I know what it does, and I rated it, um, uh, I'll zoom in again, sorry, um, 
basically uh, on a one to five scale how likely it is that you will be having full coverage for that technique. Maybe with the sub-techniques later on it will be a little bit more granular. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and as I said, I love Sysmon, so I also filled it in for, for Sysmon. That's another caveat. And this looks amazing, right? This is a lot of coverage from just one tool. Uh, but mind you, um, the actual way of covering it, probably a little bit more than, than that, is actually the, the orange one. And there's a huge difference on the right side of the spectrum. Um, and this partially has to do with uh, Sysmon, as you have to configure it. So some of the stuff you configure will give a big load on your system, so you really don't want that. But also the gap in the quality of the naming in the data sources for MITRE. I mean, it's not perfect and they know it, they're working on it. I'm really helpful. Uh, I really want to help them there as well. But this is something that you have to keep in mind throughout the whole thing of using it. Uh, it won't be a full, uh, full assessment that, that really guides you, okay, you have to find it there, so keep that in mind. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I, I'm working on the defense mitigations, and they actually now are changed also with a lot of the mitigations that are um, in, uh, in the latest update, which I didn't have time to include since I was pushed, I think, Thursday. Um, so, but, uh, but the same process goes there as well. So, so basically, all the defenses can be weighed for that technique, and then how easy is it to bypass it, and how likely is it that you are able to cover it. Um, and with three minutes left, um, uh, part of my roadmap is, is adding those mitigations, but also I'm working with a colleague, Jos, on um, graphing the whole attack framework. And what we did there is actually the, 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 te the 11 tactics aren't really linear, right? So they're not hopping along, which was also the beef with, with the, what, the, what the kill chain does, is, but they keep on moving back and forth and back and forth. So we modeled that into, a, into attack, or into a graph, sorry. And basically what we want to end up with is a, is a sort of bloodhound for a tech, where you can fill in the sheet I showed you before, import that with the ratings, and then it will show you, okay, you have good coverage here, an attacker won't be able to probably take the whole path, and you have to go another way. So it makes it a little bit easier for, for a defender to focus again where you should be covering your techniques most. But also from an attacker, it might be very useful if you land on a system, you see, okay, they have an EDR, they probably cover this, this, and that then I probably need to go there and there and there, and then you might be happy. So it's, it, it works both ways. Um, and I actually have one minute left, so I have time for questions. I didn't expect that. Um, so uh, thank you. <coughs> I didn't expect that either. No, no I actually <laughs> have a, a nice uh, Quick, arrow for Any that. questions at all for Olaf? I really appreciate all of your GIFs and all of your animations. <laughs> um, pretty good slide deck, especially for the end of the day. Well, thanks, all for that. Thank really you. appreciate it. You can grab them at the reception. Thank you. Grab him at the reception, pick his brain a little bit. Um, I love that he has a design background. I didn't even know that. Went to art school. And it kind of shows in his slides. Am I right? So now as we start to wrap up the day, we're going to take a step back to the bigger picture. Um, again, uh, it's always a pleasure for me to introduce my teammates. Richard Struess is a teammate here, and I rely on him to sometimes pull me a little bit out of the weeds, out of the day-to-day, -day, the tactical level, thinking a little more strategically. Um, he's a self-described idea guy. If you've heard of uh, Sticks and Taxi, that, that's kind of his thing. Um, he's also the co-chair of the Cyber Threat Intelligence Technical Committee within OASIS, International Standards Organization, and is also on the o OASIS Board of Directors. So, really active in this community, just uh, flew back from Luxembourg, in fact. So he flies around the world talking to people about this idea of attack and of threat-informed defense. So look forward to uh, hearing his comments to close out the day. Please join me in welcoming Richard Struess. Idea guy. Yikes. Yikes. So um, <clears throat> thanks all. Thanks all for sticking with us. Uh, before uh, I get into the meat of my talk, I just want to uh, do three shout outs uh, for uh, some folks who have done an amazing job today. First, our uh, gracious host, Katie Nichols. I think she's done a fabulous job. <laughs> Second, our uh, soon to be on the Today Show uh, anchor, Jamie Williams, wherever Jamie is. 
And, and third, maybe a little less visible, but, uh, but definitely very important and much loved, is Adam Pennington manning the tweet station. <laughs> so um, I just want to <clears throat> uh, sort of reward you for sticking through with something that's really going to be easy to digest. I unfortunately have no cat memes, no magic unicorns, no ninja cats. Um, but I, I do really want to talk step back a little and think about what it is uh, when, when we start to talk about threat and form defense, what does that really mean? And really, what's our call to action? Because I really think you know, if uh, this is about action. This is a community made up of practitioners. This is a community made up of doers. You know, so I'm the idea guy, in quotes, standing up here. I'm exhorting you to action. And it's really kind of an easy job, because you all embody such an amazing spirit of, of can do, and you know, whether it's Olaf and what he was talking about, or Alan was just talking about, John, what he was talking about. It's just an amazing amount of energy, and that's great. But how do we focus and challenge that? So about a year and a half ago, I, I, I started using this term, maybe it was two years ago now, of threat informed defense. And it's not a new idea. And maybe I wasn't the first person to even actually use this term. But to me, it was helpful. You, you are all practitioners of threat and form defense, whether you call it that or not. Uh, but I thought there was some value in actually putting a name to it to, to actually help us as a, as a discipline start to understand and communicate better with each other and also help people understand the value and the extent of what we're doing. Because it really is a different paradigm, right? I mean, uh, Gary, uh, in his remarks earlier today, did a nice job of talking about the evolution from a sort of a vulnerability-centric model to, to the world we're in today, at least in this room. And there's a lot of people who still need to catch up. And that's part of what uh, my message is going to be. Uh, but there's, you've seen that great shift from you know, vulnerability-centric, and if you're fully patched, uh, you're good to go, to an understanding that that's not enough. So threat informed defense is that recognition that just understanding what your assets are, just understanding that your vulnerabilities are patched, just understanding what your configurations are is critical. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And you know, one of the cautionary notes when I go talk to groups of people about attack and threat informed defense, <clears throat> I'm, I often try to be really, really clear. And I'd ask each of you to do this, because I see you all as ambassadors of this community. And that is, you know, attack and threat informed defense is not some sort of panacea. It's not some magic pixie dust you can sprinkle on an otherwise insecure environment and make it all of a sudden better. If your environment has single factor domain administrator passwords, you have a flat, unsegmented network architecture, you have, you know, any number, you, you don't understand what your assets are, you don't need attack. You need some basic cyber hygiene and a lot of other things. Once you're at that level of sophistication, once you're tall enough to ride that ride, then, and only then, are you ready to actually start to go to that next level to really start to get inside the adversary's decision loop and figure out how to be there waiting for them before they get there. So it's a critical message. You know, so when you're talking to colleagues and friends and, and coworkers, and they say, oh, I think I need the attack thing, just make sure that they're really ready. Just make sure that they really are tall enough to ride the ride. Because the last thing we want to do as a community is to turn into a hype machine and sort of a self-perpetuating uh, uh, motion machine where you know, we just talk to each other about how awesome attack is. And I think it's awesome, but I think we have to be really responsible. So threat and form defense is about taking the things in attack and beyond and using that knowledge systematically, and that's, I think, the key word, to understand and prioritize and define our, ten, uh, our defenses. One of the interesting things, if, if you ask me what are the primary, what's the primary use case of, of attack, um, you know, and we could talk about you know, coverage assessment, we could talk about adversary emulation. We could, actually, number one is communication. I think attack fundamentally is a communications tool. It's a way of thinking about and describing and talking about what adversaries are doing, what you're doing in response to those adversaries, what a product can do, what your red team did, what your blue team found. And it's such a simple idea, but that's where the brilliance is, right? It's a, it's a, it's a brilliantly simple concept. And, it, and I think you know, this, the size of this community and the acceleration of the adoption of the attack framework is testimony to the brilliance of that simple idea 
um, you know, that was created here uh, just uh, a few years ago. And, and so this is really the point. The fact that I can color a square, you know, pick out a puzzle piece, and if I hope you all uh, appreciated the puzzle we had out there, um, and, and have a, and have a unambiguous, concrete, tangible conversation. Again, simple idea, but really powerful. So in this world of threat and form defense, it's, it's coloring in, the, in those squares to mean the things that are meaningful to you in whatever context it is. And so that's the other great thing about attack is it can be used in so many different contexts in so many different ways. And anytime you have a, a tool or an approach that can be repurposed and reused so many times, all of a sudden it becomes worth the investment. And I think that's the other thing we're seeing here, that attack has proven to be a great investment for individuals and for organizations. So um, is Shane Steiger here? So Shane um, did, a, did an amazing thing some number of years ago. He created a game uh, basically modeled around attack. And when I saw this game board, it's a literal game with like literal pieces, and uh, it was, I was so blown away by it. And, and that sort of inspired me to start thinking about attack as a game board, right? And if I'm an adversary, and I'm looking at this game board, and from my perspective as an adversary, green means that I can land on that spot, I can safely move from that spot, I can do what I want from that spot, I want to play this game, right? I want to play this game every day um, because it's a low cost, low risk, low uncertainty environment. And the unfortunate reality is this is the game adversaries play. I'm sure not in any of your organizations or here, but in far too many places throughout critical infrastructure and our supply chains and certainly small and medium-sized enterprises, and even some larger enterprises, this is the game board that the adversary sees. Don't you want to play this game if you're the adversary? So that's something that must change, right? If we wonder why we are always playing catch-up as a community, I would, I would uh, argue that that's one of the reasons because the adversary has so many, so much room to move, so much freedom, uh, you know, and they, they get to choose the time and place, they get to move wherever they want. So if we recognize that must change, we should start thinking about this as a game, right? We all like to play games, games are fun, it's not work. Um, so how do we start as a community, and we're already doing this today, but how do we really provide focus to our efforts to begin to change the rules of this game, to take those safe landing spots off the game board for the adversary. It's not something we're going to do overnight. And if you, any of you think you can do it overnight, please come talk to me later. Um, but it's something that we can and should do. We must do. Our imperative, our call to action, is that we must begin to remove these spots. We have to do it every week. We have to do it every month. We have to do it every quarter. We have to do it every year. And we have to continuously be working to get to the point where that's all red. Now, are we ever going to get there? Probably not. But if you're an adversary, do you want to play this game? Not nearly as much as that first one. Can we go back to that first game? Because this is, from an adversary perspective, a high cost, high risk, high uncertainty environment where most of the time the stuff you try doesn't work. When it does work, you're then beginning to question, is this, did this work because the adversary, because my, because my victim wanted it to work? Am I in some sort of deception environment? You, know, you start to be able to play with the adversary and manage the adversary. That's the world we need to be in. That's the world I believe we can be in if we continue the great work that this community has been doing, if we accelerate that work and we provide focus to that work. So again, I want to be clear, we're not going to get here tomorrow, we're not going to get here next year, but we can certainly all work to start to move in this direction. We must be as relentless as the adversary. 
Adversaries, they don't give up. They're advanced. They're persistent. And they represent a threat. Well, you know, we have to be just as persistent. We have to be advanced, persistent defenders, I guess. God, please don't turn that into an acronym. <laughs> uh, that's a meme. Um, but as important as it is for us to be relentless, I think the more important point is that we have to do this together. And again, the great news is that this is a testimony to the fact that we are already doing this as a community. I just came back, uh, as Katie mentioned, I came back from Luxembourg in the European attack uh, workshop last Friday. Uh, and it was a really great, you know, sort of a similar idea, group of community members, all practitioners, talking about how they're applying attack in their environments, how they're using it to actually improve the state of their defenses on a daily basis. So we're already doing this as a community. We just need to do more because the threat is real and the adversaries uh, aren't going away. So from my perspective, we have an opportunity to bring the best security teams from around the world. And, and you folks, are, I think, are, are great examples of those best security teams from around the world, whether you're parts of you know, large financial institutions or global manufacturers or healthcare concerns or IT security companies uh, or professional services firms or ISACs and ISAs, whatever you are, you represent sort of that, the, the, the tippy top of the pyramid of organizations and individuals who have the skills and the insights and the resources and sophistication to actually begin to make a difference. And then it's no surprise or coincidence that we're here at MITRE, which you know, for over 60 years has been this trusted, objective, independent, non-for-profit uh, place where deep thoughts are thunk and then good things happen as a result. And we believe that if we can bring these best security teams from around the world together with the kinds of folks that you've been hearing from from MITRE over the last day and a half, that we can actually begin to execute on research and development that will begin to deliver impact at scale that's in the public interest. So that's really what my focus has been of late, is to how do we take those community members who have the ability and the resources and the, and the time and the expertise and the commitment to the public interest to try to focus our efforts so that we can deliver impact at scale. So, threat informed defense, where do we go from here? What I can tell you today is stay tuned. Uh, sometime in the next few weeks, you'll be hearing some more announcements from us about some of the really concrete actions that we're taking to move this community forward. If you're interested in the meantime, please come find me uh, later on, or you can always reach me via email. Uh, but I, I want to leave you just with this thought. It, we can actually change the game on the adversary. We can actually, I can foresee a day, maybe it's not tomorrow, maybe it's not next year, where we're actually inside the adversary's decision loop, where we're actually beginning to win the battles, if not the war. So let's all keep doing what you're doing. Let's keep this community going. And let's remember to be as relentless as our adversaries. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rich, for those closing remarks. A great way to kind of pull us back strategically, right? And your last comment struck me. Tony started the day talking about OODA loops, and Rich closed it by talking about how we want to get into an adversary's OODA loop, the advanced persistent defenders. So, what a great call for action to finish the day on. We'd like to thank all of our amazing speakers today. Um, you all are wonderful, just amazing content, best practices, what's working, what isn't in attack. So we hope you got a lot of takeaways. Thank you so much to Jamie on the attack con couch. She did an amazing job. Uh, look forward to more of that tomorrow. And thank you to the online audience. It was so fun to read all your tweets today. Folks from everywhere around the world watching here with us in McLean. Uh, tomorrow, start times in McLean. We've got breakfast at 8 a.m. for you, 8 to 9. Online, we will start streaming at 9 a.m. Eastern. So that's going to be pretty awesome. Starting another day two of AttackCon at 9 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. And with that, folks in McLean, I'm going to send you downstairs to our awesome reception, which is sponsored by Threat Quotient. Walk down those stairs. You won't miss a giant reception there. 
Thanks again to our online audience for joining us. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow.